Catalyst by Larry Hulse Anderson. Part 1. Solid. The rate of a chemical reaction depends on the frequency and force of collisions between molecules. From Arco, everything you need to score high on AP Chemistry, 3rd edition. 1.0. Elemental. Safety tip. Never carry out unauthorized experiments. I like to run at night. No one watches me. No one hears my sneakers slipping in the loose gravel at the side of the road. Gravity doesn't exist. My muscles don't hurt. I float, drift past the churches, the stores, and the schools, past the locked houses and their flicker blue windows. My mind is quiet and clear. A ghost hovers off my left shoulder. I can almost hear her breathe. I pick up the pace. She doesn't scare me. I know I'll win. Well, I'm pretty sure I'll win. Chances are good. On the outside, I am good Kate. Reverend Jack Malone's girl. Isn't she sweet? She helps so much with the house. So sad about her mother. And she's so smart, too. Seen her name in the papers for honor roll this and science fair that. She's got scholarship written all over her. Runs pretty fast. She's also good with her brother. Why can't all teenagers be like her? On the inside, I am bad Kate. Daughter of no one. She's such a bitch. Thinks she's all that. Prays with her eyes open, lets her boyfriend put his hands all over her. Miss Perfect, Miss Suckup, disrespectful, disagreeable, still waters run deep and dirty. She's gonna lose it, just you watch. I've seen her type before, run faster. Sweat trickles along the bones of my face and licks my neck, running, sweating, and evaporating. I'm distilling myself in the dark. Mixture, substance, compound, element, atom. The ghost is getting closer. Run faster. Push beyond that wall. Push beyond my limits. My chest is flayed open. No lungs to breathe with and no heart to pound. The air flows around and between my shiny bones. My skin is silk. I take it off when I get hot. The first night I ran late like this, the puddles were filmed with ice. Now the trees are leafing and the roads are dry and I fly almost naked, breathless, running out of this empty night into a place where I can't hear myself think. I wish I never had to stop. 1.1. Stasis. I take a quick shower and pull on old sweats and two pairs of socks. It's only a quarter after one and there's no way I'm going to fall asleep, not with all the crap running through my head, but that's a good thing. Insomnia rocks, actually. You can get a lot done if you don't sleep. I've turned into a hyper-efficient wind-up Kate doll. Super Kate. The Uber Kate. I wish I had had this happen last year. Would have given me a lot more time to study for my AP exams. I head downstairs to finish the laundry. The rest of the family does not share my passion for clean clothes. Dad, aged 47. Hobbies, religion, football, and losing hair. Wouldn't notice if he were wearing the same pairs of pants for a month. Toby, aged 14, hobbies, trombone, soccer, and masturbation, doesn't know how to find the laundry room. I take the clean load out of the dryer, move the wet stuff over, and empty the hamper into the washing machine. I pour in soap and set the dial to regular. Bad Kate mutters that they need to start washing their own clothes. What are they going to do when I go to MIT? Good Kate doesn't mind. She thinks there's something good about doing the laundry. Something de-stressing. Besides, I don't leave for another four months. Bad Kate points out that I haven't been accepted yet. She can be a real bitch after midnight. I carry the dry clothes to the family room and dump them on the couch. Sophia, our Siamese cat, strolls into the room and hops up on the recliner. She is followed by her boy toy, Mr. Spock, our black lab. He lies down in front of her chair with a groan. I set up the ironing board, plug in the iron, and turn on the TV to the sci-fi channel. A bug-eyed, tentacled alien has just totaled her spaceship in a cornfield. The ship looks alarmingly like my car. A SWAT team confronts her in the middle of all that corn. Poor little alien. I pull one of Dad's shirts out of the pile and iron it. By the time I'm done, it can almost stand up by itself. No one irons like me. As I button the shirt on its hanger, a deep, wet cough echoes down the stairwell. Sophia and Mr. Spock stare at me, their black eyes drippy and wide like cartoon animals. I gave him his medicine at 10.30, I say. Another cough, as if on cue. Sophia flicks her tail in irritation. 
I set the shirt hanger on the edge of the ironing board. Toby has allergies, asthma, and a bad cold. It sounds as if he has a quart of pus in his lungs. He just needs to cough, I remind the cat. It clears the mucus. I check my watch. Pause. Pause. Toby coughs again. This one is better, productive and short. Then it's quiet. See? Sophia bends over and licks her butt. Oh, lovely. Thank you. I lay another shirt on the ironing board. Toby is fine, really. I checked his peak flow when he took the medicine, and he's way out of the danger zone. I pull out another shirt and spray starch on the collar. It's not like it could get serious or anything. It's just annoying. All that soggy noise. Disgusting. I set the starch can on the end of the ironing board and pin down the collar with my fingertips. When I skate the hot iron across the cloth, the starch bubbles and hisses. I press the collar, work my way around the buttons, smooth out the buttonholes, and flatten the cuffs. When the detail work is done, I lay the shirt face down and iron back and forth, back and forth. The wrinkles vanish. Next victim. On the television, the battle is heating up. The alien burbles something and whips out a weapon, though for all we know it could be a tentacle cleaner. The SWAT team lobs a canister of tear gas at her feet and it explodes. The alien falls to the ground, clawing at her eyeballs. That is a major logic flaw. No alien life form would be affected by tear gas the way humans are. She's probably not even carbon-based. Don't these writers know anything? Jeez. I iron and iron and the movie goes downhill from there. Dad's shirts and khakis are hung on hangers. His jeans are folded. T-shirts stacked in his basket with all the limp, dark dad socks. Sophia is asleep, her nose tucked under her tail. Mr. Spock yawns. I can't help it. I yawn back. Oh yeah. Sleep. A good concept. But I need to finish Toby's clothes, and I should finish tomorrow's to-do list. I should run the dishwasher. I should sleep. I should sleep. I should sleep. I know I should sleep, but knowing and doing are two different beasts. I'm stressed, and so, but it's almost over. The finish line is in sight, and I can hear the crowd roaring. I quickly iron my brother's pants and shirts, keeping half an eye on the movie. They'd be treating that alien nicer if they knew about the mothership idling over Idaho. Just once, I'd like to see the aliens win. Toby's goalie shirt is at the bottom of the pile. You should never iron goalie shirts because they melt. I turn off the iron, unplug it, and move the plug three feet away from the wall. I know it's completely illogical to think that electricity could arc from the socket to the plug and heat the iron and burn the house down, but it's almost two in the morning and I'm feeling a little lightheaded, so better safe than sorry. The movie breaks for commercials that try to sell me beer, leg hair remover, and steak knives. Oh wait, one more. The psychic hotline. Gack, gack, gack. Last scene. They have the alien in the hospital hooked up to tubes and monitors. They're transforming her. Human flesh grows and covers her sapphire scales. The tentacles recede and the blonde hair sprouts from her scalp. Eyeballs grow into their sockets. White-coated scientists nod and approve. It's a conspiracy. She's perfect. Toby coughs again. The cat wakes up and scowls. I pick up the basket. I know, I know, I'm going. 1.1.1 Relative Density My brother's room stinks of male adolescent. Used socks, dirty hair, cologne, and rotting fruit. It's too warm in here, and wicked humid. Ideal breeding conditions for germs. You can practically see the bacteria swarming in the air. I turn on the light, perch next to the patient, and poke his shoulder. Wake up, Tobe. You need more medication. He groans once and flails an arm. Toby looks a little like Dad, I guess. He's got the brown hair, the eyes close together. His face is long and peppered with zits. His ears are finally the right size for his head, but he needs to give up on the mustache and training. It looks like fungal growth. I shove his shoulder harder and pull back the quilt. He fumbles for it and croaks, Go away. I pull the quilt out of reach. You're coughing up pieces of lung and it's grossing me out. Sit up. He starts to say something, but a cough strangles him. He clutches the pillow and hacks. When the spasm is over, his fingers relax. I put my hand on his forehead. It's not a precise way to measure a fever, but people are always doing it in commercials. 
Toby's forehead is oily. I don't think that's related to the cough, though. He blinks and sits up, leaning against the headboard. I hand him the plastic cup of green cough medicine. Drink it. He gulps it down. Blech, that's disgusting. It's good for you. I pick up a half-finished bottle of Gatorade from the floor, unscrew the top, and hand it to him. You need to go back to the doctor. He polishes off the bottle in three gulps and drops it in an ocean of used Kleenex. No, I don't. It's just allergies. What time is it? Almost two. Dang, it's late. Duh. Go back to sleep. Your clean clothes are on the dresser. Put them away in the morning. He nods and pulls back the quilt up to his chin. I toss the empty bottle in the trash and I start picking up the tissues that litter the bed and the floor. Hiding under the tissues is this month's Playboy, folded open and revealing an interview with Miss April. Toby, suddenly awake, sits up again and snatches it away from me. Don't say anything, he says. Why bother? I don't care. You're programmed to like that crap. You can't help it. Shut up. Whatever. I carry the trash can to the door. It's all silicone, you know. What is? The breasts, moron. In the pictures. They aren't real. They're pumped with silicone. The same stuff they used to make spacesuits. Think about that the next time you're, uh, taking care of business. Thanks, Kate. I feel so much better now. Just don't leave it where Dad can find it, okay? We don't need any more fireworks around here. A car rolls up the driveway and Mr. Spock barks. Speak of the devil, Toby says with a yawn. 1.2. Atomic Family I jog into my room and dive into bed just as the back door opens. Keys clang on the kitchen table, then just slide off and drop to the floor. I can hear Dad chuckle. Whatever tragic emergency yanked him out of here at dinner time must have turned out all right. Maybe he talked a jumper off the bridge, or rescued a small child, or negotiated peace in a faraway country. Maybe he won a poker game. He turns off the lights in the family room, then climbs the stairs. He passes my room, opens Toby's door. Quiet pause. Then he closes it. He walks down the hall to his own room, whistling Bach. Another pause. Click, click. His door shuts. Toby and I are the proton and neutron of our atomic family unit. Dad is the loosely bonded electron, negatively charged, zooming around us in his own little shell. From the outside, we seem to fit together perfectly. From the inside, things are a bit different. Enough. I'm going to sleep right now. This minute. Any second now. Watch me sleep. Shoot. I turn over and punch the pillow. My friends all have tricks for falling asleep. Sarah meditates. Mitch recites the presidents, in order. Travis reviews all of his relatives, the step-siblings, the half-siblings, the ex-in-laws, the great-aunts, the third cousins, twice removed by divorce, then added back by remarriage. His parents change spouses the way some people change clothes. Travis rarely has insomnia. My dad was only married once, to my mom. The marriage broke up when she died nine years ago. I have one brother, some cousins in Australia, and two living grandparents, one in a nursing home and one in a commune, half a dozen relatives, tops. Still awake. Stone cold awake. In a few hours I will be mixing unstable chemicals near a Bunsen burner. That is not a pretty picture. I'm freezing. I get out of bed, open the closet door, and pull down my old comforter from the top shelf. I spread it over the top of my blankets, then snuggle in. The extra weight feels safe, the sateen edge smooth like candy against my cheek. Still awake. Uh, let's try the mantra. MIT, MIT, let me in, let me in. Bad mantra. It makes my heart beat faster and my stomach churn. Sarah doesn't understand why I'm so stressed. I should have told her. should have told Mitch, too. Maybe even Dad. You know how you're supposed to apply for like 5 to 10 or 20 of your top schools, and then a couple of safeties just in case? Well, I sort of didn't follow that rule, and I sort of neglected to tell anyone that, too. I only filled out one application, to MIT, and I don't sleep anymore.
Sarah sleeps fine because she's Bryn Mawr early decisions and has hefty financial aid packages. She thinks I should be positive, not fractured crazy. That I should breathe and visualize happy thoughts, happy thoughts, happy thoughts. Massachusetts Institute of Technology. My home planet. My people. Visualize opening the envelope. We are pleased to inform you. Visualize jogging on the Cambridge campus. Visualize the chem lab. My goggles. My perfectly starched size 4 lab coat. They will let me in. They have to let me in. There's no other option. An owl hoots and I peek out the window beside my bed. The moon is up, but it's not throwing much light. The cemetery behind her house is dark. Beyond the last row of graves, down the hill, down to the stone fence, the air is black. At the bottom of the hill, there is a farmhouse. The Lich House. With one light turned on and a second-story window. Terry Lich is either up very late or obscenely early. I doubt she's angsting about college acceptance letters. She's probably planning a bank robbery. I lay down and put my arm above my head so I can hear my watch tick. When does night end and morning begin anyway? Officially, I mean. Zen questions like that work better than warm milk. I submit and submerge. 2.0. Delayed reaction. Safety tip. Store flammable substances appropriately. Boom, boom, boom. The wall behind my head is being bumped. Boom, 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 boom. Oh god, Toby, are all 14-year-old boys like this? If he doesn't give it a rest, his equipment's gonna fall off. I swear I'll never be an aunt. Boom, 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 boom. At least he's not coughing, and he has the oxygen for aerobic exercise. Boom, 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 boom. But there is a time and a place for everything, preferably where I can't hear it. I sit up and pound the wall with my fist. Knock it off, perv. Something crashes. I smile and pull up the covers. If he's going to whack off before school, he should do it in the shower and clean up afterwards. School. Oh no. My eyelids snap open, roller blinds tugged hard and released. What day is it? What time is it? I pull my watch close to my nose. A quarter till seven. Today, chem lab. History quiz, track practice. Crap, crap, crap. I'm late. I'm way late. Sixty minutes late. I've lost a whole hour. Oh crap, I hate being late. I put on my glasses, get out of bed, turn on my computer, and open my closet in one movement. Clothes, black sweater, jeans, clean underwear, clean, unnecessary bra. God forgot to give me breasts. Is it any wonder I'm an atheist? Socks, two pairs. My toes still think it's February. Sophia and noses open my door and slinks in, Mr. Spock close on her heels. My audience. I strip and log onto the net. My skin is so pale it looks blue, like skim milk. That can't be healthy. I get dressed and toss my dirty stuff in the hamper. My email is mostly stupid jokes forwarded by people who think they know me. Delete all. Miss Cummings sent me a chemistry geek article. Her note says, It's coming soon. Chin up. In a smiley face. Good Kate smiles back. Bad Kate taps her watch. We're late. We're late. I turn to the computer, then spin around to my dresser. Whoa, dizzy. Moving too fast. I grip the chair until the room comes back into focus. I swear I'm going to drink chamomile tea tonight and try for a normal bedtime. I pull my hair back up in a ponytail, bolt for the door, trip over the dog, and almost smash my face into the wall. Stupid dog. 2.0 Acid. It takes an average of 12 minutes to get out of this house in the morning. Today, I'll do it in five. I dump two cups of cat food in Mr. Spock's bowl. They can share. I fill the water bowl from the tap. No, Sophia, I'm not washing it out for you. Then put it on the floor. I lay out Toby's meds on the counter. A daytime cough suppressant, two asthma inhalers, a multivitamin, extra vitamin C. I used to put out a cereal bowl, but he hates that. I wish I had time to make him oatmeal. Pop-tarts. He'll snarf on those in a heartbeat. I pop a couple of vitamin C myself and drink a glass of orange juice. Once upon a time, when I was truly the perfect daughter, I used to make breakfast for Dad. He never ate it. Enough. Check the calendar. Church dinner tonight. Won't have to cook. Did I pack my racing shoes? My contacts come in on Saturday. Call work. Make sure they're letting me out early. Allergy doc has to postpone Toby's shots. 
Wait, did Mr. Spock get the rabies shot this year? What did I think of that? Where did I put my keys? Running late? The voice startles me. I didn't notice Dad sitting in the corner, watching me over the top of the post standard. The light above the kitchen table makes the shadows under his eyes darker than usual. He's wearing an ancient sweater with a frayed collar over a black turtleneck and the jeans that I ironed last night. Meet my father, Reverend Jack Malone, God's public relations guy, the preacher. I overslept, I explain. He turns the page, lays the paper on the table, and smooths it flat. Dissecting the news gives him sermon ideas. His tools are positioned next to his tea mug. Scissors, yellow legal pad, black felt-tip pen, and file folders. Oh, and the industrial-sized bottle of Tylenol. Dad gets wicked bad headaches, migraines sometimes. You've been oversleeping a lot, he says. I have had a ton of homework. I peek under the pile of newspapers by his left elbow. Nothing. Have you seen my keys? He straightens the pile. You're graduating in two months. Why do you have so much homework? Most of my teachers are insane. That's why. Keys. I shake the old photo bag I use for a purse. No jingling. Darn. Did I leave them in the car? I never do that. Kate? Uh-oh. He's using the god voice. Sit down. We need to talk. Arguing would be a waste of time. I sigh and take my seat, keeping the table between us. What are we talking about? He lines up the scissors and pens parallel to the edge of the newspaper. College. We need to talk about college. Every time I bring it up, you change the subject. No, I don't. Can you write me an excuse? Homeroom is about to start. See? You did it again. I'm still your father, you know. Now tell me what's going on. When Dad gets like this, all I'm the father and I know best, our tiny kitchen expands into the arctic tundra with the sink at one end and a refrigerator and stove on the other. Wind howls across the frozen wasteland. Mercury freezes. I cross my arms over my chest. All right, here's the deal. I'm still waiting to hear from MIT. I'm not making any decisions until I get their letter. It'll be here any day. Totally true, every word. I really need that note. He taps his lips with the end of his pen, then scribbles me an excuse. And once you hear from MIT, we'll sit down and go over everything. All your options. MIT's the only option I care about. More truth. You're getting obsessed. A well-managed obsession can be very productive. How come you got in so late last night? I got a call from a panicked mother. Her little boy was running a high fever. We took him to the ER. Turned out to be an ear infection. Remember how Toby used to get those? I nod. You should have heard him coughing last night. I think he should stay home from school. I pick up the excuse, fold it, and put it in my bag. I have practice after school, and you have that chicken dinner. Don't forget, the congregation gets pissed when you don't show up. He picks up the scissors and slices through the paper. Don't say pissed. It's crude. The congregation gets perturbed when you forget to show up at these things. Oh, and don't make any plans for me on Saturday. I'm working in the morning and getting my contacts finally in the afternoon. He keeps cutting. You're changing the subject again. I don't know why you keep avoiding this. It's not like you. La 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 la. I'm not listening. Let him have the last word. I am the child, and he is the father, and all is right with the universe. I grab my books and, ah, that twinge in my chest. I think I strained a pectoral muscle lifting weights for track. The books slide awkwardly against one another. My keys were sandwiched between mythology and chemistry. I toss them in the air and catch them. When the letter comes, bring it to school, okay? He keeps cutting. You have a good day. God bless, Kate. 2.2 Transition Element the church next door is dark and the stone walls give off a chill. Dad refuses to spend money on floodlights because he says churches don't need security. I shiver and hustle to my sad excuse of a motor vehicle, a Yugo named Bert. I usually drive to school on autopilot. Not today. Leaving late has landed me straight in the middle of rush hour traffic. This is bad. Bert fears traffic. Bert's a wuss, a tissue box on tires with a bulimic hunger for motor oil. 
I pet the dashboard as I turn onto the main road and promise him a filter change if he can get me to school without overheating. A minivan cuts in front of us and stops at the next yellow. Come on, lady, get the lead out. The driver, a mom wearing big sunglasses, is either screaming or singing to the kids strapped into the back seat. Start, coast, stop. Another yellow, a long red. Shoot. I cover the temperature gauge and I jiggle my left leg. If Dad hadn't slowed me down, I'd be at school right now. God bless. Why does he insist on saying that? I don't inflict scientific theories on him. I don't make him contemplate the elegance of the periodic table or particle physics. He knows I'm allergic to the G word. He does it to annoy me. The light turns green, and the minivan heads for the elementary school. I steer Bert to the entrance ramp of the bypass. Once we merge, I put on my hazards and settle into the slow lane. The sore muscle in my chest whimpers as I wrestle the gear shift into third. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against religion. Religion is good, apparently. Billions of people seem to enjoy it. But I'm not buying it. Especially the brand name version my dad sells. I don't see his blessings have ever helped anything. A line of cars passes me. Horns honking, middle fingers saluting. Sometimes I wish I did have faith. If I did, I'd pray for another thousand miles on this heap, and to be accepted by MIT, of course. A full scholarship would be nice. A microwave for my dorm room, a work-study job, and a decent lab. God could pay for my contacts, cure Toby's asthma, get Mitch's parents off his back about his major, and develop a cure for AIDS. If I believed in God, I would pray all the time. Dad would croak. We're approaching the big hill, the one that makes Bert shudder. I floor it for a second to gain some momentum, then take my foot off the gas to coast and give the engine a second to cool down before the next big push. I am not the daughter Reverend Jack Malone wants. He is not the father I need, either. It's as simple as that. Reverend Dad, version 4.7, is a faulty operating system, incompatible with my software. I downshift, accelerate, and cross my fingers. Halfway up the hill, Bert starts panting, but it doesn't smell like anything's on fire. Slow and steady, eyes up. Dad and I might be able to tolerate each other if he had a normal job. Everyone argues with their father, but nobody else has to listen to what Jesus would think about MTV or what he would think about class rankings. Nobody else has to play the role of sweet little preacher's girl in addition to getting into college and ironing clothes and feeding the pets and making sure my brother takes his medicine. Ah, oh, crap. I should have checked Toby's peak flow reading before I left. Dad'll forget. I fumble in my bag for something to write with and come up with one of Mitch's Harvard pens. I scrawl PKFLW on the back of my left hand. We crest the hill and I pat the dashboard again. A filter change and premium gas, I swear, buddy. 2.2.1 Base You're probably wondering what happened to my mom. It was pneumonia, resistant to drugs, resistant to oxygen, hungry, fast, and fatal. She got sick on a Thursday and died three days later. Her lungs filled up and she drowned. It took everybody by surprise, especially the doctors. I was in fourth grade. I didn't enter the science fair that year, and everything was blurry. I know I'm supposed to be all tragic and freaked out because my mom is dead, but sorry, I'm not. Sometimes I miss her. It's not like I'm heartless, but I've lived half my life without her. She's like a distant aunt, someone who was fun to play with but forgets to send birthday cards. I dream about her sometimes. I think it's about her, anyway. 2.3. Caustic. I park the car in the last row of the Merriweather High student lot and sprint towards the door. I walk through the metal detector without setting off any alarms. I'll have to get a late pass, but that shouldn't be... Hold it right there, honey. The security guard stands up and walks over to me. The guard and the metal detectors are new this year. They allow our parents to think we're safe. The guard hitches up her pants and tries on a firm but friendly smile. I need to see your student ID, she says. Good God. I sigh and swing my photo bag around. 
The card fits in the plastic sleeve in the front flap. She clears her throat. Like I said, I need to see your ID. What? I look at the bag. The sleeve is empty. The card is gone. Ah, oh, crap. Ah, oh, smelly crap. It must have fallen out in the parking lot. I had to run, or it's in my car. I'll get it for second period. Excuse me, I have to go. I'm way late for chem. She slides sideways and blocks my path. I can't let you enter the building without proper identification. Yes, you can. Mrs. Watson does it all the time. That's why Mrs. Watson was fired. I'm in charge now. I follow orders. Deep breath. Be nice. I'm Kate Malone. I'm ranked third in the senior class. I'm National Honor Society, a peer counselor. Look, I pull out my wallet and show her my license. That's me. She studies it and crosses her arms over her bosom. There's nothing on that license that says you are a student here. You could be disgruntled. You could be hostile. Do I look hostile? You are a teenager. 2.4. The Crucible It takes ten minutes to convince Cerberus to escort me to the office, where the principal vouches for me and commends the guard for her vigilance. Good dog. By the time I make it to the science wing, room 313, first period is nearly over. AP Chem is home. The orderly rows of lab tables, clinking glass beakers and test tubes, and the molecular models floating overhead like satellites, beaming data down to us. I'm in my element here. If I had my way, I'd study chemistry all day, maybe with a math class thrown in every once in a while for diversion. Miss Cummings is writing a formula on the board. She looks over her shoulder. I was wondering if we'd see you, Kate. I set the late pass on her desk. Car trouble. I was hoping it'd be something more significant. You and me both. Miss Cummings moved to our district my freshman year and set up a science geek lab the day she arrived. She turned me on to nanotechnology, got me over my biochem prejudice, and supervised all my science fair entries, including the one that took the national award. She is my fairy godmother in a lab coat and goggles. I don't even hold it against her that she goes to my dad's church and sings in his choir. Twenty-six sets of eyes follow me to my table. Twenty-six pairs of lips whisper the same question. Are you in? Are you in? Are you in? Are you in, Kate? I shrink smaller and smaller as I walk to the back of the room. By the time I get to my table, I have to pull myself up onto the stool looming ten feet overhead. Everyone is always into somebody else's business around here. Pisses me off. Well... Asks Diana Sung, my lab partner, 3.86 GPA, accepted by Ren Sailor Polytechnic Institute. I didn't check the mail yesterday, bad Kate lies. She hasn't heard yet, Diana reports to the rest of the class. Several dweeb kings nod smugly. Ed Davis, 3.97, accepted by every college he applied to, all 15 of them. Omar Hakeen, 4.12. We get extra brownie points for super advanced honors courses. Full ride to Howard University. Eric Warren, 3.84, headed to Dartmouth to study pre-med and play hockey. I put on my safety goggles and study the boiling water bath on our hot plate. What's their problem? They got a pool going. The odds on you getting into MIT are 4 to 1. 4? Diana fiddles with the graphing calculator. Against. It's just a paperwork problem. Guidance said it's happening more and more. Where's Mariah? Sick, allegedly. Mariah Yates is waiting for her acceptance letter, too. She's wound up tighter than a psychotic terrier on crack. If she doesn't get into her top school, she'll snap. Totally. Her parents will be paying room and board at a mental hospital. Diana uses a sharp pencil to copy the numbers from her calculator. She's been accepted at eight other schools. There's no reason for her to freak out. I lean closer to the boiling water in the beaker. Angry bubbles race to the top of the water and explode. Applying to only one school seemed like such a good idea at the time. Whatever, I say. Let's finish this. Our experiment is supposed to show the relationship between gas temperature and pressure. We have to stick some sealed tubes of air into beakers of cold water and hot water and figure out what the temperature does to the air pressure in the tubes. 
Not exactly rocket science, but fun enough. Dan has already taken out the cold readings. The water in the beaker's at full boil now. Bubble, bubble, toil, and slam. Mariah Yates stands in the doorway, clutching a letter to her chest, black mascara running down her face. I got into Stanford, she shrieks. Most of the class breaks into applause. A couple of guys pull out their wallets and pay up. They bet against Mariah? Fatal error. She's just the sight of crazy, yes, but it's a brilliant kind of crazy. The kind that will either go down in flames her first semester or change the world. I write down the temperature and air pressure data and reach for the calculator. Mariah shows her letter to Miss Cummings. I'm so happy for her. Two point five reactants. The faded sign on the wall says the cafeteria sits five hundred. As if. At the last count the student population here at Marvelous Merriweather High was four thousand three hundred and seventeen. Hence the need for quote unquote lunch at eight thirty in the morning. Hence, also the tables sized for elementary students, the theory being that if they use smaller seats, more kids will be able to squeeze in. I head for our table and stop. It's been taken over by football players, an entire squad of shoulders and thick forearms. Not my cup of tea, football players, though a few of the lads have lovely tight ends. They smell showered, and they're eating French toast fingers. Showered men and French toast. Quite an olfactory combination. My pheromones moan. Down, girl. Concentrate. Be alert. Where are my people? I squint and scan, looking for recognizable life forms. I can't wait to get my contacts. These glasses are useless. A red flannel figure hunkers at the far end of the table, a slumped shape I'd know anywhere. Terry Litch. Terry Litch reading People magazine, eating her federally subsidized breakfast. Every school has a Terry. The kid who peed her pants in the fifth grade and sat in it all day. The kid who wore only two different outfits in the seventh grade. Our Terry put on 100 pounds in the ninth grade, then stopped eating in the tenth. The ugly girl, the one who smells funny, studies carpentry at Votech, stomps around with sawdust in her hair and has fists like sledgehammers. Terry beat me up every year in elementary school, fall and spring. I turned the other cheek for a while. Then I learn to run. Intelligent life pursues self-preservation. Terry turns the page and glances up at me, her glasses glinting in the sun. Uh-oh, don't disturb the bear. A purple football jersey grunts at me. Malone? I turn away from Terry to Brandon Figs, my favorite tight end. We hooked up for a while last year, but I always wanted to say, Shut up, can we please start kissing now because you're so dumb and I want to scream. Unfortunately, he kissed like a vacuum cleaner. It didn't last long. Have you seen Mitch? I ask. Brandon shakes his head. The next player to him says something rude. It involves Terry and his jock strap. Do I have to give details? His buddies crack up. Brandon laughs, chokes, and dribbles milk out of his mouth, which makes everyone laugh harder. Ah, <sighs> so attractive. A flush creeps up on Terry's neck. This is where I should stick up for her. I'm Kate Malone, after all. I'm the preacher's kid, Reverend Malone's skinny little girl. I'm supposed to practice all that love-your-neighbor stuff. Terry gives me the finger. Alrighty, then. 2.5.1. Bonds. Kate! The shout comes from the back of the room. I leave Terry and the boys behind and walk to where my friends are sitting. Sunshine blazes through the glass wall that fronts an unused courtyard, backlighting them into shadow puppets. I have to shade my eyes to look at them. You're late. What's up? Sarah asks. Sunglasses somebody. Anybody? You've chosen the absolute worst table, you know. It feels good, Sarah says with a wiggle. Think Cancun. Think Miami. Think Los Angeles. Think about the sun frying my eyeballs. Sarah slides her sunglasses across the table. I take off my glasses and put them on. The room mellows to a golden, SPF-protected glow. Thanks. They're out of focus now, but as with Terry, I'd recognize these shapes anywhere. Sarah Emery, my BF, is a self-described Wiccan Jewish poet. That would send most parents screaming to the therapist's office, but the Emerys are totally cool with it. I've been asking them to adopt me for years. 
Travis Baird is to Sarah as water is to fire, opposite and necessary. Trav is a freakazoid good guy with a taste for body art. The vice principal in charge of discipline has been aching to bust him for years. He refuses to believe that good things can come in colorful packages. A warm hand snakes its way around my waist. My knees buckle and the hand pulls me down into the very familiar lap of Mitchell A. Pangborn III. My friend, my enemy, my lust. I missed you, he whispers into my ear. He kisses my neck gently and I get dizzy all over again. I look around quickly. The authorities here spaz out about physical displays of affection, even if you get good grades. No adults in sight. I toss Sarah's sunglasses back on the table, tilt my head, and kiss him good morning. He shifts a little in his seat. His lap is very happy to see me. Mitch and I started fighting in the sixth grade. It was a clash of the titans for years. Scientific genius, me, versus humanities nerd, him. Weapons, report cards, GPAs, SATs, and AP scores. For a while, we used to arm wrestle too, but that stopped after 8th grade because he grew 5 inches and gained an unfair amount of leverage. Last September, we made a bet. Whoever got accepted into their top school early decision could make the other person do whatever he or she wanted. Anything. No limits. Harvard welcomed Mitch with open arms. MIT deferred me. I thought for sure he'd make me do something humiliating in front of the entire student body. Instead, he took me out to dinner. I still don't know which was more shocking, the fact that I got deferred, or that Mitchell obnoxious Pangborn was a flame-throwing, heart-quivering, jeans-creaming, phenomenal kisser. It was a good date, a very good date. So after six years of hating him, why did I start to like him? He's smart. He gets my jokes. He has black hair and gray eyes that remind me of the ocean after a storm. He has freckles, though I haven't told him I think they're cute. He understands about my dad and all the crap at my house. He even congratulated me when I wound up at the higher class rank. And like I said, the boy knows how to kiss and kiss and kiss. The kisses are necessary. When we're kissing, we can't argue. He still thinks that science is the root of all evil. I still think that going to an Ivy League college to study history is sort of like winning the lottery and giving away all the money. What's the point? His parents agree with me. They want him to be practical, to study something that has a career attached to it. But they've been getting kinda harsh, so I've decided to argue less and kiss more. Should I get you kids a hotel room? Sarah asks. I pull back, then grip Mitch's shoulders as if another wave of dizziness crashes over me. He studies my face and frowns. Have raccoon eyes. What time did you go to bed last night? I don't know. I don't know. I don't look at the clock. I move off his lap and onto the seat next to him and put the sunglasses back on. Sarah pushes a steaming cup of coffee next to me and slides over the little crooked cardboard box of coffee fixings. You do look wicked tired, she says. You're going to get sick if you keep this up. I tear open two blue packets, pour them in the cup, Add dairy creamer, and stir with a thin wooden stick. I blow ripples across the surface of the coffee and sip. Ah, aspartame, gelatin, caffeine, and hot, melted styrofoam. I'm fine, I say. It's not a big deal. Mitch snaps his coffee stir in half. You went running last night, didn't you? Late. Falling in love makes you stupid. You say things that you probably should keep to yourself. A couple of weeks ago, Mitch thought that running at night was cool. He points the broken end of the stick at me. It's not good, Malone. It's not safe. It's perfectly safe. You worry too much, Pangborn. Mitch breaks the coffee stirrer again. I reach across him for the donut bag and I peck twings again. Damn, that hurts. There are two donuts left, plain and glazed. Glazed is an indulgent donut. Breakfast for spoiled rah-rahs. I take the plane. Sarah cuddles up to Travis and kisses his skull. Wake up, stud boy. Travis has been snoring quietly, his shaved head reflecting the sun. He pulls the overnight shift at Superfresh a couple times a month. It's good for his bank account, but it makes staying awake in school next to impossible. Sarah sets a coffee cup in front of his nose. His nostrils twitch, then he groans and sits up. After a gulp of coffee, he blinks and focuses on Sarah's face, then Sarah's lips. He groans again. 
This boy has it so bad for her. It's a thing of beauty. They've been going strong for four years. This worries me. What are they going to do in September? It's not like Trav can move into her dorm room, though I probably shouldn't give him ideas. Shouldn't they be cutting their losses, closing doors, getting ready to pack it up and say goodbye? They don't care. They are in love. Sarah scrapes chocolate frosting off of her donut and applies it to Travis's lips, then sucks it off. Do you have to do that in public? Mitch asks. Sarah unsticks herself from Travis's face. Yes, she purrs before going back to work. Mitch steals Travis's coffee stir and breaks it in half. I keep my eyes on my cup. Mariah got into Stanford, I say. She'll burn out. Yeah. He slips his arm around my waist again and he squeezes once. Don't worry, you're in. The letter's on its way, and if they screwed it up and didn't admit you, you'll just go someplace else and transfer. Chill, Kate. It's gonna be okay. I dunk my donut in my coffee. They're letting me in. They will. The end of my donut crumbles and sinks into the bottom of the cup. They have to. At the front of the cafeteria, the football players explode in laughter. The red-chuckled flannel Terry Witch shape rises and walks to a different table, then sits. The team rises and follows her. It's a game. Tease Terry. The team chants quietly. Bitch, bitch, bitch. The good news is that they aren't harassing me or my friends. The bad news is that they're harassing Terry. The hair on the back of my neck stands up. We're looking at a situation here. The noise causes Sarah and Travis to come up for air. I don't know what kind of bug is up their collective butt, Sarah says. Travis mumbles something. But they've been dogging Terry all period. Three times she's changed tables and they keep following. So you're going to run to her rescue, I ask. Please, do I look mental, Sarah sputters. But still... They'll get bored, Travis predicts. Picking on Tubby Terry's a middle school game. She's not Tubby Terry anymore, I point out. She's all muscle. They should be recruiting her for the defensive line. The team chants quietly as to not alert the cafeteria monitors gossiping in the kitchen. Bitch, bitch, bitch. Terry's had enough. I tense, waiting for her to throw one of the morons into the trash can. I hate days that start with cafeteria fights, but wait... Terry's walking away. She pauses only to drop her orange juice carton in the garbage. Wow, Travis exclaims. Excellent pacifist response. I bet she's going to burn down the locker room, Sarah says. Remember what she did to Amber? Oh, Amber, a cheerleader. Made the mistake of telling Terry that she should bathe more often. They never proved who put the dead skunk in Amber's pearl white Jetta, but it didn't matter. The message was sent. The clock is ticking down. We only have two minutes left. Mitch collects our trash, and Sarah puts the unused creamers in her purse. The cafeteria ladies cackle in the distance. I give the sunglasses back to Sarah and put in my own nasty specs. Yuck. The world returns in cold, horrid focus. She's back, Sarah says, nodding her head towards Terry Litch, who is storming across the front of the room, forgot her books. The second hand sweeps past the numbers on the face of the clock, rushing to the bell. The football team rises. Terry Litch walks over to them. It happens in slow motion. A ballet. Pas de deux. Terry lifts a thick history book and swings it in a wide arc until it smashes into the mouth of Art Smith, defensive tackle. Art flies backward. A tooth sails over the team and lands near the door. One freeze frame. Fight! Bellows a bull. Action! The team goes nuts. Terry plows her meaty fist into the side of Brandon Fig's heads and he goes down without a word. Then Terry goes down, not even her red shirt visible under the shouts and the arms of the angry boys. We have to do something. We can't walk away from a traffic accident in the middle of the cafeteria. Sarah gets there first, screaming like a banshee, her black hair a flag waving behind her. It's hard to tell who's fighting whom. The team is shoving, punching, pulling, even on each other. Sarah wades in, plucking at sleeves with her long, pinchy fingers. Other people flow into the room, some fighting, some not so fighting. A girl wails in the corner. You guys, cut it out. 
You guys, cut it out. This is the suburbs. With the exception of Terry Litch, no one knows how to land a real punch. A thought flashes by in record time, and I can't keep it from unfolding. These guys are lucky she didn't bring her dad's shotgun to school. Travis yanks on football jerseys, pulling the scum apart one body at a time. I should do something. I know I should. The wailing continues, pitching up to a whine. Cut it out, guys. Guys, cut it out. Terry Litch's glasses skitter across the floor. Mitch. Oh, God. Mitchell Pangborn. He climbs up on the table next to the fray and raises his arms over to form a giant O. He looks like an apprentice mime. The hell are you doing? I shout. Making a statement, he answers. Zero tolerance. He shakes his arms for emphasis. Get it? Zero. Sometimes it's hard to believe he got into Harvard. Get down from there, Pangborn, I say. This is no time for performance art. The security squad finally arrives, followed by the principal and all sorts of pink-faced adults. Terry rises up from the pack, cursing at the top of her lungs. They grab her arms. Her watch is ripped off and falls to the floor. The bell rings. It's over. The fight is over. Sarah flicks her hair out of her face and stalks past me, muttering, Oppressive bastards. Think they own the place. I told them that karma's gonna kick their asses. Security hustles Terry out of the room. She's screaming that they broke her watch, that somebody better buy her a new one. The football players fade into the crowd, except for Art, the guy who lost the tooth. He wants to file a complaint. I pick up Terry's glasses. The nose piece is grimy and the lenses are scratched. I fold the arms and set them on top of her books. Her watch has disappeared. Mitch hops off the table, stumbling a bit when he hits the floor. I look over him and say, This day has been really... He grabs my face and kisses me. It tastes like coffee and donuts and toothpaste. I kiss him back until I have to breathe. Thanks, I say. Needed that. 2.6. Boron. Third period English. Hell. Smell the sulfur, feel the flames. English is worse than a waste of time. It robs valuable brain cells that could be doing something practical. I sit by the window. Mitchell slips into the seat in front of me. Get out your texts, Miss Devlin whispers. I'm here under protest. I was promised that Mythology 231 would be a multiple choice English class with little discussion and no essays. I hate essays. Please get out your texts, your notebooks, and something to write with. With which to write? You know what I mean. Miss Devlin is a student teacher, exactly three years older than I am. She has nothing to teach me. Null. Nada. Nothing. A teacher, a good teacher anyways, is composed of molecules of education and intelligence, bonded together by patience and passion. Miss Devlin breaks down into equal parts of desperation, hairspray, and mints. Her bonds are not strong. She could fly apart at any minute. Much better, Miss Devlin says. Now who wants to tell us the backstory of Athena? She waddles down the aisle, checking for contraband headphones and comic books. I bet her pantyhose are slipping off her butt. Athena, daughter of Zeus, it was in last night's reading. Mitch raises his hand. Of course he did the reading. He probably read it in the original Greek text. I study in the parking lot. Time in English class passes so slowly, I swear I can see the cars rusting. After about a million years, a dented gray van pulls in and cruises the aisles looking for an open space. I sure hope they brought their IDs. I blink. No way. It can't be. It's the Godmobile, my dad's church van, and it's looking for a place to park. I lean forward, forgetting about Athena and Zeus and Mitchell, who can be absurd, but tastes good. The van hesitates in front of an open spot marked for disabled parking, then moves on. I sit back in my seat, flash frozen. Why is Dad here? He hates coming here. We fight about it all the time. He says it's unnecessary because I, quote, have everything under control, and other assorted garbage which really means I'm on my own. Another layer of ice forms. Maybe someone is dead. Maybe it's Toby, who is a perverted moron, but he's my brother. 
And what if a bee stung him and he had a bad allergic reaction and his throat swelled closed and choked to death in math class? He hates math. What a horrible way to die. No, 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 stop. Breathe. No one is dead. No one is dying. Get a grip. Think happy thoughts. Dad has the letter. The fat letter. The fat letter from the Thank You Jesus Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Salvation. Holy Mother, I'm going to Cambridge. I don't need a safety school or a backup plan because everything is working out just the way I planned it. The ice shell around me melts and the sun comes out and a rainbow streaks across the sky. The letter has details from student housing and financial aid and a note from track coach welcoming me aboard in my summer reading list and advice to incoming freshmen. That's me. My temperature soars past 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm burning with joy 101, 102, 103. I fry this high school skin to a crisp and emerge from the ashes, a college student. Get me out of here. I am free. I am so gone. What is the point of sitting here anyways? Why waste Miss Devlin's valuable time? The godmobile stops and parks in a visitor slot next to the nurse's car. I'm halfway out of my seat before I realize it. Kate Malone? Is something wrong? Miss Devlin asks. Delete that thought. Reality intrudes. The mail never, ever comes earlier than four o'clock. There's no way on earth he can have that letter. No way. I sit back down. Leg cramp, I say. My gluteus maximus hurts. Mitch chokes back a laugh. Miss Devlin knows nothing about my anatomy, but he does. The door of the godmobile opens. It can't be the letter. It can't be the letter. Dad sits there for a second. Then he takes off his seatbelt and gets out of the van. I hope it's the letter. He looks very small from up here. Miss Devlin draws a family tree of the Greek gods on the board. Athena was born from the skull of Zeus, jumped out as a full-sized adult dressed for battle. Bad Kate screams, why do we need to know this? Time drips off the clock while I sleep with one eye on the door and the other in the parking lot. This is the type of torture that Zeus would approve of. Dad returns to the godmobile just before the period ends. He's wearing the serious, loving pastor face. Dad is on duty. It was a false alarm. I gotta breathe again. Damn. Miss Devlin writes out our homework on the board. Study the incarnations of Athena. Greek vocab definitions. Academy. Hubris, Catalyst, Catharsis, Agape, Essay on Artemis due next week. I flip open my agenda book, every hour penned in, every minute accounted for. At the top of the page, in the right-hand corner, is red ink, a fat number one. One more day. I started counting 93 days ago, when my application was shunted from the early decision to the everyone else pile. It feels like a lot longer than that but now we're down to real time. Meat time. Fresh and gristle time. One more day until the waiting is over. The letter will come and everything will be okay. Bad Kate wants to stand on the desk, rip off her shirt, and dance like a wild woman. Good Kate won't allow that. She draws a heart around the red number one. Two point seven Solubility the Springville coach calls us to the starting line. Hurry up, men. Ladies, too. Let's get this over with. Move it, you slackers, Coach Reed shouts. This is not officially a meet. Coach Reed and the Springville coach cooked up an unofficial scrimmage, a 5K race between the long-distance runners of the two teams. The spring track season depresses cross-country runners because we can only officially compete in the two-mile runs. We like to go the distance. Cross country was made for me. I'm small and wiry and tenacious as hell. Any fool can run fast on an expansive track with lane markers, starting blocks, and a tailwind. Show me a girl who can slog it out against driving sleet, wearing mud-caked shoes and a wool cap that drips down the back of her neck. Now that's a runner. The wind chill is below 40. Spring in Syracuse. At least it's not snowing. I pull my orange cap down so that it covers my ears and smack my orange-mittened hands together to keep the blood flowing. All this orange against my purple Meriwether uniform makes me look like a psychedelic Teletubby. Focus on the race, Malone. Focus on the race. Win. My glasses slide down my nose. I push them back up with my mitten. Take your marks, 
The Springfield coach lifts an arm in the air, pretending he's holding a gun. Bam! He shoots in the air. I hesitate. Freeze on the line. My glasses slip again. The screws must be loose, but I can't worry about that now. I take them off and toss them at the coach and run. I jog at 70% to let my legs warm up. Let the hotshot underclassmen dash ahead. No one sprints for 3.1 miles. I'll catch them in the end. I pick up the pace about half a mile in when my ears are oiled. Sweat beads between my shoulder blades, under my breasts, and at my waistband. My left Achilles tendon aches. I run faster. The sweat blooms into the rain that soaks my uniform. I pass one body, then two, three. Keep your eyes on the ground, Kate. Don't turn an ankle. Slow down to skitter over sodden leaves, accelerate uphill, pass a pack of six. The Achilles relaxes and stretches. My thighs heat up. I shift gears again, 80%. My dad used to run long distance. He still wears his marathon t-shirt sometimes. He'll never catch me doing a marathon. I love to run, but come on, 26 miles? That's whack. Mom was a sprinter. She could do the 100-yard dash in just a few heartbeats. The path wanders through a dark pine grove. The air is colder here. Focus, Malone. Run faster. My feet feel out the path, testing the traction for the wet needles. I set the pace, find the rhythm, find the pattern. The run till you win pattern. Step, step, step. Breathe. Breathe. Step, 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 step. Breathe. Breathe. One more sound. My braid smacking against my spine like a rope against a flagpole. Step, step, step. Thwack, 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 thwack. Breathe. 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 Running is a mathematical sport. My races are a consistently balanced equation. Effort equals result. Relax, Malone. Relax. Just run faster. The day jumps back at me in jagged fragments. The godmobile in the wrong place. My father wearing the wrong face. Step, step, step. Thwack, 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 thwack. Dad never comes to school, not even for track meets. Did somebody get busted, try to kill themselves? Was he called in to counsel Terry? He'll have a black eye tonight if he did, though. He just looks so weird, so small and undad-like. Lactic acid is weighing down my legs. I haven't passed anyone in a while. Am I in front of the pack? My Achilles hurts again, and that stupid pulled peck. Breathe, breathe, control the mind. Need a positive, rhythmic phrase. Almost there. Almost there. Oh, so close. Just so close. Another phrase wells up from the mud at the bottom of my sneakers. No envelope. No envelope. No envelope. Bad rhythm. Out of sync. I stumble and have to slow down for a second. Negative thoughts are not allowed. Run faster. New phrase. MIT. 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 Much better. Step, 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 step. Thwack, 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 thwack. Won't let you in, won't let you in, won't let you in. Another tight turn, no other runners. Did they all go the wrong way? I check my watch, bring it up to my face so I can see the numbers. I should be near the school by now. I'm on pace to be crossing the finish line by now. My feet slow down, then stop. The rain changes to hail. I went exactly the wrong direction in the woods. I'm dead last, so they aren't even timing me. The Springville coach, wearing a winter parka now, now approaches me. You must be Katie Malone. I think these are yours. He hands me my glasses. Kate, I say automatically. Rhymes with late, he gives with a chuckle. Ha ha, I say. Steam rises from my head when I take off my cap. I wring the water out of it and stick it back on. Then I put on my glasses. The coach's face is fluid and wavy. He grins. Got lost, huh? I bet it was in the woods. He's oddly cheerful about this. I bet he's wearing thermal underwear. The Merryweather bus pulls up alongside us. I yank my cap down over my face and feel my way up the steps. Two point eight reduction. When we get back to school, I beeline from the bus to my car. I take Mitch's crimson Harvard sweatshirt out of the trunk and put it on, then take a water jug and refill the radiator. My nose hairs are frozen, and I'm soaked to my underwear. I want to stand in the hot shower until the marrow in my bones boil. Bert's engine starts right away, and he steers us towards home. I got lost on the course. How stupid. How stupid. 
pathetic, lame, ridiculous, moronic, and, and, uh, need another adjective. Not sure if there's a better word for this feeling. It's like pouring vinegar into baking soda and having it vomit all over the lab tail while a panel of distinguished judges observe. Uh, I flick on the turn signal, check my mirror, check the mirror again. God, I look like a refugee. And merge into the highway. I hate merging. I can never tell if I'm supposed to speed up or slow down. Just a few more hours, Malone. MIT, MIT, MIT. The letter's coming. Hang in there. The traffic thins as I approach my exit. My teeth chatter. Is it possible to knock out a filling by chattering too hard? I'm going to stand in the shower, then drink hot chocolate and curl into my bed with extra blankets and a heating pad and Mr. Spock. And even Sophia can join us if she'll contribute the body heat. Off the exit, skim down a few country roads, past a dead strip mall, then a narrowly plowed field. Then, past the blinking yellow, turn right, I can see a church steeple and the roof of our house. Quarter of a mile later, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors and see all the dear God. I pull into the driveway. The parking lot's overflowing with cars. It's Chicken and Biscuit Wednesday. Oh, Katie, thank heavens you're here. Betty chuckles as she rummages through our silverware drawer. We can't find the big box of spoons. You know the one. Betty is our church secretary, organist, and official busybody. She is six inches shorter than me, but three times as wide. And she smells of face powder. Each Christmas, she knits me a tacky cardigan that I pretend to hate but secretly adore. I'm going to put one on as soon as I get out of the shower. She closes the first drawer and opens another. I checked everywhere in the church. They have to be here. I haven't seen them. My capillaries are jammed with ice flows. I grab my brother's jacket off the back of the kitchen chair and slip it on. Betty stares at the water running down my legs. I rummage through a pile of newspapers on the table. Where's Toby? He's playing video games in the family room. That cough of his sounds better. Good. I lift up the pile and look under it. Where's the mail? What mail? Our mail. The family mail. My mail. Well, it's not on that table. I inhale slowly, counting to ten. I know. I just looked. Boy called for you. That cute one with the freckles. Mitchell? I think you should marry him, Katie. Jesus would approve. Jesus lives in the back of Betty's television set. They chat a lot. I'm not getting married until after graduate school, Betty. I just want the mail. Where's Dad? Betty's left eye twitches. I don't know. Are you sure you don't know where those spoons are? I count to 64 in base 2. Betty, when you see Dad, tell him I desperately need the mail. I'll be in the shower thawing. Betty rifles through our junk drawer. Oh no, dear, you don't want to shower now. The hot water's all gone. Gone? But I shiver at the horrifying vision of showering at school, or worse, at Betty's house. Your boiler's broken. You don't have any hot water. She pulls out an ancient silver tablespoon. The spoon part is bent up and back, making it look like a golf club. Betty slips it into her pocket. No telling when it'll be fixed. You might as well come over to the church and help. She closes the drawer with a dramatic sigh. Of course, if you want to stay here, well, I won't tell you what to do, even if the Catholics are coming. The word Catholics is whispered, as in those people. Betty is 500 years old, old enough to remember the Catholics and the Protestants at war. The Catholics won't bite Betty, I promise. They're nice, normal people, just like me and just like lots of folks. And I'd love to help, but like I said, I've had a long day and a long, bad day. You'll have to do the chicken and biscuits without me tonight. Heavy footsteps announce the approach of the presence. Betty looks over my shoulder and smiles. Good evening, Reverend, she says. My, don't you look handsome. 2.9. Surface Tension the church kitchen is crammed with ladies hovering over giant vats of bubbling food. It's hot in here, and it smells like a chicken sauna. When I walk in, the ladies smile at me, then point to the sink. They're a bit phobic about hand washing, so I set my watch in a chipped teacup on a shelf above the sink and scrubbed my hands. 
The water is hot enough to melt wax. If our boiler doesn't get fixed, I could always bathe in this sink. The ladies have prepared the dinner with military precision. The food has been purchased, chopped up, and cooked. They know how much to make, even though they never know how many people are coming. This may fall under the heading of a religious miracle. The dozen cardboard boxes on the far counter will be filled with meals for the poor and elderly. Put these ladies in charge of the United Nations and we'd have an end to world hunger within the month. Miss Cummings rushes in, carrying two heavy grocery bags. Sorry I'm late. I couldn't find lemonade anywhere, she tells the ladies. Key, did it come? I scrub under my nails. Nope. She puts the bags on the counter. I can't believe it's taking so long. Is there anything I can do? Do you need to talk or something? I dry my hands on a blue striped towel and pick up the ladle. No thanks, I'm good. Before she can say something else, I scoot over to the food line. Chicken and biscuit night is simple and profitable. Pay your money and you get a plate and utensils wrapped in paper napkin. You can choose one biscuit or two. Hand me your plate and I'll ladle on pieces of chicken and gravy as fast as I can, trying to remember to smile. Drinks are at the end of the line. Desserts are on the preschool table by the upright piano. The line moves. Dip, ladle, don't drip, smile, nod, next. Dip, ladle, don't drip, smile, nod, next. The catatron has been activated. Dip, ladle, don't drip, smile, nod, next. Howdy, Miss Kate. How's it going? An old man hands me his plate. Mr. Lockhart, our handyman, my savior, one of Dad's strays. Some of the kitchen ladies don't like the fact that he drinks whiskey, but I don't see any of them offering to patch the roof or clean out the nest of squirrels in the attic. I pile three biscuits on his plate. Mr. Lockhart, I'm so happy to see you. I dig deep in the pot for hunks of chicken. Our boiler is broken and we don't have any hot water. He nods once. Yeah, I heard. He rubs the white stubble on his neck. Could've lost the pilot light. That'd be bad, I guess gas in the basement. The fellow behind him, a farmer, leans in. Gas would mean an explosion. That'd be bad too, says Mr. Lockhart. Of course, it could be a loose wire, an electric problem, the farmer says. Or the ignition switch, muses Lockhart. That goes at the wrong time and boom, you got another explosion. An executive type dad fidgets behind the farmer. He butts in. Can you discuss explosions at your table, please? Some of us have things to do tonight. Mr. Lockhart ignores him. Could be the darn thing just died. It's old. I'll take a look after I eat some. Great, I say, handing back his plate. Could you try to fix it tonight? I'll do my best, Miss Katie, he says solemnly. Hey, the Reverend told me you were running a big race today. Did you beat him? His watery eyes open wide. His smile shows brown, shipped teeth. His wife and children were killed years ago when he drove the family car into a snowplow on Route 81 during a blizzard. He didn't drink much before then. Yes, Mr. Lockhart, I beat them all by a mile. That's my girl, he cackles. He leans over and gives me a smelly kiss on the middle of my forehead. Thanks, Mr. Lockhart. Don't forget the boiler. The farmer gets two biscuits. The executad gets one. And I'll be darned, but I can only find flakes of chicken for him. Shucks. The line shuffles forward and I keep ladling. I'm warmer now, and I don't think my own particular body odor is stronger than anyone else's in here. Or maybe the smell of the cooked chicken masks everything. The tables have filled up, and I think the Catholics are mingling. Chicken and biscuit night makes more sense to me than Sunday morning services. If my father ever decides to talk to me about religion again, I'll point that out to him. People who avoid his sermons turn up here every month. Kate, it's Sarah. I have been calling and emailing constantly. You've been, like, nowhere. She points at me. What happened? You look terrible. The man behind Sarah interrupts. Excuse me, but some of us are hungry. Another executad. What is up with these guys? I dump some gravy on his biscuits. Then Miss Cummings appears next to me and might takes my ladle. Go ahead, eat, Kate. You must be starving. I take three biscuits, my wages, and an extra large helping of chicken and gravy and scoot out the ladle line. Sarah and I take a table in the corner. Sarah strikes people as a vegetarian, save the whales type chick, but she loves eating meat. 
She just says little prayers to whatever she's eating, thanking it for the sacrifice. She chews her first bite of chicken in silence. Prayer's over. So why are you here? I ask. Well, Mitch was IMing Travis, and Travis was talking to me, so I heard how you almost had a heart attack in English because you thought your dad had the letter. And then I got a message from Amy, and she said you blew out your knee at the track meet, but she always exaggerates. But since I hadn't heard from you, I figured I'd come over. She pauses to inhale. I thought you could use some moral support. I plop one of my gravy-soaked biscuits onto her plate. You are the best friend in the universe, in this entire plane of reality. Et toi, si, mon chéri. Now tell me. I fill her in on everything that sucked about the day while we eat. The noise is at full pitch now. The har-har-hars and the ho-ho-hos of good jokes told on a full stomach. The kitchen ladies come out to watch the crowd with satisfied looks on their faces. My brother is laughing with his friends and hasn't coughed once. Dad is working the room like a pro, stopping at each table for a joke or two. Pats on the back, a few heartfelt glances. Miss Cummings brings him a plate of food. He takes a seat between the Catholic priest and a woman in a purple sweater who can't stop blushing. My dad's a real charmer. It's not that he's hot, just the opposite. He's shortish, with gray hair and wrinkles, but he must beam security rays, or maybe women get off on the man of God thing. There is always a divorcee or a widow trying to get her claws onto him, not that they have a chance. When I was a kid, I overheard him tell somebody that he buried his heart when he buried Mom. It took me a long time to figure out what that meant. Is that Jello over there? Sarah asks. I blink back into real time. It's alive, I warn her. You shouldn't eat food that moves. She pushes away from the table and tucks her hair behind her ears. I want three helpings. I tag along behind her as she walks to the dessert table. I'm serious, Sarah. She giggles. Jello is the secret to good mental health. Ooh, look, this one has nuts. I shiver. Nuts don't belong in Jello. I take a slice of apple pie instead. On the way back to our table, I catch a glimpse of red. Someone wearing a red flannel shirt is staring at the kitchen with her back towards us. Sarah, I hiss. Is that Terry Litch? Sarah looks. Can't be. Amy said she got arrested. The guy whose tooth knocked out? Yeah, his parents are pressing charges. Are you sure you don't want any of this? I'll be right back. The kitchen ladies have shifted into cleanup mode. Betty stands on a step stool in front of the sink, her arms in soapy water up to her elbows. Other ladies are attacking the counters with Comet and the cutting boards with bleach. The floor has been swept and the trash removed. The boxes for shut-ins and the poor are packed and gone. There's no sign of Terry. I was just seeing things. I've got the Terry Litch on the brain. Post-traumatic stress from watching the fight in the cafeteria. I really need some sleep. I reach around Betty and take the chipped teacup off the shelf. It's empty. My watch is gone. Was Terry here? I ask Betty. She stops scrubbing. That big lich girl? The one and only. Was she here? She's gone, honey, says a woman drying a pot. She took my watch. Oh no, Betty says. She wouldn't do a thing like that. She was so sweet as can be. Betty sends Christmas cards to mass murderers on death row, apparently. A couple of the other ladies have slowed the pace of their scrubbing. They know the Lich family stories that go back generations. The oldest woman peels off her yellow rubber gloves with a snip. She just left, Kate. If you hurry, you might catch her. 2.10. Elastic Collision I spot Terry Lich's back crossing the graveyard. I want my watch back. Kate equals bull on a rampage. Terry equals red flag. I wait until she's moving down the hill before I jog after her. Here's my plan. 1. Make sure that she really has it. 2. Ask her for it nicely. 3. Ask her again firmly. 4. Walk away humiliated when she laughs. Huh, I need a new plan. I skirt the cemetery fence and stay low. I don't want her to see me yet. She might look back, though it's unlikely, because if there was anybody born without a guilty conscience, it's formerly Tubby Terry Litch. I stick to the shadows. This is kind of fun. Maybe I could be a combination Nobel Prize winning chemist and international spy. Plan 2. 1. 
make sure she has the watch, two, tackle her, three, take watch by force, four, run like hell. That one might actually work. Statistically speaking, the probability is not out of range. What about the consequences? I hear the voice of Mitchell, afraid of his own shadow, pangborn as clearly as if he were standing next to me. I look around. No Mitch. He's not here. It's just me and the dead people and Terry pulling out of sight at the bottom of the hill. I'm hallucinating my boyfriend's voice, another sign that I need more sleep. Consequences. Mitchell is very big on consequences, which explains his virginity. Mine too, for that matter. Screw it. I want my watch back. It used to be my mom's. I trot down the hill and crouch by the crumbling stone fence. Terry walks past the old barn, and her sleeves are pulled all the way down, covering her wrists. I know she's got it. As she heads towards the house, I tiptoe into the shadows of the barn and crouch behind the pickup truck. This barn is just about dead. The next good storm will flatten it. The Liches sold off the last of their cows after Mr. Lich went to jail. If they had any sense, they'd sell the land too and get out of here. Terry pauses on the porch steps to watch a red Toyota hatchback come up the driveway. A witness. This could be helpful. The driver gets out. It's Miss Cummings. Excellent. A reliable witness who will take my side no matter what. Terry lights a cigarette while Miss Cummings takes something out of the back seat. The smoke filters up to the dim porch light. Miss Cummings carries a box, a shut-in chicken and biscuit dinner box, to the porch and speaks quietly. Terry reaches for the doorknob. Aha! Step one accomplished. My watch is on her wrist. I can't believe her. I can't believe it. Not only did she flat out steal it from a church basement, I'd like to point out, she has the balls to wear it too. I grind my feet in the dirt, unsure of what to do. Step two, tackle her, seems highly theoretical now. Terry turns towards where I'm hiding and squints through her glasses. Her left eye is bruised and swollen from the cafeteria fight. She points to me. Damn. Hey, Kate, Terry calls loudly. You coming in? Miss Cummings is startled. She looks towards the shadows. Kate? Double damn. How am I going to explain this? I just wanted my watch back. Then a long, hot shower. A bag of Cheetos, maybe, and a couple hours on the online. Come on in, Katie. Terry sounds like a carnival barker. Meet the family. 2.11. Half-Life. In the middle of the Lich living room, there are two kitchen chairs, a couch, and a television turned to a game show, full volume. Broken furniture is piled against the walls, along with file cabinets, a lawn tractor, and a folded-up playpen. A wicker basket of plastic fruit rests on the tractor seat, red apples, two pears, and an orange, all of them covered in crayon graffiti. The ceiling is stained brown from cigarette smoke. The arrangement is lightened by two floor lamps plugged into an extension cord that snakes underneath the couch. It's a very old house, says Miss Cummings. The original section must predate the Civil War, I bet. Just beyond the reach of the light, I can see a small rocking chair in the corner. In fact, the whole corner looks like it was set up for a little kid. The floor is covered with a brightly colored Sesame Street rug that is scattered with plastic blocks and metal cars. More cars and trucks are jumbled into an old Easter basket. The bookcase under the window is loaded with books and puzzles. The corner is not tidy, but it is clean. Miss Cummings shifts the box to her hip. I didn't know you were friends with Terry. I'm not. She stole something from me. Before she can answer, Terry guides a tiny woman into the room. The woman inches across the floorboards in scuffed slippers. She's not wearing glasses, but it's clear she can't see well. She keeps one hand floating lightly in the air in front of her. Terry leads the woman to the couch. She sits, barely making a dent in the cushion. Two bobby pins keep her blonde hair out of her face. Her nose is flat and crooked, her eyes vague, her mouth thin. A pink scar interrupts her left eyebrow and makes her look permanently confused. Even with the nice hair, this is the kind of woman you look at and think, bag lady. This is my mom, Terry says. I look at my teacher for a clue. It's good to see you again, Mrs. Litch, Miss Cummings says. She sets the box on the floor, steps forward, and gently squeezes one of Mrs. Litch's hands. 
I'm Amanda Cummings, from the church. We met a few weeks ago. Mrs. Litch's face relaxes. Yes, thank you for coming. Her voice is too young for her face. Have a seat, please. No, I can't. I just dropped off a few things for dinner. For just a minute? Miss Cummings sits on a kitchen chair. Okay, but I don't want to intrude. Terry sits on the other chair. Why don't you sit down, Kate? Sit next to my mom. Why don't I run out the door screaming? I want my watch back. That's why. It's worth more than my car. She'd better not be stretching the band. It looks tight on her. I sit on the couch. Mrs. Litch turns her face to me and extends her hand. I was waiting for a whiff of beer or whiskey, but she smells a little like lemon. I, on the other hand, reek of sweat and stewed chicken. I'm Kate, I say, shaking her cool hand. Kate Malone. Kate is Reverend Malone's daughter. She goes to the school with Teresa, Miss Cummings explains. How nice, says Mrs. Litch. Oh, it's great, Terry says. That's a cool watch you're wearing, Teresa, I say. The scar over Mrs. Litch's eye twitches just a hair. Someone loses a thousand dollars on the game show and the audience groans. It looks just like my watch, in fact. I can't find mine. Have you seen it? Terry takes a deep breath. I shrink down to size one. She can't beat me up. Not in front of her mother and a teacher. Can she? I'm saved from certain death by the arrival of a small blonde boy. Or rather, a NASCAR race car disguised as a small blonde boy. He motors into the room, a red metal Corvette in his left hand, a small ambulance missing its wheels in his right. His eyes are the color of a clean spring sky. He's wearing jeans, red sneakers, and a faded pajama top. As he runs around the room, he makes engine noises, shifting gears up and down, squealing tires. A diaper rustles under his pants. Come here, boy, says Mrs. Litch. The little guy climbs into her lap and hides his face against her shoulder. He peeks at me once. You could get lost in those eyes. They're heartbreakers. That's Mikey, Terry says. He's two. Mikey peeks at me again and smiles. He has dimples and tiny tic-tac teeth. I put my hand out. Mikey grabs my finger for a second, then lets go and hides his face again. Another contestant is trying for big money on the television. Terry turns up the sound of the audience roaring. She'll pound the snot out of me later, I guess. I really should be going, Miss Cummings says as she stands. So soon? asks Mrs. Litch. Terry stares at the television, her arms crossed over her chest. The wrist with the stolen watch is hidden. I pushed myself off the couch. Me too. I have homework. Suit yourself, Terry says. The game show cuts to a commercial and there is a loud knock at the door. Is there a Mikey bear in there? shouts a gruff voice. Mikey squirms out of his mother's lap and races to open the door. My father steps inside. Bear! Mikey squeals. My father growls and crouches to the ground. Mikey Litch jumps straight into his arms. They wrestle like grizzlies for a second, both of them laughing. Then Dad stands up, holding Mikey. The little bear hands him the ambulance. Thank you, Dad says. Is that ear feeling any better? Got a kiss for me? Mikey plants a wet one on Dad's cheek and Dad looks at Terry. Did the medicine help? She nods, eyes on the television. Fever's gone. Good evening, Mrs. Litch, his voice trails off. Evening, Reverend, Mrs. Litch says. Hello, Dad. You don't see my dad speechless very often. Mikey runs the race car along his shoulder and up his neck. Dad stands there, his eyes locked on me, like he's seeing me for the first time. Miss Cummings breaks for the door. I really have to be going. I have a conference in Troy tomorrow. You'll have a sub, Kate. I hope they dig up a good one. Don't forget to put that chicken in the fridge, too. Bam. She's gone. Dad waits until the lights of her Toyota have backed all the way down the street before saying anything. What are you doing here? Terry has my watch. Do not, Terry mumbles, and I want it back. Terry crosses the room and takes Mikey from my father's arms. You know it's mine, I say. She bounces Mikey up and down on her hip and he clutches at her shirt. You can't prove it. What? How can you say that? Dad, take a look at it. Reverend Malone frowns and turns off the television. Kate, this isn't the time. I came here to talk to Mrs. Litch about the fight. 
The scar over Mrs. Litch's eye jerks upward. Another one? Shit, Terry murmurs. She turns and disappears down the dark hall, Mikey still in her arms. What about my watch? Did somebody bother you? Her mother calls. You promised me, Teresa. Dad moves a chair in front of the couch and sits. His voice is soft. I'll explain. It wasn't too bad, but you need to... He breaks off and looks at me. Kate, why don't you take that food back to the kitchen? Actually, I'd love to sit here and figure out what's going on. Reality feels rather plastic, as if I've been operating in an enclosed sphere, and the covering melted, and all of a sudden I'm in an entirely new world, a world in which my father is tight with the liches, my chem teacher is a closet social worker, and people use lawn tractors for furniture, and watches change hands too easily. Kate, Dad says, a little too loudly. Mrs. Litch sniffs and dabs at her eyes with the edge of her sleeve. I'm going. The kitchen is stuffed into an addition off the back end of the house. The window over the sink gives a terrific view of the rotting barn. Air from the heating vent flutters an old calendar nail to the wall. Above the small table hangs a plastic clock, frozen at twelve noon, or midnight, depending on your perspective. One corner of the table is piled high with magazines. Someone did the dishes earlier. Pale yellow plates and bowls, a couple of coffee cups, and a small plastic mug are upside down in the drainer. They are all dry. The counters are also wiped clean. I put the chicken in the refrigerator and sneak out the back door. I need to run. Part 2. Liquid. A catalyst is a substance which increases the rate of a reaction. It is consumed in one step of the reaction and then regenerated later in the process. The catalyst is not used up, but it provides a new, lower energy path for the reaction. From Arco, everything you need to score high on AP Chemistry, 3rd edition. 3.0. Galvanize. Safety tip. Store oxidizers away from other chemicals. We have a substitute teacher in chem. He says that we have to watch a movie because chemicals give him a rash and he's really an English teacher. He brought a video from home from us. Alice in Wonderland. A family classic, he says. My lab partner snorts. Family classic, she mutters. Mind-altering drugs, demented hatters, and a homicidal queen. She opens her Spanish book to the pluperfect subjunctive. The movie opens with Alice perched in a tree, complaining about history with her sister. Enter the white rabbit, stage left, his glasses wobbling at the end of his nose. I'm overdue, I'm in a stew, he frets. I sigh and rest my chin on my books. I would not admit this under torture, but I love Disney movies. Everyone does. Disney is our collective step-parent, the nice one who tells us bedtime stories and bakes cupcakes. Alice follows the rabbit down the hole. She falls, she shrinks, she worms her way past the locked doors and ends up a stranger in a strange land with Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and they're blocking her path. They have an eerie lich look to them. I glance at my empty wrist. My watch is still in the clutches of evil Tweedle Terry. I borrow Diana's pen and draw a sports watch on my skin. It has a timer, 50 laugh memory, altimeter, barometer, and a compass. Alice in Wonderland could use a little watch like this. She eats a cookie that's probably laced with human growth hormone and shoots up as a big house. I ask Toby if he's been sneaking Wonderland cookies. That would explain the size of his feet. There is a soft knock at the door of the classroom. A thin face peers in the window and waves a white envelope at me. It's my father. Diana looks up away from her subjunctives and nudges me. An envelope? The envelope? An envelope? Nah, he can't fool me twice. It's too early for the mail. Dad motions for me to join him. Diana pokes at my shoulder with her pen. My brain feels like a slurpee, cold and slow. Diana shoves me. Get going, moron. The sub doesn't notice as I walk across the room. Is it possible to have a heart attack and die at 18? I open the door, step over the threshold, and enter the hall. My father is holding an envelope. The envelope. After all this time, things are happening too fast. I'm not ready. I'm going to puke. This was stuck in a catalog that came yesterday, Dad says. He told me to bring it to you. He hands it over. The magic words glow in the upper left-hand corner. 
Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Office of Admissions. It is a thin envelope. I open it badly. The envelope tears and rips across my name and address, a jagged opening. The letter is brief, murder by stiletto, a thin, sharp blade. We regret to inform you, blah, 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 thousands of qualified candidates, blah, 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 not a reflection on your abilities, blah, 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 many opportunities elsewhere, blah, 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 sincerely, blah, blah, blah. The need to vomit vanishes. Dead girls don't puke. My father picks up the letter and the envelope from the floor. He says something I can't hear. When I don't answer, he looks in the envelope. Maybe the real letter, the acceptance letter, is hidden in there, written in invisible ink on invisible space-age paper. Or it's a Cheshire cat letter and will materialize any second now. Somewhere deep in that envelope are my registration instructions, my financial aid package, and a handwritten note from the cross-country coach. If Dad says that he told me this would happen, I will die all over again. I'm sorry, he says. I'm so sorry. I heard that one. I wish I were three feet tall and he could pick me up and he still had a beard and he wore cotton sweaters that felt soft against my cheek and I would cry it all away and I would wipe my tears on his shoulder and I would suck my thumb and suck the end of my ponytail and he wouldn't tell me only babies did that and he would rock me back and forth on the front porch with wind coming clean from the north and he would sing nursery rhymes with made up words like mom used to and he could teach me the alphabet again and how to walk and how to run and maybe if I would do it even better this time. Dad clears his throat. It's not the end of the world, honey. You have all those other schools. Come here. He pulls me into a hug. He's wearing the tweed jacket from last night. It smells like chicken and it scratches my cheek. The ground shakes, the iceberg that traps us shifts and groans, and I come so close, this close, to being his daughter, the Malone girl, Jack's girl, and letting him be daddy and love me for all my stupid mistakes, and letting him try to put a band-aid on this one even though we both know it's going to bleed for a very long time, but it's the band-aid that counts. I have not inhaled since I saw the envelope. I am a nerd an expired reaction. You could talk to Mr. Kennedy, he says. He'll help you choose from the other schools. You have options, honey. I'm so dead that I can't even think about what this means. Or I could talk to him. I have a meeting in the guidance department. He looks at his watch over my shoulder. In a minute. I step back, a rush of cold air on my cheeks. Why? He cracks his knuckles. Mrs. Litch asked me to come. The police are involved because of the fight Terry was in yesterday. I stand up straighter. And you thought you'd drop off my letter on the way? He frowns. No, it was more than that. You asked me. The iceberg stops groaning and arctic salt water swirls, restoring the space between us, putting us back in our places. I have to get back to Kem. We both look through the door. The cartoon has lulled the class into their happy place. Alice is lost again. Dad folds the letter and inserts it back in the envelope. We'll talk about this tonight. I know you're upset, but we'll figure something out. He hugs my head and I hold my breath. I take the envelope and turn my back to him. I step over the threshold, enter the classroom and close the door behind me, quietly, so it doesn't disturb anyone. Three point zero point one Scientific Method. At my lab table, I review the experiment. Step one, hypothesis. I am brilliant. I am special. I'm going to MIT just like my mom did. I'm going to change the world. Step two, procedure. Acquire primary and secondary school education. Follow all the rules. Excel at chemistry and math. Ace standardized tests. Acquire social skills and athletic prowess. Maintain a crushing extracurricular load. Earn National Science Fair honors, apply to MIT, wait for acceptance letter. Step 3. Results. Failure. Step 4. Retrace steps. Procedure flawless. Step 5. Conclusion. Hypothesis incorrect. I'm a loser. So simple. I light the Bunsen burner. The thin envelope goes up in flames. 3.1. Flammability. Someone has been messing with my locker. 27, 
1828. Jiggle, jiggle, jiggle the handle. Locked. 27, 18, 28. Jiggle, jiggle, jiggle. Damn. If I weren't trapped in a hall of bodies, I could kick this sucker, or punch it, or find a chair and smash it against the crap metal piece of shit until I was standing in a pile of kindling up to my ankles, and then the lock would tumble into place, and the handle would jiggle, jiggle, jiggle open. If there weren't 4,000 strangers bumping into me when one after another, I could get a crowbar and pry this thing open because I have to get my books and my notebooks and look at all the stupid crap that is stuck to the inside of my locker so it can remind me of who I am on days when I forget or want to forget like this one. If there were any justice in the world, I'd be able to flatten myself and slide through the vents into the locker like the door in Alice in Wonderland. Kate in Wonderland, off with her head. Try again. 27, 18, 28. The humiliation. Searing, scarring humiliation. I can't go to the cafeteria. Not ever again. Maybe I could tell them I was banned, that I was caught putting rat poison in the peas, or that I ran into the hall with scissors. I can't go to English class either, because Mitch will be there. Come to think of it, I can't ever see him, or Sarah, or Travis. I can't ever go home, can't go to work, Kids don't run away to join the circus anymore, do they? Too bad. I could work in the sideshow as idiot girl. Or I could run away to New York City and do something dramatically stupid in a subway station. Jiggle, jiggle, jiggle. Why won't this freaking thing open? I lean my head against the locker door. The metal draws the heat away from my brain. Everyone assumes I'll go to Syracuse or Ithaca or Drexel because I applied there, remember? Remember how I sweated over those essays? Remember how I told Dad I wrote the checks for the application fees? Remember how everyone bought the myth that I had been accepted by my safety schools? That I even applied to my safety schools? The freak show could bill me as the amazing lying egghead. See her bullshit the family. See her lie straight face to friends. See her completely tank her life. If I'd concentrate hard enough, maybe I'd be able to separate the molecules of the metal locker door and melt through the surface. Since the lock is jammed, they wouldn't find me until my body had mummified. That would work. Two hands on my shoulder, a deep voice in my ear. I've been looking everywhere for you. Mitchell, Harvard asshole, Pangborn, pulls me away from my locker and spins me around. He lifts my chin with his fingers. He can't lift my eyes. I know. He says, Already? You started a fire in chem class, Malone. Everyone knows. If I concentrate hard enough, maybe I could separate the molecules of linoleum and wood and steel and concrete beneath my feet and sink slowly into the earth. It wasn't a real fire, I say. I could have been hurt. Ha! He pulls me into his sweatshirt, and now I have to concentrate not falling into the spaces between his molecules of skin and muscle and bone. I pull back. Don't. I can't be hugged right now. I can't have all this it'll be okay stuff, okay? Don't be nice to me. I'll scream. I swear. He shoves his hands into the pockets of his jeans. I pull the strap of my photo bag higher on my shoulder and squeeze my books until the edges bite my arms. I don't know what to do, he says. Join the club. Where's Sarah? She's sick. A stomach bug, Travis said. She ate jello with nuts last night. He steps close again, slips his hand around the back of my neck. Kate? I shrug him off. I mean it, Pangborn. I look up, not at his eyes because that would be the end of me, but to glance around the hall. The thousands of bodies have vanished. Poof. I didn't even hear the bell. Somewhere a clock is trying to tick, its hand stuck in molasses. I can't open my locker, I say. He steps around me and spins the dial. Twenty-seven, eighteen, twenty-eight. Click, click, click. The lock surrenders and the door swings open between us. I throw my books inside and slam it shut. I'm late, I say. I have to go. 3.2. Significant figure. That crackle you hear? That's the sound of hell freezing over. Alert the media! Kate Malone is ditching class. The art teacher, Mr. Freeman, and his students are building a statue in the front lobby. The statue is a giant stick figure with two metal legs, a pole for a body, and two long arms that thrust into the air. A guy with a skanky mullet is wrapping paper mache around the legs. While the art elves rummage through the half-dozen plastic bins filled with junk, 
The teacher fires up his glue gun. Artistic people are too random for me. But these kids look harmless. One girl I recognize. She's half famous around here. Melinda something. A senior tried to rape her in a janitor's closet last year. She fought him off and pressed charges. It was pretty cool. It made the papers when he was found guilty. He didn't go to jail, of course. White, upper-class criminals go to the state college, not the state penitentiary. They join the fraternities. State college. My future. And only if they have rolling admissions. The nausea starts in my knees and surges upwards. I cover my mouth and sink to the floor, my back against the wall. My hands are shaking. They don't feel attached. Why I belong at MIT? I'm smart. I work hard. I aced the math SAT. I'm a legacy. I need very little sleep. I don't require a social life. Heat and pressure improve my performance. I could be the reincarnation of Madame Curie, according to Sarah. Why MIT blew me off? I'm not smart enough. I don't work hard enough. My verbal SAT was less than perfect. Mom didn't leave MIT any money in her will. I scared the admissions officer during my review. My essay sucked. I'm linear, not well-rounded, and I'm too short. Melinda something heard me moan. She puts down a spool of copper wire and walks over to where I'm squatting. You okay? I nod. She's a sophomore and wouldn't understand the stress of losing your college. I point at the statue. What's that? Mr. Freeman calls it student body. Looks like a robot. It's supposed to be a puppet. She pulls out her scrunchie and combs through her hair with her fingers. We're covering it with representational pieces, junk that stands for all of us. Mr. Freeman keeps telling us, everybody is a piece. You look really pale. Want me to get the nurse? I shake my head. She can't fix this. She smooths her hair back into a ponytail and winds the scrunchie around it. Got it. Feel free to help if you want. Thanks. I'll just watch. I watch the puppet grow for the next two periods. They cover it with student council campaign buttons, cheerleader hair ribbons, chess pieces, computer chips, and plastic cell phones, excuse cards, a jock strap, and a sports bra. The student body is gender neutral. Crayons, erasers, sheet music, and about a million other things. There's an anatomically correct heart glued to the outside of the chest, dark red and shiny. I bet that'll be the first thing that gets ripped off. The science geeks are represented by glass test tubes. Worry work, good Kate wishes they had used plastic. While they work, I concentrate on alternative career choices. I come up with four. One, janitor. I'm great with a toilet brush. Two, soup kitchen employee. I have significant ladling skills, too. Three, crack cooker. Drug lords are always looking for good chemists, except I'm terrified of guns and crack kills brain cells, and Toby would freak out and have the mother of all asthma attacks. And, oh, okay, I can't be a crack cooker. Four, shirt presser. I could work at that little dry cleaning place next to the Acme. Gack, gack, gack. I think I have a hairball stuck in my throat. Much as it kills me, I'm going to have to talk to my guidance counselor. I stretch once, then stand. Mr. Freeman chuckles as he works on the sculpture's head, a hornet with monstrous eyes. Merryweather High is the home of the horny, horny hornets. It's a long story. As I leave, the art kids are gluing on hundreds of cut-out eyes from the yearbook. All of our eyes together make the kaleidoscope that follows you down the hall. They should call that thing Frankenstudent. 3.3 Dissociation. The guidance office is jammed. Picture a mosh pit of enraged parents ready to body slam the nearest administrator because their precious babies didn't get into the right school. These folks have been robbed. Do you know how much they pay in taxes? I wait in line. Wait, wait, wait. Ignore the choked, snuffling sounds from the precious babies curled in the fetal position on plastic orange chairs. Ignore the clenched fists. Ignore the jiggling knees, the tapping pens. My mind is on pause, my body pulled along by the momentum of the factory line. When I finally get my turn in front of the secretary, she's on the phone and has ten people on hold. She covers the mouthpiece. If you hear about college, Kate, you'll have to take a number. She hands me a pink index card. I'm number 27. Mr. Kennedy, my guidance counselor, opens his door. 
Number four, come back later, Kate, the secretary suggests, or Monday morning, first thing. Do you need a pass? She scribbles one for me with her left hand. Go to the back door, hun. It'll be easier. I shuffle down the hall to the exit, past the sounds of weeping and outrage. The last office is quieter. On one side of the desk sits a guidance counselor. On the other, Terry Litch and her mom, a police officer, and my father. Terry's little brother, Mikey, sits on the floor ripping out pages from a college catalog. 3.4. Calculation. I fumble my way to the math wing. Calculus will save me. Give me integrals, give me functions, derivatives, domains, and ranges. I'm definitely an abled student, broken by the text-based world. I stumble into class and open the holy book of math. Consider the problem of finding the limit for the following function when the value of x is greater than 1. The limit of 100n, where the range of n is from n to infinity. Ah! I ponder a table of neatly organized values. Values of x, values of n, and values of xn. As n approaches infinity, xn approaches infinity. Math reminds me of pebbles, a whole beach of smooth, wet pebbles that you can pick up, turn over, taste, and set down. They can be stacked, subtracted, divided, they can be arranged into patterns, into forms, and into meaning. As I do the math, my blood pressure returns to normal. My stomach stops turning sulfuric acid. My neck unspazzes. I finish the problem set before anyone else. Our math god, Mr. Dodgson, is in the back helping someone who's struggling with the theory of limits. Duh. The limit divided by x as it approaches infinity, x squared plus one half of x minus three, and so on and so on into infinity. Pondering infinity for me might be what prayer is to some other people. Prayer, church, dad, letter, thin, rejection plus destruction of life dream equals utter misery. Oh crap. Time for a clean page. I need to break down my real-life limit problem into its component parts, analyze it, turn it over, taste it, look for a pattern, the form, the meaning. Dissolve the granulates of a problem in imagination and come up with a solution. Goal? Get into MIT. Obstacle? They don't want me. Solution? X. Maybe I could leak this news to the newspaper and shame MIT into letting me in. Maybe I could write to all their famous chemistry grads and get them to force the university to let me in. Maybe I could send them pictures of my father, and then they would feel very sorry for me, and then they would have to let me in. I could offer to work in food service. I could be a probationary student. I could pledge them my first million dollars in wages, and patents to any world-changing discoveries that I make. I could name a new element Massachusetts Institute of Technologium, Good Kate whispers that maybe, perhaps, there could be a small chance that I need to suck it up and accept the situation. I'd rather fall down a bottomless hole. Mitch is lurking in the hall again when I leave calculus. He follows me, his mouth moving again. Look, Kate, it's not like the world has ended. They can't take all the geniuses that apply, but it's going to be okay. I think that you should... Will you look at me, Kate? We have to talk about it. This is so stupid. Come back. Come on, Malone. Kate, come on. The guidance secretary tells me that my counselor had to drive a girl to the hospital. She fainted and cracked her forehead on the edge of his desk. Georgetown rejected her. Stitches, for sure. The adults in this place need better math skills. Meriwether High has more than 1,000 seniors, 80% applied to college, College rejections arrive the same week that fall schedules have to be filled out. We have a total of four guidance counselors. That is what we call an imbalanced equation class. Mitch is waiting for me outside French. I worm my way into a gaggle of giggling freshmen and sneak past him. 3.5. Iron. When the final bell rings, I scurry along the back halls to the locker room. I need to run until I bleed. 
run all the fluids out of my body, pound, pound, and pound the road some more, unplug the hardware, destroy the system. Right now I could run a marathon and worship every step. So, of course, Coach Reed declares that today we're conditioning in the weight room. He unlocks the door and directs people to the silver instruments of torture. Lap pull down, biceps curl, leg extensions. He hesitates when he gets to me. I'm a graduating senior and there are thunderclouds gathered above my head. All right, Malone, you get the treadmill, Coach says. Don't slack. No, sir. I step onto the middle treadmill and punch a flat course, 3.1 miles, a six-minute mile pace. Forget about the slow, safe warm-up. I want to feel it. The room heats up quickly. The radio is badly tuned to a metal station. Weights cling against one another. Athletes grunt and strain. The stair steppers grind. Whirr, whirr, whirr. The girls on the steppers keep their hands on their hips and their chins up. The guys on the other treadmills try to match my pace. Oh yeah? I crank it up another notch. I streak through a half mile, my sneakers blistering the rubber belt. The guy to my right can't hack it. He backs off, slows down. The guy to my left has a sweat dripping down his cheek. He's holding his left elbow against his side. I chuckle. Coach Reed is helping a sophomore bench press 12 pounds. Stop showing off, Malone, he shouts. Bad Kate hopes the sophomore drops that weight on Coach's foot. Good Kate is frantically pointing to our tender Achilles tendon. I know I can run faster than this. I take it higher. My sneakers squeak, sounding like tiny voices on helium. Burp, burp, burp. Rest up. Burp, burp, burp. Screwed up. The guy on my left gives in to his cramps and decelerates. Wussy boy. Slow it down, Malone, Coach orders. The sneaker voices move up off the belt and whispers that they are disappointed in me, that I'm stupid, that I should be ashamed of myself, young lady. Run faster, Kate, just a little faster. Push it. I am flying, whipping through the air. The faces around me blur. My right knee sends up a warning signal. My Achilles is screaming. I can feel the fibers in my quads freeing. Give me the pain. Bring it. I want my heart to explode. A bruised cherry smashed deep in my chest. The muscles under my rib size seize up. I think my shirt is on fire. Kate. 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 I don't know who's saying that. How can they be standing still when I'm running so damn fast? Look out, Kate. Another voice fading away. Another ghost. The lights flicker. Coach Reed yells in my ear, but I can't hear him. His hand slaps the red stop button. 3.5.1 Rust Okay, so I might have passed out a little when they dragged me off the treadmill, but I just needed a nap. A nap. Some dinner, and then a nice shower. No big deal, just leave me alone. 3.6 Dissolve When I get home, I park Bert by the front door and don't bother to carry any books inside. I brush past Toby in the front hall. Don't say a word, I warn. I'm not here. You don't see me. He nods. You're not here. I don't see you. Well, when you do show up, I'll tell you that Sarah and Mitch keep calling. They sound desperate. He shows a handful of Cheetos in his mouth. Did you break up with him or something? Don't eat all of those. I lock the bathroom door, strip, and step into the shower. We have hot water again, thanks to Mr. Lockhart and his magic tools. Boiling, scalding, sterilizing water hurts so good. I close my eyes and let it fall on my head. It slips off me as if I were covered in oil. I lather up. Soap. 15 carbons, 31 hydrogens, and good old carbon dioxide with some sodium. Long molecules designed to suck up dirt, sweat, and humiliation. Rinse, lather, rinse, lather, rinse until the soap melts down to a waxy crescent that jumps out of my hand. I know I should think about MIT. Be logical. Be practical. But I can't get my brain started. It needs jumper cables. Given my mood, I'd hook them up the wrong way. Little mistake, big consequences. Boom. There goes the brain, the engine, and the college application. Boom. A mistake. 
What if they made a mistake? It happens, even at the best schools. A clerical error, or the computer messed up. A mistake. It happens. Two kids with the same name apply. One is accepted, the other gets the boot, but the letters are switched. The wrong Kate Malone got into MIT. It was all a mistake. Wait until I tell them. I can see the future play out like a movie on the shower curtain. I'll drive to MIT and talk to the admissions officer. When she hears about my rejection, she'll freak and say, You poor thing, of course we want you. She'll fire her assistant and type up my acceptance letter with her own fingers. She'll hand me the fat envelope loaded with goodies. Maybe I'll get more financial aid or a choice dorm room. I'm so excited I soap up my left leg and grab the razor. This is going to work. Toby pounds on the bathroom door and yells something I can't hear. I shave my kneecap and ignore him. He can pee downstairs. Details, details. MIT is approximately 301 miles to the east, a six-hour drive. I'll have to leave before dawn. What should I bring? Copies of my transcript and two scientific papers, for sure. Maybe I should leave my essay home. That was definitely weak. I loathe essays. No, I'll bring it. It'll prove I know my strengths and my weaknesses. I'll even admit that I need to improve my writing skills. My molecular models? I pull the razor along my calf, leaving a smooth runway of skin in its wake. I rinse off the blade. Nah, don't bring the molecules. That would look desperate. I lather my foot and shave my hairy toes. I don't want to look like a hobbit. Toby pounds on the door and hollers again. It doesn't sound like he's speaking English. Go away, I yell. I rinse off the razor and twist around to shave the back of my ankle. Toby beats on the door just as the blade slides over my Achilles tendon. I flinch and the razor nicks me. It takes a second for the blood to flow. I'm not opening it. Silence. Good. I work on my right leg and concentrate on the plan. There are a few kinks to work out. Bert won't survive the drive. He can barely make it to the grocery store. I'll need to borrow a car and find some cash and get an appointment, but it's going to work. I'll make it work. I shave my right leg without a single nick or cut. That's truly a sign from God. I turn off the water and reach for a towel. My hair is clean, my legs are sleek, and I don't have hobbit toes. MIT will let me in. I'm ready for the world. Toby is waiting when I open the door. He barges in and yanks on the bathroom blinds. What are you doing? I ask. Look. He wipes the steam off the window with his sleeve and points to the red-orange glow down the hill. Oh. My. God. That's what I was trying to tell you, butthead. The lich's barn is on fire, a roaring furnace. The trees in the side of the yard are blazing torches. Rogue flames lick the roof of the house. Three fire trucks are on the scene, cherry lights pulsing beneath the smoke, firefighters wrestling thick hoses in the shadows. Are they okay? I whisper. The wind kicks up and the fire blooms. The liches? Yeah, they're downstairs. 3.7. Effective Collision I sit down hard on the toilet seat, clutching the towel around me. The liches are here? Not the mom, just Terry and her little brother. There's a quiet knock on the door. May I come in? Dad enters before I can answer. His eyes are bright, fueled by alarm bells and emergency flashers. His sweater reeks of smoke. We need to talk. He closes the door behind him and locks it. Can it wait until I'm wearing clothes? I ask. This'll just take a second. Terry and Mikey are sleeping here tonight. Terry can bunk with Kate. Mikey will stay with you, Toby. No, 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 no. He didn't really just say that. No way. I must have steam in my ears, or I banged my head when I passed out. That would explain the nausea, too. Maybe I have a concussion. Aw, oh, Dad, Toby whines. Dad raises the lecture finger. No complaining. They are our neighbors and they are in need. Terry Litch is in my house. In my bedroom. She'll murder me in my sleep with an axe. I'm gonna hurl. I scoot off the toilet seat onto the floor and raise the seat. Why can't he sleep in your room? Toby says. You're younger. He'll be more comfortable with you. Dad says. Besides, I've got to get back to the fire. Please let me hurl. Please, please.
please, please. Are you sick, honey? No such luck. I'm just a wet girl in a towel inspecting the rim of the toilet, and it's disgusting. What about their mom? Toby asks. Shouldn't they be with her? The doctor says she needs some quiet. A lot of quiet. She's going to stay at Betty's house until we get things sorted out. Somebody better warn her about Jesus living in Betty's television, I say. Can't they go to the Red Cross? Kate, that's absurd. We have plenty of room. How long do they have to stay? Toby asks. A week, maybe? I choke, cough, and lean over the toilet again. We'll know more in the morning. Are you sure you're okay? Dad asks. I'm not staying here if she's gonna barf, Toby says. The snap of the door closing behind him echoes off the tile in porcelain. I sigh, close the toilet lid, and get back to my feet, adjusting the towel for some dignity. My father leans against the sink, watching me closely. Emotion won't help here. I sit on the toilet and cross my legs. Okay, Dad, let's face facts. There are a number of reasons why this won't work. One, Terry Litch is a psychopath. Remember how she used to beat me up? I know you two aren't exactly friends. Two, this house isn't ready for a toddler. Who's going to take care of Mikey during the day? Three, Terry is a thief. She stole my watch, remember? Mom's old watch that I have worn forever? Four, four, he interrupts. You've had a terrible day. I know I'm asking a lot, and I promise we'll make time, just you and me, to sit down this weekend and go over all the material. So when you go to school on Monday, you can tell people which college you chose. It won't be MIT, but trust me, no one will care. The nausea is back. Toby knocks on the door. Dad, he says, some ladies are here with casseroles and diapers. The family room smells like smoke and sounds like a stadium. Terry Litch is sprawled across the couch, remote in one hand, a can of soda in the other, watching baseball. Sophia's curled up next to her, close but not touching. She doesn't even look at me. Mr. Spock thumps his tail once and lifts his head, his eyebrows raised high. He'd love to come and slobber on me, but he's busy being a pillow for Terry's little brother, who is resting his head on the dog's stomach. Mikey is pale, with smudges of soot on his cheeks. His eyes are puffy from crying and he's sucking his thumb. His other hand is holding a green metal motorcycle. The dog drops his head back to the ground with a sigh. Mikey looks up at me with a watery smile. His upper lip quivers around his thumb as he tries not to cry. He needs to blow his nose. I'm such a pig. Good Kate shoves bad Kate out of the way. There are boxes of donated clothes over in the church. It'll be easy to find something for the liches to wear. They need to shower and have some hot chocolate. That would be just the thing. I bet Toby's old teddy bear's in the attic somewhere. Mikey might like that. Poor little guy. And I won't confront Terry about the watch. Not tonight, and probably not even tomorrow. Bad Kate gets up and dusts herself off. She notices that a crisis is in our backyard and will do a good job of distracting Dad while I sort out the MIT mess up. She walks off into the night, whistling. Sorry about the fire, I say. Terry scratches Sophia's head. The cat doesn't care. She's focused on the game. The Yankees are beating the Indians, 6-3. to three. We have some clothes that'll fit Mikey, I continue. I'll find some stuff for you, too. Terry points the remote and turns up the volume. Terry gave Mikey a bath during the seventh inning stretch. He fell asleep on my bed while she showered and changed into some of Dad's old sweats. I suggest we move Mikey to the cot in Toby's room, but Terry refused. Can't say I blame her. The dog won't sleep there either. It wasn't part of my plan to be the schmuck that wound up in the cot, but there you go. Terry and Mikey took my bed, as if worrying about MIT weren't enough to keep me awake. I have a lawnmower roaring in the middle of the room. The lawnmower is Mikey Litch breathing through his mouth, producing a decibel per pound output that is off the charts. I should sample that noise and sell it to struggling musicians. It'd make a fortune. I roll over and pull my knees up to my chest. My legs are tight, my arms are achy, and I can't get warm. I bet I'm getting the flu. Maybe I'll be lucky and it will be a rare strain from Mongolian hamsters and I'll die. No, I'm not that lucky. 
If I got Mongolian hamster flu, I'd probably end up with permanent blue spots and a tail or something. I roll over. Everything smells like smoke. How can Terry stand it? This could explain her anger management problem. I've got to do something or I'll never get to sleep. Maybe I can roll him on his side. I sit up. Terry's shape lies along the edge of the mattress. Her face is blocked by my clock radio. Is she asleep? I sit up higher. She's awake, watching the minutes on the face of the clock dissolve into each other. The cot creaks under me. Terry's eyes swivel and pin me to the wall. 4.0. Oxidizing Agent. Safety tip. Substitute plastic labware for glassware whenever possible. My first thought upon waking, maybe it was a nightmare. Second thought upon waking, what in God's name is that awful smell? Third thought, the nightmare continues. I wrestle my way out of the sleeping bag, fumble for my glasses, and stand up. Mikey Lich's diaper has exploded all over my bed. <sighs> Believe me, I don't freak out about a little baby poop. I have a brother. Poop, puke, whatever. I can cope. But this isn't normal. It looks like a dinosaur took a dump. Mikey's eyes flutter and open. He turns his head to stare at me. Where mommy? Don't move. I, uh... I'll get help. Don't move, Mikey. Sit. Stay. Twuck, Mikey says, reaching for the toy on the pillow next to him. Dad, I bellow. Dad. Mr. Spot gallops up the stairs, streaks into the room, and freezes, his nose high in the air. He takes a sniff, whimpers, and scurries out, tail between his legs. Toby takes to the stairs two at a time. What's wrong? I point to the bed. Mikey's running the dump truck, oh, the irony, over the hills and valleys of my ruined comforter, buzzing his lips to make a spluttering engine noise. Dude, Toby says. He backs away from the door and coughs. That's a lot of... <laughs> Please don't say it. Where's Terry? Watching cartoons. Mikey crawls to the edge of the bed. Oh, no, you don't. I run in and shoo him to the middle of the mattress like a baby herder. I have to go to work. I tell my brother, do something. No way, I'm not touching him, that's sick. Get Terry, Toby nods. Good idea. He turns his head and yells, Terry! I could have done that. Yeah, but you didn't. Terry lumbers up the steps chewing something. Her sweatpants are covered with cat fur. She catches a whiff and shakes her head. Oh, jeez, she says to no one in particular. He did it again. She tucks Mikey under her arm like a football and carries him downstairs to the kitchen. As she passes me, I notice a thin gold chain disappearing under the collar of her shirt. I know that chain. There's a gold heart attached to it. It was a Christmas present from Mitch. Toby and I open all the windows in my room, then follow them. What if she puts them on the couch? He whispers. Who cares? See that necklace she's wearing? It's mine. She stole it. For real? For real. He picks up and shakes the box of life cereal that Terry left on the couch. It's empty. What are you going to do? I'm thinking. Good idea. Mikey stands naked and shivering in the kitchen sink, his thumb in his mouth. Terry pulls the spray nozzle out of the faucet and tests the water temperature on the inside of her right wrist before hosing off the first layer of crud and lathering him up with dishwashing detergent. Did you get any sleep? I ask. Terry slides her hands across Mikey's shoulders and back. Her palms are calloused, and the thumbnail of her left hand is black. Not much, she says. I open the cupboard and get out Toby's medicine and vitamins. He sure can snore, can't he? He's been sick. His nose is stuffed. Bubbles cover Mikey's skinny body like translucent polar bear fur. As he bounces up and down, some of them drift off and hang in the sunlight. One of them lands on the purple bruise under Terry's eye. Mikey pops it and giggles. Terry winces, that must have hurt, then rinses him off. I pour two glasses of orange juice and set one in front of my brother sitting at the kitchen table. Do you want some juice? I ask Terry as I stick a piece of bread in the toaster. I hate juice, she says. What about Mikey? He only drinks grape juice. Sorry, we don't have any. Figures. I keep my lips pressed together until my toast springs up. What does he like to eat for breakfast? Cereal. 
Eh, that's all gone, Toby points out. I spread a thin layer of butter on my toast. How about eggs? He hates eggs. Toast? Terry pulls 50 paper towels off the roll. We only eat cereal for breakfast, or oatmeal if it's cold outside. She glares at me, daring me to criticize oatmeal. You need to go to the grocery store. Dad'll go. I look down at my wrist. No watch, duh. Check the kitchen clock. Shoot, I have to hurry. Um, Kate? Toby's voice cracks a little. So what, we're supposed to starve? Terry asks. I open the refrigerator. Milk, bread, stuff for salad, leftover meatloaf, bologna, cottage cheese, apples and oranges. There's plenty to eat. Terry dries off the soles of Mikey's feet. I knew it. I told your father you didn't want us here. Deep breathe, Malone. Count to ten. I'm going upstairs to get dressed, and then I'm going to work. Have a nice day, Terry. Kate, listen, Toby starts. What? You don't have to go to work. I pause in the doorway and turn around. Yes, I do. I'm scheduled all day. Then I'm getting my contacts. It's on the calendar. Well, um... Dad called your boss before you woke up, he says. He said you couldn't go in, that we had an emergency and you had to help at home. What emergency? Terry smiles as Mikey leaps into her arms. Me, she says. 4.1. Unstable Compound I know the Bible says it's wrong to kill your dad, but the Bible says a lot of things we ignore these days. I head out the back door in my pajamas and slippers and stalk around the cemetery. I'm vibrating at such a high frequency that dogs are howling and buffalo. I can't believe he did this. He's going to get me fired. And for what? So I can babysit a burned-out kleptomaniac whose brother has intestinal issues? I don't think so. The lich place is crawling with people. Police, firefighters, construction workers, and half a dozen gawkers clustered in the side yard. The barn is a charred skeleton of timbers and half a wall. The house looks all right, though. It has some holes in the roof, but they're already covered with blue tarp. The back porch and half the kitchen are burned away, but the rest is still standing. Good, she can move out this afternoon. Dad is leaning against the dumpster in the driveway, surrounded by guys in hard hats. He's dressed for action. Heavy-duty jeans, ancient boots, thick work gloves, and buzzing on adrenaline. Reverend Malone is most alive when someone is dead, dying, or in trouble. This is item number 1342 on the list of things I don't understand about my father. The wind picks up as I walk down the hill. The barn timbers shudder. Ghostly whirlwinds of ash rise and writhe over the ground, and people turn their faces away so they don't breathe it in. I plant myself in front of my father. Are you trying to get me fired? Dad blinks. Gentlemen, this is my daughter Kate. The hard hats make polite noises. You had no right to call my boss like that. He won't look me in the eye. We'll talk about it later. How are our guests? Hungry? When are they leaving? Um, Pete? Dad nods to one of the men. Pete pushes up his hard hat with the back of his hand. Well, the inspector is still poking around. The roof needs patching, and the kitchen here, that's got to come down and be rebuilt. We got lots of water damage and smoke, but the foundation's in great shape. Can they move back in today, after you clean it up? I ask. The men shake their heads slowly. A week? Well, like I said, the inspector makes the decisions, plus your father. He has an idea about rebuilding everything. The wind gusts, blowing my pajama pants against my legs and making the bones of the barn creak. Bad, bad, bad. It's bad when Dad has ideas. There was a year when he decided Christmas wasn't about gift-giving and almost started a riot in the mall. Dad smacks his hands together and grins. The doctors told me that Mrs. Litch needs some rest. The scare last night didn't do her heart any good. I had a nice chat with her early this morning. I told her all about my idea and she loved it. Gave me full permission. Then there was the year that he told the newspapers that Easter was for fasting, not for eating chocolate. Our house got egged for that one. What's the idea? I ask. I told Mrs. Litch about the Amish. The image of Terry Litch dressed as an Amish girl makes me dizzy. I grab my father's arm. Please, Dad. 
He pats my hand and grins wider. The Amish can build an entire barn in a day. We can do something like that if we just pull together. The church is going to provide volunteers and the money to fix up the lich house. It's faith in action, my friends. Faith in action. The guys in hard hats squirm as if they have an itch that they can't really reach. People would like my dad better if he weren't always bringing up the religion thing. I pull my hands away. Okay, okay, that's great. But how long does Terry have to stay with us? It depends on what we find inside, Pete says. Weeks. Months, maybe. Before I can scream or bash my head against the dumpster, one of the hard hats hollers towards the house. Hey, you can't go in there! Terry Litch is about to blow. With Mikey riding on her back, she strides onto the side porch and rips down the yellow caution tape strung across the door. Mikey giggles. The barn shivers. Two cops join her on the porch. Terry sets down Mikey and faces them with her fists clenched. Do something, Dad, I say. As my father sprints over to play peace negotiator, Terry lets fly with an astounding collection of profanity delivered at full volume. To paraphrase, Get out of my way, you adjective noun. This is my multiple adjective house, and none of you, plural noun, belong here. She points at the volunteers staring at her. More paraphrasing here. I want you to arrest these adverb, adverb, truly rude, garund, mothers. They're trespassing. Get them out. My father speaks to her in a low voice. I doubt he's cursing. I must admit that there's a part of me that would give anything to be able to swear like that in front of a group of strangers. Mikey toddles down the porch steps. Terry interrupts my father to scream at me. Damn it, Kate, get him! Everyone in this soap opera trailer park nightmare turns to look at me. I stumble after Mikey. It was a bad idea to come down here in slippers. Scoop him up and sniff cautiously. He smells like dishwashing detergent. A pleasant surprise. He leans back in my arms and gives me the once-over. I'm Kate, I say. Can you say Kate? Twuck, Mikey says, showing me the dump truck in his hand. Kate! I point to myself. Twuck. He shoves the truck in my face. Close enough. Mikey and I sit down on the grass, far away from the remains of the barn. The way the wind is blowing, it's gonna come down soon. Dad must have achieved a detente. He follows Terry inside the house, accompanied by a police officer. Mikey runs his truck over the grass and my slipper. What the hell am I doing here, having an out-of-body experience? I should be shopping for a microwave for my dorm room, or talking to Sarah, or at the very least earning some cash so I can pay for my books and... No, no, don't eat that! I pull Mikey into my lap and clean the grass out of his mouth. Yucky. Uck. Uck. He repeats. Precisely. A category three uck. He scrunches up his face and wipes his tongue. How did you get so cute? Terry dressed him in overalls and a red flannel shirt that belonged to Toby when he was a rug rat. I need to distract him. Come here, I'll teach you something. I set him in front of me and pull his palms together. It's like patty cake, only better, it has chemistry. Uck. No, not uck. Give it a shot, you'll love it. I clap his hands in mine and sing. There's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and ramium. The boy is not so sure about this. The liches have neglected his education. No, 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 wait. It gets better. And nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium. Hey, what are you doing? Uck. Mikey pulls his hands away and stands up. Up. He stretches his arms over his head. I pick him up and settle him on my hip. He rests his head against my shoulder, thumb in his mouth. I sway back and forth. What does he think about all this? His mom is gone. His sister, well, I guess he's used to her. Maybe Mikey could stay with us for a while. He could go to the preschool at the church. Dad obviously likes him. He could stay with us while Mrs. Litch gets her life back together. Between the three of us, we could take care of him, just for a while. Terry comes out of the house carrying a black garbage bag and a basket of toys. Mikey scrambles out of my arms and runs to her. Dad follows with another bag. A teddy bear pokes out of the top of it. The cop refastens the yellow caution tape across the door. Terry puts the toy basket on the ground for Mikey. Is everything okay? I ask. 
Kind of. The wind grabs her hair and tangles it. Dad sets down his bag. I explain the situation. Mrs. Litch hadn't had the chance to tell Terry about this. I assume she had. My fault. Terry picks up the teddy bear, sniffs it, then holds it out to me. Can you smell the smoke on this? I sniff. Yeah. Damn. I check the tag sewn into the bear's foot. We can wash it at our house. I have a lot of laundry to do. Mikey finds what he was looking for in the basket. Twuck, he crows, waving his fire truck in the air. Woo, woo, woo. It's a pretty good siren imitation. We have to go grocery shopping too, Terry reminds me. The police have started to push people away from the barn. It's ready to topple. Dad watches the crowd move backward and sighs. If you want to go to work, Kate, that should be fine, he says. We don't need you here. It'll be all right. I nod. Mikey drives his fire truck all over my slipper. The wind runs over the new grass. They've already called someone in to take my shift, I say. No, really, Dad says. The volunteers will be here soon. One of them can take Terry on her errands. You've got a lot to do. Plus, we have to talk about the college thing. We could do that at lunch. I crouch down to gather the metal cars and trucks. Don't worry about it. I can take her. Mikey, too, if we can find a car seat. Terry raises an eyebrow. You're driving me around? Not in those pajamas, you're not. The wind gusts hard and the crowd watching it steps farther back. The barn shakes once, then collapses. The timbers scatter on the ground like pickup sticks. 4.2. Neutralization. Before we leave, I refill Bert's radiator and give him a friendly pat. Don't let me down, buddy. We don't want to be stranded with these passengers. The engine starts the first time. It's quite a miracle. Terry rolls down her window and fiddles with the radio as I wind my way to the main road. She taps the bumper sticker on my dashboard. So, this MIT, it's like a big deal, huh? A brainiac school? she asks. I nod once, eyes ahead. It's the best. The very best. Mikey throws a truck at the back of my seat. Terry chuckles. You think I never heard of MIT? Duh. I'm not retarded, you know. Let's not talk about MIT right now, okay? She sits back. Your dad said they blew you off. He didn't want me to think you were being a bitch because he didn't want me or anything. My father's a very sensitive man. Here, this is Betty's house. Terry and Mikey spend half an hour closed in the bedroom where Mrs. Litch is recuperating. Betty serves me tea and orange bunt cake and gives me the 411 about Mrs. Litch's conditions. She has a number of them, apparently. At least Betty doesn't bug me about college. A door slams. Terry strides through the kitchen without a word, dragging Mikey behind her. I guess that's her way of saying we can leave now. Mikey is already buckled into his car seat by the time I get outside. Hurry up, Terry says. I start the car, buckle my belt, and reverse. How's your mother? She flips the door lock up, down, up, down. Coughing a little, whining a lot. Is she excited about the house getting fixed? Up, down, up, down, up, down. All right, don't answer me. I look in the rearview mirror. Mikey is watching the traffic, his thumb in his mouth. Up, down, up, down. Knock it off, I say. This car's a collector's item. Up, down. I try again. Is she still upset about the fire? Does she want you and Mikey to stay with her? Okay, listen up, Katie. My mom got hit in the head with a bat once. My dad was holding that bat. My mom gets confused. She doesn't understand what's going on with the house. Hell, she thinks old Betty there is a cousin. I don't want to talk about her anymore. Up, down, up, down, up, down. I'm sorry, I say. Up, down. I gotta get paid. Take a left. Getting paid means a visit to the moon, a biker bar on the lake. The owner pays Terry in cash, and I don't have the guts to ask what kind of work she does for him. I'm just the driver. It's a lot of money, though. What do you think after you get paid? You might think you would go to the bank, but not if you were Terry Litch. We go to the Burger Barf, where Terry and Mikey get jumbo-sized orders of french fries, soda, and cheeseburgers. Then I drive to the car wash so I can clean the jumbo soda Mikey spilled in the back. 
Then we go to Burger Bar for more fries. I drive them to the mall and stay in the car watching Bert's temperature gauge. When they come out, Terry's holding a plain white bag. Mikey is holding a strawberry ice cream cone. The cone is upside down on the seat before we even leave the parking lot. She should never have gotten him a double scoop, poor little guy. We revisit the car wash. When the seat is clean, I take a detour by the pharmacy so I can apologize, grovel, and beg to keep my job. After that, my afternoon on chauffeur duty crawls by at 25 miles an hour. Terry pays her family's water bill and electricity bill with cash. She spends forever in the social services office arguing about a check Mikey's supposed to be getting. After that, she's on a rampage. She starts running up a monologue, mocking my car, complaining about my driving, and bitching about the fire. Mikey throws cold french fries at my head, then falls asleep. I turn off the radio and Terry goes silent, watching the stores in the streets slip by. I have to pick up my contacts now, I say. No response. I check the mirror, get into the left lane, and turn when the green arrow flashes. You can stay in the car if you want. It shouldn't take long. She turns around to check on Mikey. He's out cold. He'll sleep. I drive down the boulevard a few more blocks, then pull into the shopping center. I park in front of the Occubrite. You know how to use a hammer? Terry asks as I open my door. What? I drop my keys in my purse. Can you hammer things? Nails? Or are you a total spaz? She snorts and turns to the window again. Forget it. Go on. You're a spaz. Should have known. No. Open the eyelid wider. Wider. That's it. Nice and big. Right. Now keep the contact on the tip of your finger. Ease it onto your eyeball and... No, no. You have very dry eyes, don't you? Let's try some artificial tears. Occubrite's official contact trainer is dressed like a medical person. White coat with big pockets, serious glasses, pager at her belt. It's all bogus, though. She used to be a grocery store cashier. I can't figure out if teaching people to poke themselves in the eye at Occubrite is a step up or a step down on the job scale. One more time, the trainer says. Deep breath. I take a deep breath and study my eyeball. In the magnifying mirror, it's as big as a grapefruit, with bright red capillaries snaking their way from the pupil. I have Medusa eyes, and they are battling the contacts. As I peel back my eyelid, the bell on the front door jingles. Terry and Mikey toddle in. Can I help you? The contact trainer asks. I doubt that, Terry says. She sits next to me and looks in the magnifying mirror. Dang, look at your nostrils. You've got a zit ready to pop out, right there on your chin. I push the mirror away. Why didn't you stay in the car? I ask. Mikey's awake. Mikey shoves a pile of magazines on the floor before running to the far end of the store. Hurry up, Terry tells me. Like she's in any kind of position to be ordering me around. Like she already hasn't messed up my day enough. Plus my night, when you figure I got about three hours of sleep. Let's try this one more time, the trainer says. Terry sits in a waiting room chair and Mikey jumps into her lap. She reads him a copy of This Old House magazine. The little guy settles in and listens to the benefits of proper insulation. He's clutching a pair of demo frames in his fist. Pop! The contact snugs right up against my eyeball. It's in! It's in! Congratulations, drones the trainer. Follow me. At the counter, she rattles off a list of instructions and stuffs a paper bag with freebie contact junk. Then she hands me the bill. I take out my wallet and remove the faded twenties. She takes my money. It's that simple. I pay. I can see. Next customer. I walk out of the store and clutch a concrete post. The light is blinding, screaming off the windshields and metal cars, amplified by the white stucco of the walls of the shopping center. Water gushes from my eyes. Not tears, just water. Eye water. After a couple of minutes, the water levels go down, and I can open my eyes a little. If I black out the sun with my hand, it's not so bad. Holy crap, I can see everything. The numbers on the license plates, the small print on the signs in the music store window, the price of gas at the Sunoco. Yikes, when did that go up? I can see the street signs, I can see cardinals flying, I can see the cardinal's beak, the twig in the cardinal's beak, and the flash in the cardinal's eye. 
I have magic eyes. The bell jingles again, and Terry and Mikey strut out of the Occubrae. Mikey is wearing the stolen frames, and Terry's carrying the issue of this old house. I can see the ice cream stain on his shirt and the scar under her chin. I follow them to the car, squinting from the intense light, captivated by the exquisite details of our little strip mall. The dust caught in the petal of a buttercup is growing in a crack in the sidewalk. The weary faces of teenagers working at the video game store. A woman walks by carrying a briefcase. Her nails are bitten and torn. I can see them. A family bounces out of the sports equipment store carrying a huge rubber raft. I can see the price tag. They pay way too much. 4.3 Free Radicals Just a few normal hours. That's all I wanted. I drove Terry and Mikey back to our house. I made hamburgers and mashed potatoes, and Toby made salad. At that point, I figured I was off the hook. Since I was avoiding my friends, I figured I could hide in a movie theater for a few hours. At the very least, I figured Terry was going to put Mikey to bed and watch television and then leave me alone. That, my friends, is what they call hubris. Dad asked me to get out my acceptance letters and course catalogs. Terry bitched about the lack of grape juice and oatmeal. It was a no-brainer. Off to the grocery store we go. As the super fresh doors glide open, I rip the shopping list in two and hand half of it to Terry. I'll meet you at the checkout counter, I say. And don't get any junk, okay? I don't have much cash. Terry shoves the list in her back pocket without looking at it, takes the shopping cart, and wheels away without a word. I head for the produce aisle, where my best friend in the whole universe, who I'm avoiding like the plague, is squeezing pomegranates. Shoot. She spots me before I can duck behind the display of grapes. Oh my god, Kate! Sarah drops the fruit and runs over to hug me. I've called you like ten million times. Your dad said you hadn't started any more fires or anything, but Kate, damn, how are you? She squeezes me again and pats me on the back. I'm so sorry. They should have let you in. They're morons. We should organize a boycott. MIT is already boycotting me, Sarah. Whatever. They suck. She steps back, her hands on my arms. Let me look at you. Oh my god, you got contacts. Keep it down. People are staring. She covers her mouth briefly. You look amazing. How are they? Except for the pain, I love them. I pull the bottle of eye lube out of my purse, tilt my head back, and squeeze a few drops into each eye. My eyes are a little dry. When I blink, the fake tears turn down my cheek, making a mess. Sarah digs out a tissue and hands it to me. Have you figured out which safety you're going to accept? Um, I actually have a plan B. I wipe my face clean. I'm going to appeal. I think maybe... Maybe they made a mistake. While I explain my plan to ambush MIT, Terry Litch wanders briefly into sight. Her cart contains three economy-sized jugs of grape juice, a huge box of oatmeal, two cases of soda, and countless bags of potato chips and pretzels. She carefully looks over the raspberries and boysenberries, the most expensive fruits in the store, and picks out two boxes of each. Sarah frowns. This might work. You need a different car, though, and you have to weasel your way into the admissions office. Yeah, I know. What does your dad think? He's been too busy to talk about it. I guess that's typical, huh? Tell you what, we can work on your plan instead of going to the movies. Since when are we going to the movies? I forgot to tell you. She grins and waggles her eyebrows. We're going to kidnap you. Me, Travis, and Mitch. That's why I'm here. Isn't kidnapping illegal? Not when you do it to save your best friend from certain despair. You wouldn't answer any of our calls or emails. We were afraid you were freaking out, like go on medication, get a shrink, seriously freaking out. We are going to force you to sit through a vampire movie and eat cheese fries. I hate cheese fries. Cheese fries are good for the soul, but that's besides the point. We don't need cheese fries therapy because you're here. You're talking to me. You're okay. Not so fast, I say. She zooms in close. Now what? Terry Litch is living in my bedroom. No way. Big way. Terry passes by at the end of the aisle again while I give Sarah the gory details. Sarah's eyes are huge. 
so she could be living with you until graduation? She could be living with me all summer. You seriously need cheese fries. Thank you, I think. Look, there's Travis. Travis bursts through the swinging doors carrying a box of apples. Only Travis Baird could make a super fresh uniform look cool. The skull and crossbones sticker on his name tag is an elegant touch. Babe, he says, setting the apples on the floor. Sweetie, Sarah glides towards him. They embrace and suck face in the French tradition. The ice under the pomegranates melt. I'm definitely buying them a carton of condoms for graduation. The doors swing open again and pops a short, middle-aged guy in an uncool, super-fresh uniform. He has gold stars on his name tag, Manager Ed, and is pushing a cart loaded with bleach. Travis peels himself off Sarah and whispers something in her ear. She saunters back to me, hot-eyed and hungry. He's going to meet me in the bakery, she says. All that sugar, I say, and frosting. He gets off in twenty minutes. We'll go to the diner and plan your road trip to MIT. I don't know, Sarah. I've got Terry with me in twenty minutes, and keep your eyes open for Mitch. He should be here soon. After she leaves, I wander the aisles and pick up a bag of Cheetos and some soap. I love Cheetos. I love the orange Cheetos dust under my fingernails. Since I'm indulging myself, I decide to buy a box of ice cream sandwiches, too. I'll wait until everyone goes to bed and eat them all by myself. Mitchell Pangborn tracks me down in frozen foods. Hey, he says. I saw your car in the parking lot. Hey. I look over him carefully, using my contact-enhanced laser vision. He's wearing a sweat-soaked t-shirt from Pangborn Landscaping, filthy jeans, and boots. His arms are scratched, his face a little sunburned. God, he's hot. I thought Sarah said we were going to take you to the movies. I ruined the plans. Is this how you dress for a kidnapping? He looks down and brushes the mulch from the front of his t-shirt. Dad made me work until it got dark. Then I had to unload the trucks. I came straight here. I've been worried about you, Malone. You're really worried. An old man says, Excuse me, and reaches in front of Mitch to open a freezer door. We stand quietly as he stares at a selection of hearty man meals. He chooses hearty beef stew, closes the door, and shuffles away. Ice crystals hang in the air. Mitch steps closer and puts his hands on the end of the cart. The metal conducts an electric current from his body to mine. Makes my fingertips tingle. I was worried, he says again. I don't want to talk to anyone. Not even me. There are many fine things about Mitchell Pangborn's body, but his hands are near the top of the list. My magic contacts let me examine every detail. The calluses, the mulch under the nails, the the tendons and veins, the soft part at the base of his thumb. I want to touch them, and I want them to touch me, to thaw me, bring me up to room temperature. Mitchell Pangborn's thumbs running down the length of my spine, his hands on my, what are you gonna do, Kate? I mean, really, all the bullshit aside, what are we gonna do? The tone of his voice snaps me out of the fantasy. I blink, appeal, I think they made a mistake. That's crap. No, it's not. I think the computer screwed up. He makes a face. It's crap and you know it. You didn't get in, babe. You have to deal with it. Red warning lights flash behind my contacts. That's a little harsh, don't you think? It's not harsh. It's reality. He takes his hands off the cart and lowers his voice. Deluding yourself won't help anything, Malone. Excuse me? You're in Harvard. You've known for months. You don't know what this feels like. He puts his hands on his hips. More mulch flakes to the floor. It's not that difficult to figure out. Lots of people didn't get into their top school. And you know I'm sorry that you didn't, but it's not the end of the world. Choose one of your safeties and send in your deposit. End of story. This is why we need to do more kissing and less talking. I push the cart back and forth a few inches. I wonder if Mikey likes ice cream sandwiches. Maybe I should get popsicles instead. Less mess. I'll come over tomorrow after lunch, he says. I'll help you choose. No. What? I don't need your help. Besides, I'll be busy tomorrow. The liches have moved in with us. Didn't you know that? Terry's little brother is so adorable. I have to get him some popsicles. I'll see you on Monday. As I swing the cart around him, he grabs it again. 
What the hell is going on? You aren't you. I can't move the cart. Are you high? Is it lack of sleep? You're scaring me, Kate. I take a deep breath, fortify my shields, and strengthen the force field. I'm busy and I'm tired, and I want you to let go of my cart. I'm going to talk to the admissions office department of MIT. If for some ungodly reason they really don't want me, then and only then will I look at other schools. Look at other schools? Pick one of the safeties. He won't release the cart. You did apply to other schools, right? You never did get around to showing me those essays. What do you think I am? Nuts? Of course I did. I yank the cart out of his hands and walk towards the front of the store. The wheels are out of alignment. The cart wants to veer right and crash into the shelves. Come back, Kate. I'll see you Monday, I say over my shoulder. Terry is nowhere to be seen. Neither is Sarah or Travis. I wrestle the cart into the express aisle and pay for my Cheetos and soap. I'll buy popsicles at 7-Eleven. I want out of here now. Someone in the parking lot leans on a horn. It doesn't blare. It bleats like a sick goat. That's Bert's horn. I look through the plate glass window. Terry has Bert parked, engine idling, right in front of the store. She's in the driver's seat. She waves her hand, motioning for me to join her. I run outside. What the hell are you doing? How'd you get this started? Terry leans over and opens the passenger door. Get in, she says. I think they called the cops on me. 4.4. 4. Activation Energy I jump in the car, slam the door, and grab the dashboard as Terry floors it. She squeals the tires as we leave the parking lot. The good news is, is that this car is barely capable of making the speed limit, much less breaking it, so we won't be pulled over for going too fast. The bad news? Terry is driving. We turn right, then left, then double back. We turn left again. She pulls a U-turn and burns rubber again. My stomach flips and I have a nasty flashback to the fifth grade when Dad took Toby and me to the Mad Hatter's teacups at Disney World and I upchucked cotton candy everywhere. You better slow down, I say. No, 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 just stop. Stop. The engine is going to overheat and I can't afford a new one. Terry pulls into the mall parking lot and cruises to a spot in the shadows behind the Sears. I wipe my palms on my pants. She chuckles and pulls a pack of cigarettes and a lighter from her shirt pocket. You think this is funny? I ask. Yep. She shakes out a cigarette and lights it. I thought you were going to shit your pants. Don't worry, no one's coming after us. I listen. No sirens. What do you mean? She inhales, and the glowing end of the cigarette reflects off her glasses. She blows the smoke to my side of the car. I wave the smoke away and roll down the window. Did they call the police or not? She shrugs. They might have. Might have? She shrugs again. I take off my seatbelt and check the back. It's empty. What happened to the food in your cart? She slips the lighter into the cellophane sleeve of the cigarette pack and puts it back in her pocket. I hid it in the bushes behind the loading dock. We can pick it up later. No, we can't. Why not? I don't steal food or cars. I didn't steal your car. You're sitting right here. How'd you get it started? I hotwired it. Piece of cake. You want me to teach you how? No, thanks. I think I'll use my keys. Terry takes another drag and sucks the smoke deep into her lungs. Suit yourself. Bert's engine ticks loudly as it cools. I stare through the windshield at the brick wall in front of us. So you were stealing, but you didn't get caught, but you pretended the cops were coming. Why? Terry blows a smoke ring that loops around the rearview mirror. That geek. You've been ducking his phone calls, right? I thought maybe he was dogging you. I was trying to help. Don't thank me or nothing. Thank you? I should thank you? Yeah, I think so. She pulls out the ashtray, but it's full of lavender papuri. She flicks the cigarette ash into her jeans and rubs it with the palm of her hand. Smoke hangs around her head like a dirty veil. It's so quiet I can hear the water leaking from the radiator. I clear my throat. All right, you were trying to be nice. Thank you, but I don't need your help. Suit yourself. She rubs more ashes on her jeans. I'm just having a hard time right now, I say. That's right. I forgot. No college for Katie. 
and I have no idea what it's like, right? That's not what I mean. Right. She takes a drag and blows smoke at the ceiling. I need you to smoke outside. I can't stand it. It's too cold. Don't be such a bitch. Me? A bitch? Yeah, you're a major bitch. I'm letting you sleep in my room, in my house. Your dad is making you do that. If it was up to you, I'd be on the street. I stare at the wall again. Terry rolls down her window and the trapped smoke escapes. Noise from the boulevard filters in with the cold air. Cars shifting gears, accelerating and braking. Let me ask you a question, she says. I grit my teeth. Go ahead. Your dad, is he for real, offering to help us out? What do you mean? I'm speaking English, right? He said the church will fix our house for free. What's in it for him? Makes him happy. Makes him look good. He won't go to court to get the house or nothing? I turn and look at her. No, he'd never try that. He just wants to do the right thing. It's his job. Hmm. Bert's temperature gauge has inched out of the danger zone. I'll give it another minute just to be safe. I study the pattern of the bricks in front of us. Somewhere in the warped recesses of my brain, an idea ignites. How much do you know about building houses? I ask. Lots. I took all the courses at the Votech. Worked construction last summer. Terry picks at the MIT sticker on the dash with her thumbnail. Why? I bet they'd listen to you if you told them what you wanted done. You could be in control. Or help, at least. I bet it would get done faster, too, if you were supervising things. Her nail slides under the corner of the sticker. Probably. Let's face it. Neither one of us is happy with the living arrangements right now. Got that right. Your house is a damn psycho ward, and that phone never stops ringing. So I'll convince Dad that you should be allowed to help rebuild your own house. The sooner it's done, the sooner we can go back to normal life. She smooths the corner of the sticker back in place. Suits me fine. Me too. I unbuckle my belt. We have a deal. Switch seats with me. I'm driving. 5.0. Alchemy. Safety tip. Open reagent packages only after reading and understanding the label. Church looks way different with my contacts in. For one thing, I can see what everyone's praying for. My father up there is praying for enough people to help out at the liches, and for the suppliers to cut him a 50% break on the materials. Betty, sitting at the organ, is praying that she remembered to turn off the iron at home. Toby, next to me, is praying for X-rated things that should get him struck by lightning. Mikey, sitting on the floor in front of Mrs. Litch, is playing, not praying. I fight to keep my eyes open. Mikey snored again last night, so I put on my sneakers and ran until I got lost. Then I kept running even more. It was like I had an extra lung or something. The farther I ran, the more energy I had. And then I came home and watched television until Mikey woke up. Construction noises echo off the hills and penetrates the stained glass windows. If I listen hard enough, I can hear the sound of the rotten parts of Terry's house being ripped up. Not all the volunteers go to our church, and some of them have been working since breakfast. Terry went down there with a flashlight before the sun rose. I pray to Zeus, to Hera, to Thor, Loki, Freya, Aphrodite, to Jesus, to Mohammed, to Moses, to Lord Vishnu, and Ganesha, and the turtle with the world on his back, and to the god place I lost in me when I wasn't looking. Let me in. Let me into MIT. You all know I belong there. I need to be there. It's all I've ever wanted. It's what I've worked for my entire life. Let me in and I'll be nice to Terry. Honestly. Truly nice. I'll live up to every standard of charity and kindness. I'll help her with her house, her brother, her mom, her hair. I'll find her a date. And a job. I know you're testing me. I'm good at tests. After I murmur, Amen, it occurs to me that I don't pray. Too late. The congregation stands to sing. Toby is glued to the Game Boy hidden in his hymnal. When we sit back down, Mikey crawls into my lap. Two minutes into Dad's sermon, the kid is sound asleep, not even snoring. I smooth his hair and press his head against my shoulder. I wish my contacts could see into his head and see the world through his eyes. What would he think of MIT? 
of college. All he cares about are trucks and cartoons and cereal. And Terry, he worships her. Dad's sermons wanders through the Old Testament, skims across the New Testament, and touches down by Walden Pond, and borrows the wisdom of Woody Guthrie and Nelson Mandela to make his point about helping neighbors and building community. If I were feeling cynical, I'd point out that he's guilting the congregation into helping the liches, but he's so happy, so earnestly, ministrally, dadly happy. This is what he was put on earth to do, to remind people how to be nice to one another. Mikey stirs, turns his face, the cheek that was lying against me is damp with sweat. I blow gently on his skin to cool it down. I wish there were someone big enough to hold me in their lap so that I could nap. No, a coma. I wish I could slip into a coma for a few months. Now that would feel good. I just need a way to get through this week. I have to find a way to get some sleep and deal with MIT, put up with all the withering, pitying, gloating looks from my classmates, evade the well-meaning support of teachers, not to piss off Terry, figure out why Mitch is beginning to bug me, and stop running. I think I can do it. Please, gods. 6.0 Electrostatic Forces Safety Tip Use Gloves When Handling Steel Wool By Monday morning, Operation Amish Rebuild is in full swing. Terry blows off school so she can work with Pete and his construction crew. My job is to drive Mikey to preschool, the one at Merriweather High. It feels weird looking in the rearview mirror and seeing him wave at me. I sing the Elements song 50 million times. He says, Twuck. Cerberus, the security guard, stops us at the door to the school. I have my ID card out and ready. Do you want to see his too? I ask. Her upper lip twitches. Why do you have Terry Lich's little brother with you? He's an extra credit project. Don't get an attitude with me, missy. I consider biting off her head, but it would set a bad example, so I do the boring thing and explain about Terry, the house, and the fire, yada yada. She waves us through. Once we're going through the lobby, I swear under my breath. Mikey repeats what I say as loud as humanly possible. I heard that, bellows the security guard. We definitely need to work on your vocab, pal, I tell him. As we walk past the student body sculpture, Mikey growls like a bear, then bursts out laughing. After I drop off Mikey, I have to face my failure and humiliation. Chem class is torture. People keep looking at me with pity and Diana won't let me touch the Bunsen burner. The guidance office is still jammed with bodies. Mitch isn't in the cafeteria second period and that's just fine with me. I don't want to finish the conversation he started in the grocery store. Sarah makes me eat a jelly donut and then forces me to write up a list of options. She wants me to free my imagination. Be bold. Here's what I come up with. Quantum futures. Get MIT to admit they made a mistake and roll. 2. Sue MIT to get them to admit they made a mistake and roll. 3. Steal identity from someone who is mistakenly let in. No, I can't do that. 4. Still like option number one. Five. Okay, Sarah, how's this? Apply to Stanford. Six. Drive to MIT and force them to admit they made a mistake. Enroll. I don't say anything to Mitch in English. Things feel wicked out of sync with him. I gut out the stares and gleeful whispers that follow me all day. Everybody loves a loser. Coach Reed won't let me practice because of the treadmill incident on Friday. I try to explain, but he orders me to take three days off. It's a conspiracy, I swear. One day over. Phew. 6.1. Atomic Structure After school, I take Mikey to see the progress on his house. Terry meets us on the side porch, wearing dirty work clothes, a leather tool belt, and a hint of a smile. Was he good today? she asks. Mikey leans out of my arms and into hers. She settles him on her hip, above her belt. He was great, I say. He waved to every truck driver on the way to school and back. 
I step back so two burly guys can carry a charred mattress out the door. The house is filled with the sounds of saws, hammers, and high-powered fans. It still smells of bitter smoke. Can I have a tour? I ask. Suit yourself. Not much to see yet, but it'll get there. She steps inside and I follow. Curtains have been taken off the living room windows and all the furniture stacked in the middle. As we cross the room, the carpet squishes under our feet. The fire didn't get this far, but the water from the fire hoses did. Yeah, it's a mess, I know, Terry says. You've got to use your imagination. She taps bare wood at the far end of the room, where the carpet's been pulled back. We're going to sand this, coat it with good polyurethane. It'll look nice. Yeah, I like hardwood floors. She hikes Mikey higher on her hip, walks across the hall, opens a door. The windows in here are covered with blankets, and a table in the center of the room is piled high with boxes. This used to be the dining room, before Charlie's junk took it all over. I want to make it into a playroom. There's hardwood under that rug, too. We could use new baseboards and the crown molding, but there are luxuries at this point. Who's Charlie? Mikey pops his thumb in his mouth and sucks hard. He was our father, Terry says, closing the door. She's on the move again, down the hall to the back of the house. The kitchen is a wreck, but it was a wreck before the fire, so no loss there. I look over her shoulder. The work crew has already finished what the fire had started. The kitchen has been completely gutted, stripped down to the beams under the floor. Mikey's thumb slips out of his mouth at the sight. We're almost ready for a new subfloor, Terry says. That'll go fast. What I really want to do is frame out the wall so we can bust through an opening into the playroom. See? Have it be one big open area. We could work around the load-bearing beams. That's not a problem. I have no idea what you're talking about. That's why you're not in charge here. The problem is convincing Pete that it's worth the time to frame out the opening. He's a real moron. If you say so. She walks back down the hall. We're leaving the bathroom alone for now, though someday I'd like to do some tile work in there. Terry shifts Mikey to her other hip. Most of the first floor is cosmetic, except for the kitchen. Upstairs is going to take a little longer. Watch your step. We climb over the child's safety gate at the front of the stairs and head up. Mikey puts his arms around her neck. Halfway up the stairs, the banister stops. The higher we climb, the heavier the smell of smoke. The work crew crawling around on the roof sounds like they're about to fall through on top of us. I stick close to the wall. I thought the fire only affected the roof. It burned through in a couple of places, but there's a lot of water damage. Terry waits for me at the top of the stairs. We have some old Charlie damage, too. What's Charlie damage? Mikey squirms in his sister's arms, and Terry slides him around her body so that he's riding piggyback. Charlie rewired the house and ran an illegal tap off the power lines out front. Cheap SOB. The code officer freaked out when he saw it. He won't let us move back in until everything's up to code. Guess how long that'll take. Months? She chuckles. Nah, a couple of weeks tops. Don't be so gullible. Your dad found a guy who said he'd do it and only charge for parts. Come on, I'll show you Mikey's room. The doors along the dark hall are closed. One has three locks installed and a column above the doorknob, like a television version of a New York City apartment. Who do you have locked up in there? Terry reaches down and jingles her keyring. That's my room. And no, I'm not showing you. Here. She opens the room at the end of the hall. Mikey's bedroom is small, with tall dormer windows on three sides. One window looks straight up the hill to our house. The walls and ceiling are smoke-stained. Some furniture is stacked in a corner. A crib, chair, dented cardboard boxes of toys and clothes. Mikey squirms to get down and play, but Terry locks her arms under his legs. The electrical outlets have been pulled from the walls. Their wires writhe and coil. I know exactly what I want this to look like, she says. I want to put Wayne's coating on the bottom third of the wall and build a chalkboard so he'll have a place to draw. I want built-in shelves where he can keep his toys and books and stuff. And a big boy bed. If we run out of money, I could probably make one from scrap lumber. I'm sure someone will find him a bed, I say. When he gets older, we'll get him a desk. A computer, too. A key. 
Mikey says, still squirming to break free. No way, dude, Terry says. She spins in a tight circle. You're not getting down. She spins faster to distract him. Mikey giggles and throws his head back. Terry whirls like a centrifuge, her boots thudding on the floor until she stumbles a bit, slows down, and stops. Mikey rests his face between her shoulder blades, still giggling. So, Terry hikes up her tool belt. Feel like helping? she asks. I'd, um, love to, but I don't know how to do any of this. Let's see if you could learn how to hold a hammer. Of course I can hold a hammer. Any idiot can hold a hammer. It's the act of hammering, the physics of the process, that I'm struggling with. I've never been completely comfortable with the physics. No, 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 Terry says for the 83rd time. Like this. She holds a nail with her left hand. No, I will not comment on her black thumbnail. I will not, I will not, I will not. Takes a breath, and bam, bam, bam. The nail slides into wood like butter. She's doing the real thing, nailing the kitchen subflooring to whatever they're called, the longboards under the floor. She pulls a nail from her pouch on her tool belt, sets it, bam, bam, bam. Isn't there something called a nail gun, I ask? Wouldn't that be easier? This is a low-budget job, Terry says. We're powered by muscle and sweat, the old-fashioned way. Try again. I take a breath. Weight, velocity, and angle. Remember to hit the nail in the center of the head. Tap, tap, damn. The nail drops sadly to one side. I killed it, just like I killed all the other bent nails in my little test board. I don't know, Kate. Maybe you're not made for real work. You should stick to school. Got me some slack. I've never done this before. Bam, bam, thaw. Damn it. Terry pries the bent nail out of the wood and throws it to the ground. Kate Malone, you suck at hammering. I drop the hammer in the dirt. Is there something else I can do? Sawing, maybe? You'd be dangerous around a saw. Have you always been a spaz? I'm not answering that. I wait until everyone goes to sleep, then I put on my sneakers and head outside. The houses that line the streets are walls of a maze I'm trying to find my way out of. My breath feels as if it's coming from a different body. I'm afraid to open my mouth and talk to myself because there's a chance I might start to scream. It's like I've been chopped into tiny pieces of Kate, and all my pieces look like me and run like me and talk like me and act just the right way, but they're all lost in this maze. Bad Kate, still stalking me, says the maze has always been there. I'm just seeing it for the first time because of these contacts. Good Kate says nonsense. It's time to go to bed. 6.2. Experimentation Breakfast with the Lich siblings is loud. Mikey spills grape juice twice and Terry burns the oatmeal. She's pumped about her house, though. She keeps talking about Palladian windows. I've got to look up that word when she's not around. Dad tries to get parental about how she should be in school and work on the house on the weekends. I suggest that we talk to her Votex supervisor, see if Terry can get credit for what she's been doing. Dad scowls and Mikey spills his grape juice yet again. Mikey gets through the security at the school without causing a scene. He's not blown out a diaper in 48 hours. Progress. Mr. Kennedy, my guidance counselor, finally sees me fourth period on Tuesday. He tells me my options, the non-quantum ones. Basically, I'm screwed. My father can call MIT to make sure they rejected the right person, but there's no way they'll reconsider my application. He says if I really don't want to attend any of the schools that accepted me, let's hope it's not a sin to lie to your guidance counselor, I can apply to a school with rolling admissions and hope to transfer to MIT after a year. Or I can take a year off to get my act together. How sixties of them. I leave his office with a stack of brochures that I'll give to Mikey to destroy. When I get home, everyone is down at the liches. Terry and Pete are feuding about opening the wall between the kitchens and the playroom. Since she's busy, I put myself in charge of asset management. I am queen of lists, and I make Mikey my prince. He and I walk around the house, writing up highly technical documents like this. A lich list. Restoration requirements, part one. Three fans from the fire company. Eighty gallons of white paint. 
ten gallons of colored paint. Betty said Jesus told her the place needs accent colors. Paint brushes. Three gallons of window cleaner. Eighteen rolls of paper towels. Thirteen kitchen ladies armed with brooms and scrub brushes and Mr. Clean. Four mouse traps. Cheese. Assorted sledgehammers and crowbars. Work gloves for everyone. Kitchen cabinets. Roofing materials. Refrigerator. Stove. Sink. One gigantic dumpster. Industrial sander for big things. One hundred pieces of sandpaper for little things. Countless pieces of wood. Nails for said wood. And hammers for said nails for said wood. Mikey draws cows on the other side of the paper. They look like deflated balloons, but I know they're cows. I corner Dad before dinner, when Terry's in the shower and Toby's teaching Mikey a video game. He flat out refuses to help me with the MIT appeal. He won't even consider asking the admissions office why they turned me down, because he thinks I'm being slightly deranged about the topic. As for driving to Cambridge to talk to the admissions officer face to face, well, his response makes it clear he's been spending way too much time around the Lich family. If Betty heard him use language like that, she'd tell Jesus for sure. 6.3. Hydrochloric. It's hard to keep the days straight because whoever's running my life has pointed the giant remote at me and pushed pause. Days just ooze by randomly, one after another. Breakfast, Shay Malone, provides our recommended daily requirement of chaos. Lost homework, dirty diapers, forgotten phone messages, crumpled construction estimates, tools on the counter, juice spilled in the refrigerator, broken toys, a tsunami of laundry, chewed crayons, abandoned books, and oatmeal. There is peace in my car, just me and Mikey and the miles to school. We practice singing the elemental song in the alphabet, and counting. That's also very important. This kid is a lot smarter than Terry realizes. He can say Kate and Spock and Atom. I spend my second period lunches at his preschool class. We build towers. Classwork and homework are produced by the Catatron, operating at a tolerable performance level. Everything is under control, with the possible exception of Mitchell, why won't you answer my calls, Pangborn. Sarah understands how busy I am with the Lich invasion. Travis understands. My father and brother get it. Even the dog is giving me some extra space. By the end of the week, I have a few things to add to the Quantum Futures list. 7. Become an Olympic runner. 8. Become a leading childcare expert. 9. Become a construction consultant. 10. Create a new career. Chaos manager. 11. Rehabilitate the title Domestic Goddess. 12. Make a movie about why MIT should let me in. Enroll. 13. Reapply to MIT. Pay someone to write my essays. Enroll. 14. Take a year off and chill. As if. The lines between my days and nights are blurring. The night is filled with the calls of owls and smell of daffodils, and I run for miles. 7.0. Nuclear Stability. Safety Tip. Develop an Accident Plan. I work at the pharmacy until 3 o'clock on Saturday. Then I change into cruddy clothes and hurry down the hill. Dad had more than 40 people volunteer to work today, and they had great weather. I can't wait to see how much they got done. 40 people plus good weather times motivation equals a miracle. Incredible. All that's left of the barn is a neatly raked rectangle bordered by foundation stones. The roof of the house is patched, the gutters have been fixed, and the shutters all taken down. Every window is open to catch the breeze. The kitchen has walls and a roof, a door, and a bay window that looks out over the pond. The air is filled with the sounds of hammers, saws, and some kind of buzzing noise I don't recognize. When it dies down, I can hear a radio playing and people laughing, shouting, and talking. The smell of smoke has been replaced by the smell of new lumber, varnish, and paint. Hopeful smells. I walk up to the porch and step inside. The living room is unrecognizable. Everything, absolutely every stick of furniture has been removed and the rug torn out. The hardwood floor glows. I move down the hall. The kitchen is busy with one guy installing a sink while his buddy sticks tiles in the place on the wall where the stove will go. 
A third guy is sweeping up sawdust. The appliances aren't in yet, but the cabinets are all hung. Amazing. Truly amazing. The playroom is where the buzzing noises were coming from. A woman with a mask over her mouth is pushing a giant sander over the floor. Two other women wait until she turns it off, then they follow and clean up behind her. The windows are still grimy, but the floor's looking pretty good. Cans of paint are stacked in the corner, along with floor cloths, brushes, and wooden paint stirrers. The sander is off again. I can hear all kinds of commotion upstairs, including Terry's voice telling someone that a blind man could see that thing isn't straight. If she doesn't lighten up with these guys, they're gonna quit. Terry and I need to have a chat about the concept of team play. I walk back down the hall, past the parlor where three guys are painting the walls a soft shade of pink. I step through the front door, new doorknob too, to the front yard, where the command post has been set up. Betty and Mrs. Litch are crocheting under the new shade of the maple tree. This is the first time I've seen Mrs. Litch since the fire. Mikey is playing with his trucks on the ground in front of them. I don't have the nerve to ask what they're crocheting. It's big and orange. It could be a car cover, maybe a fishing net. Mr. Lockhart is scraping paint off the shutters while Dad watches him intensely. Mr. Lockhart knows better than to let my father touch any tools. Dad's job is to look encouraging and to hum. He's very good at humming. He carries things, too. He's not a big guy, but he's sturdy, and whenever something heavy needs to be moved, they call for the reverend. Miss Cummings is pinning wet curtains to the clothesline strung from the maple tree to the front of the house. Toby is washing the windows. The kitchen ladies are scrubbing inside. The choir is scraping old paint off the shutters, too. Everyone has a job. Hammer, measure, saw, sweep, scrub, sand, paint, whatever. Boss around, play with trucks in the grass, crochet, gossip. Mikey is the first one to notice me. Moni Kate. Antimony to you, Mikey. What a kid. Betty looks up from her crocheting. There you are, dear. We were just talking about you. I force a smile. Of course you were. Um, is there anything I can do to help? You missed another spot, Toby says. I spray the window cleaner directly in his face. It's a shame we are separated by a pane of dirty glass. My brother is a tyrant. This is the seventh window we have washed together. For a slob, he is strangely concerned about how clean the glass is. It's taking fifteen minutes to do each one. If he keeps this up, he won't live to see number eight. No, no, you don't get it, Toby frowns. Right there. Rub harder. If I rub any harder, the glass is gonna break. Wuss. I rub so hard that paint chips flake off the frame and float to the ground. Better? A little. He moves down to the next window and sprays. It takes me longer. I have to climb down the ladder, move the ladder, check and make sure the ladder is properly positioned, ascend halfway, scoot back down, make a few more safety adjustments, then climb up the seven rungs to the top. Could you be any slower? asks my always supportive sibling. You missed a spot, I say. He coughs once and coats the glass with spray cleaner. It looks like a wave hit. I concentrate on my side. After a while, I don't notice Toby's face or his hands on the other side. We work in silence until the pain is so clear you can't see anything between us. Looks good, I say. Open up. He hits the frame, struggles, then slides the window open six inches. Last one on this floor, he says. We'll have to get the big ladder for the upstairs. My toes try to curl around the rung I'm standing on. It's getting too late. You have to wash the windows when the sun is still high so you can see the streaks. Whatever. We could do it tomorrow after church, I guess. He sits down on the floor so that his chin is even with the window sill. You like doing this? Yeah. It's kind of fun. Spooky, but fun. Spooky how? They carted out hundreds of beer bottles and a bunch of guns this morning. I heard Pete say some of the walls in the upstairs have holes in them. Don't you think that's spooky, living in a house that has holes in the walls? I use a paper towel to brush away the loose paint chips and dead flies from the windowsill. Yeah, but all that stuff was from Terry's dad and he's dead, so goodbye, scumbag. I guess. He spies a smudge on the glass, sprays it, and wipes carefully. But here's what I don't get. 
Why didn't they do any of this cleaning or repair work before? Dad said Mr. Litch died last year. He died in jail, I reminded him. Whatever. He was dead. He couldn't come back and put any more holes in the wall. So why didn't they fix it themselves? I peel off more flakes of paint with my fingernail. Little worms are chewing their way through the wood. No money, no time, no energy. Remind me to show this to Terry. I bet all the frames are rotting. They'll have to be replaced. Maybe that's another reason. Once you get started on something like this, it just gets bigger and bigger. He stops to cough. It's amazing he's lasted this long with all the sawdust, paint fumes, and mold spores floating around. You're done, Tobe. Time for some clean air. Out of there. Give me a break. Seriously, I shouldn't have let you stay in there for so long. You want me to use the nebulizer? Quit babying me. <coughs> I'm fine. <coughs> Pizza, someone calls from the front of the house. Yes, Toby bolts in the direction of the food, hacking all the way. I descend the ladder slowly, feeling with my toes to find the ground. 7.1 Synthesis. Mitchell A. Pangborn Saturn has become the pizza delivery van. He parks it and unloads the boxes from the trunk, handing them to Travis and Sarah, who carry them to the side porch. I think I want to say hi to him, but I have to wash my hands first. Miss Cummings and Mikey walk down the hill bearing leftover tuna casserole. Some volunteers use the arrival of dinner as their cue to head home, but a good dozen stay to chow down. Before the pizza is dished out, Dad asks all of us to hold hands and bow our heads for grace. Mikey drags Terry over to me so he can stand between us. When we take his hands, he pulls his feet up off the ground and swings back and forth, his eyes squeeze shut. Dad blesses the house, the food, the families, and the friends gathered around the pizza boxes. Then he grins and blesses the pepperoni, sausage, green peppers, onions, and extra cheese. Amen. Dig in. Terry carries a plate to her mother, sitting in the best folding chair on the porch. Then she sits down beside her to wolf down on a slice of pepperoni. Terry's face has gotten tanned this week, and I swear her biceps are even bigger. Mikey is wired. He climbs into Mrs. Litch's lap and eats a few bites of her pizza, then slides to the floor and rolls his toy fire truck around, scooting the length of the porch on his knees. When he gets to me, he drives the truck up my back and into my hair. I pretend to growl. He giggles and then crawls away. Travis takes his boombox out of Mitch's car and turns it on. My father listens to the mildly obscene hip-hop for a minute, then fiddles with the dial until he finds a jazz station. Mrs. Litch unexpectedly pipes up and tells us about going to a jazz festival in Central Park in New York City when she was 15. Before I met Charlie, of course. She says that when she squeezed her eyes, she could see the notes like colors splashing in front of her. It's hard to imagine Mrs. Litch was ever 15 years old. Mikey steals a few noodles from the casserole dish, stuffs them in his mouth, and runs inside. Is everything cleaned up up there? Terry asks. He's fine. All the tools are put away, Dad says. I close the paint cans myself. The place is as clean as a whistle. I stretch across Sarah's legs and take another slice of extra cheese and onion. The conversation drifts back to jazz, to paint colors, to the sunset. After a few minutes, Mikey comes back out, his hands covered in thick yellow paint. Aki, he says. Everybody breaks up in laughter. What? What was that? Miss Litch asks, squinting. What happened? Terry picks up her brother. Picasso is here decorating, Ma. I'll clean him up. As she washes him off in the downstairs bathroom, Mikey babbles about his big trucks in his big boy room. Big boy is the phrase of the day. Through the window, I can see Terry close and lock the door to the future playroom, where the paint cans are. She puts Mikey down to play with his trucks on the smooth living room floor and comes back out, sits next to me, and steals my pizza crust. I lean my head against the side of the house. We're done for the night. Everyone is beat, but they're happy and beat. The old people talk about jazz some more. Trumpets, saxophones, drums. Mitchell collects the dirty plates and napkins and puts them in a trash bag. Then he sits down on the other side of me. 
He showered just before he picked up the pizza. I can smell the soap on his neck. I'm too tired to move away. Almost too tired to be irritated by him anymore. I'm just going to pretend that he's a very good-smelling, incredibly warm stranger that's sitting next to me. A harmless stranger. The sun is setting. A few months ago, it would have been dark by now. Mr. Lockhart flicks a switch and the feeble porch lights come on. A moth bangs into the dirty glass. We should put that on the to-do list. Clean porch light. My dad tells a dumb joke and Mrs. Litch laughs. Mitchell chuckles. I am on the edge of dropping off. I could actually fall asleep here. Someone else tells a joke. People laugh even harder and I open my eyes. The porch light goes out suddenly. Fades away without even a flicker. Must have been an old bulb. The confused moth flutters away. Did you hear that? Terry asks. It's crickets, Teresa, Mrs. Litch says. Spring is here to stay. I think the power went out, Dad says. Terry twists around and looks through the open door to the living room. She stands and walks down the steps, peers at the side yard, and then jogs around the house. I stand up and look through the door. The living room is empty. Mr. Lockhart frowns. Power can't be out. He pulls a flashlight from his belt and turns it on. Of course, if something caused a short, or a mouse, or... Mikey's gone! Terry leaps up onto the porch and runs into the house. Mikey! Mikey! She thuds through the house like a giant, the floors shaking under the urgent weight of her boots. He's probably in front of the television, says Mrs. Litch. They packed the television away, dear, Betty says quietly. Mikey! The air crackles. I'll check the road, Sarah says. The pond, Mitch says. He jumps off the porch and sprints into the backyard. I follow Terry into the house. Mikey! 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 Bellows Terry. I meet her at the foot of the stairs. The safety gate has been ripped down. Terry bolts up the stairs, fear trailing her like thunder. Zero point zero point zero. Quantum shift. Mikey lies in his room, his big boy room. He lies on the bare floor. He lies on the bare floor, his fingertips stretched to the snakes in the electrical outlet, his red fire truck, the one with the metal ladder that moves up and down, is blackened. The wall around the electrical outlet is charred. As I watch, a wisp of smoke escapes out the open window. Time screeches to a halt, reeking of burnt rubber. Outside, someone turns down the radio, draining away Mrs. Litch's jazz. I can hear doors closing, the sound of someone running. Doesn't look like he's been near the pond, Travis tells my father. None of the weeds have been stepped on. He's not out there, says Mitch. They sound like men, grown men far away at the other end of a metal tube. Mikey Litch lies on the bare floor of his big boy room, his eyes open and empty. Children don't die. Not really. Not really. They don't die. They can't. They're wound up, charged with enough energy, enough juice, to carry them for seventy, seventy-five years. But a bottled bolt of lightning came from the electrical outlet and poured across the red fire truck. It crackled through Mikey's fingertips and stole him away, even though we were all watching him and the doors were locked and the gate was up. Terry screams, Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Time speeds up again. Terry sits on the floor, her legs stuck out in front of her like a broken doll, her dead Mikey in her arms. I am a shrieking ghost, seeing everything unseen. Daddy runs up the steps. Miss Cummings runs up the steps. The hard hats run up the steps. They peel Terry away from her Mikey, pry the baby from her hands. They lay him out on the hard floor, his arms thrown carelessly over his head like he wants to be picked up and swung around, spun until he's dizzy. Check his pulse, breathe into his mouth, pizza breath. Grape juice stained. Push on his chest. One, two, three. 
One, two, three. Need the bread back from the dead. Breathe. Breathe. Broken doll Terry lies forgotten in the corner. I float across the room and settle next to her. Her hands are frozen into the holy shape of Mikey's head and his chin. I touch her elbow. I pet her shoulder. Her body feels extremely empty. Neither of us are really here. We left when time stopped. Push on his chest. One, two, three. One, two, three. Need the bread back from the dead. Breathe. Breathe. My father and my teacher trade positions. You push, I'll breathe. Their hands are so big for the little body that their shoulders touch. A frantic dance. They read each other. Finger braille on the boy's dirty skin. He looks at her. She looks at him. I talk. Push on his chest. One, two, three. One, two, three. Need the bread back from the dead. Breathe. Breathe. Faces hover in the doorway. Sarah. Mitchell. Travis. Nameless adults. Pete performs crowd control. Sweeps them back down the stairs. Nothing you can do. Nothing to see here. Out of the way, we'll let you know. A fat pearl of sweat rolls down the side of my father's face, slips past the lines around his mouth, his Sunday night stubble, and falls, splash, onto Mikey's glass forehead. Red lights chase the shadows around the walls. An ambulance howls and skids into the driveway. My father's mouth moves and moves, but I can't hear him. The noise inside Terry is stopped. I hold on to her elbow tighter to keep her from floating out the window. The heroes run up the steps, thump, 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 snapping on filmy plastic gloves. The emergency rituals begin. They check Mikey's pupils and listen to Mikey's heart. It's not talking to us, not even a whisper. Scissors rip. His shirt is gone. The air so cold for a tiny chest. Count his ribs. One, two, three. Grease the paddles. Clear! Electricity rips through the little bones. The pint boxes of blood. The Mikey. Terry howls. Nothing. No line. No pulse. No spike. Clear! We can't catch him. Mikey's heart is gone. Shut down and cold. Terry rocks from side to side. A boulder teetering on the edge of a cliff. I hold her shoulders. Slippery desperate to keep her from crashing. She howls louder than an ambulance, louder than a thousand screaming cows, eyes rolled back in her head so she doesn't have to watch the worst of everything descend. They inject something in the soft skin inside of her elbow, the crook of her arm where she balanced her son's sweaty head. I understand now. She keeps telling me, he's my son, my son, my baby. My boy! Part 3. Gas. Organic substances exist as molecules with covalent bonds holding the individual atoms together. From ARCO, everything you need to score high on AP Chemistry, 3rd edition. 8.0. Photoelectrons. Safety tip. Some chemicals deserve special attention because of potential instability. The TV news crews arrive as Mikey's being carried out of the house. The lights from the cameras give me a sunburn. Terry is escorted to the back of the ambulance and helped up the step by two EMTs. They want her to lie down, but she refuses. She lifts Mikey's body from the second stretcher and just cradles him in her lap. The camera operators adjust their lenses for the close-up and I think I have to scream. Someone is grabbing my arms, but the light is so bright I can't tell who it is. Terry turns slightly and her hair falls forward, shielding her face and Mikey from the eyes and the lenses and the lights. The EMTs hop in the back and the ambulance driver closes the door. The cameras turn and follow the ambulance as it rolls down to the driveway, then pulls onto the road, red lights flashing. There is no siren. Are you okay? Mitch whispers in my ear. Do you want to go home? The camera operators cut the lights and the night jumps back into the photo-negative relief. Not yet, I say. 
My father and Miss Cummings help Mrs. Litch into the back of the godmobile. Miss Cummings buckles her seat belt over Mrs. Litch's lap. Dad gets in the driver's seat and backs down the driveway to follow the ambulance. Mrs. Litch stares dead ahead. The police take notes and photos, their flashes bouncing back and forth in time, measuring and recording until they finally put away their pencils. They murmur into their mics. The other volunteers, the hard hats, the adults, wander off stage like actors who have forgotten their lines. They head for their cars and they drive to their houses, where they'll check to make sure their own children are still breathing. Do you want to go home? Mitch asks me. Not yet. I say. We stay. My friends and Toby and me. We stay. Sarah unearths a handful of candles. We light every single one of them and stick them on the door for what was going to be the playroom, directly below the big boy room, because it's very dark in Terry Litch's house. We sit on the floor, between the candles and the wall, five monkeys in a line. Toby, me, Mitch, Sarah, and Travis. The light licks the yellow handprints Mikey left on the wall. God. Toby leans against me. I sag against Mitch. Sarah moves. Travis shifts. And the five of us dissolve into a pool. One heart beating. Toby is warm. I'm shivering. He clutches my waist. I press my cheek against Mitch's shoulder. Mitch grabs the back of my neck. In our shadows, Sarah's hair flows from Travis's head. His legs grow out of her body. Travis reaches out and drapes an arm across my brother's shaking shoulders. We take turns breathing. They cry and their tears roll on the wood floor. My eyes are dry, frozen behind my contacts. I crawl onto a candle flame until it becomes a whiteout, the color of hospital walls and bandages and wax bodies. It feels as if my contacts are peeling off. I close my eyes and rub them with my fists. The light explodes like a broken kaleidoscope with all the gritty bits draining away. I untangle myself from the circle and wrap my arms around my knees. It's our fault. We let him go, I say. We weren't watching. Mitch's head snaps up. Don't say that, Kate. Don't even think about it. She can't help what she thinks, Sarah says. Mitch stands up. It wasn't our fault. Don't feel guilty. Toby wipes his face on his shirt and slides closer to the line of candles. You know what the worst part was? He whispers. What, Tobe? I ask. The way his arms flopped when she picked him up, like he was made of rags. The candle flames blow another whiteout across my eyes. If anyone is at fault, it's that inspector. Mitch crosses his arms over his chest. He left the job site with a dangerous hazard out in the open. He could be arrested. At the very least, he should be fired. What? I ask. Sir frowns. Who cares? Somebody should care, Mitch says. This could be a massive lawsuit. I shiver again. I'm going to pretend you didn't say that. Nothing matters right now. Nothing. My brother leans forward and waves his fingers through a flame, testing at the speed at which he'll get burned. The heat crinkles the hair on the back of his hand. Mitch paces at the edge of the shadows. It does matter. It matters a lot. The kid died right here. Right here. Dude, settle down, Travis says. We know. It was an accident. Accidents don't happen, Mitch says. Someone is always responsible. Toby presses his thumb into the soft wax at the top of the candle. He flattens the rim and sculpts it into a rose. Molten wax runs down the back of his giant hands and hardens. The light reflects up against the angles of his face, catching in the fuzz above his top lip. I don't want to talk about this now, Sarah says. Mitch turns in the shadows. How can you not talk about it? I just want to be quiet. You can't be quiet, he's dead. Travis stands up. Chill, take it easy. Toby moves to the next candle. I pull myself to my feet and walk to the collection of paint cans in the corner. I pick one up, carry it back to the light, and pry off the lid. Yellow, the color of dried chrysanthemum petals. When Toby was tiny, he had a jar of yellow finger paint this exact same shade. 
I would cover the kitchen floor with sheets of blank paper, and we would just paint with our fingers and hands and elbows and knees and toes. I stick my right pointer finger in the paint. It's cold and yogurt thick. I dip my fingers in one by one and stir slowly, counterclockwise. I cut my hand in the yellow, then rinse it and let the paint roll down my arm. I dip it again, then stand up and fling my hand towards the wall like a magic wand. The paint flies, glistens, lands, a perfect sun splatter above the handprints that Mikey left. Toby looks up with a gasp. Sarah smiles. She takes off her rings and bracelets and braids her hair out of harm's way. Travis opens two more cans, red and blue. I plunge my left hand in, bring out dripping threads of rich blue sorrow. I throw a handful of blue at the wall. No, Mitchell, heartless Pangborn says. You can't throw paint at the walls. It's not your house. My contacts are working again. I can see his words hang in the air, then crash to the floor. He is standing so far away from the light that it's hard to make out the lines of his face. His hands are locked in the dark behind him. If you don't like it, you can leave, I say. He walks out without another word. When the door slams, the candlelight jumps. Toby dips his fingertip in the blue can and paints the figure of a tiny man on the wall. I throw more blue at the wall, leaving lines of color on the floor, on my sneakers and legs. Travis paints tiny monsters flying around the window frame. Sarah puts a yellow handprint by the light switch. Mitch's car starts up. He backs down the driveway slowly, then lays rubber on the road. I stand back and observe my masterpiece. I'm so not an artist. Does it matter? This wall, this house, it's all coming down. I bet they'll bulldoze it and sell the land. Sarah ties her t-shirt up under her bra and Travis paints a face on her belly. She draws a flower on his bald head. My brother finds a couple of Mikey's trucks in the living room. He dips an 18-wheeler into the surface of the red paint and runs the truck along the wall, leaving wet tire tracks. He hands me the moving truck. I dip it in blue. We work together until the candles burn out. Terry and my father return to our house a little after midnight. Mr. Spock and I are watching Star Trek reruns with Toby tucked under the quilt on the couch behind us. The front door opens and slams shut, and Terry shuffles past me without a word. On her left wrist, she's wearing a plastic hospital bracelet along with my watch. She heads up the stairs to my bedroom. I join Dad in the kitchen. He takes a beer out of the fridge and sucks it down while I wait at the kitchen table. When the beer is gone, he sets the bottle in the recycling bin. He leans against the sink and recites softly, bringing me up to date. To summarize, 1. Terry is sedated. She'll be staying with us for an unspecified period of time. 2. Mrs. Litch is even more sedated. She's at Betty's house. 3. Mikey died of a massive electrical shock. 4. Mikey will be buried on Tuesday, in the morning. The Litches want to get it over with. 5. Mikey didn't know what hit him. Dad gulps back a sob. He holds his breath for a minute, then exhales slowly. His eyes are watery and old. I'm sorry, Kate. I don't know what to say. He massages his temples and grimaces. I take his migraine medicine out of the cupboard by the sink, hand it to him, and pour him a glass of water. He tosses back the pill and drinks the water. Thanks. Can I ask you a question? He nods slightly. Mikey's father. It was Mr. Litch, wasn't it? Charlie. Dad turns on the hot water and carefully washes the glass before answering. Quite possibly. Probably. I'm going to try and get Terry into counseling, see if there's anything I can do to help. He takes a shaky breath. How's your brother? How's he doing? Toby was kind of freaked out, but he's sleeping now. I'm okay. He dries the glass and returns it to the cupboard. You should get some sleep, too. Go on upstairs now and turn out the light, will you? It's bothering my eyes. I hit the switch as I leave the room. He opens another beer in the dark. Terry Litch has no intention of sleeping. As I walk into my bedroom, she's trying to escape out the window. I grab her arm. What the hell are you doing? Go away. 
She shakes me off and tries again, giving her leg she'll fracture every bone in her body. I put my arms around her waist and try to pull her to the bed. You have to stay here. She releases the window frame and looks down at me. Let go. No way, you're trying to kill yourself. She steps backward and pushes me off. Not killing myself. What do you call jumping out of the window? I just want to go home, she says. I flick on the overhead light and blink. She's not wearing her glasses. Her eyes are so puffy I can't see the pupils. There are scratches on her face, a bandage on her forearm. They gave you drugs, Terry. You need to sleep. You're not thinking clearly. She makes a flapping mouth motion with her fingers. Blah, blah, blah. I move between her and the window. Seriously, you can't go back there. Not tonight. There's no heat. So? The springs squeak as she sits on the edge of my bed. So stay here. Ask me to drive you to Betty's house so you can stay with your mom. Please, please, please. Stay here and rest. She shakes her head from side to side, her hair swinging gently. No, no, no. Where he died. The exact spot. That's why I'm sleeping. No way. Even I can see the mental health implications in that. Tomorrow, when the sun is up and you're feeling better, Dad will go with you. I will too, if you want. But you can't go back now. I'm serious, Terry. Listen to me. Sit down. Come back here, Terry. You can't. She closes the door behind her. Damn. 8.1 Residual Matter by the time I get down to the lich's house, Terry is upstairs, sitting cross-legged on the floor where Mikey died. The moon is swimming through the window, casting silk shadows. She has stripped down to her bra, underpants, and mismatched socks. A semicircle of toy cars and trucks arcs in front of her. The half-empty toy basket is in her lap. First in the line is a fire truck. Terry? Terry? She doesn't answer. Her eyes are focused on a spot beyond the cars. I draped the blanket I brought over her shoulders and laid the pillows on the floor beside her. The air is thick with moonlight and the smell of Terry. She breathes in and out slowly, a wet, reluctant tide. I'm trespassing on holy ground. The boards creak as I make for the door. Terry's arm shoots out towards me, her fingers splayed open. Do you want me to stay? I ask. Nothing. Did she hear me? Is she freaking out on whatever the hospital injected? Terry! My voice is too loud. What do you want me to do? Stay? She slides the toy basket across the floor. Suit yourself, she slurs. Another beat of silence. The house creaks as the air quivers with lich lies and secrets and memories. I sit behind her, my back against hers, I take the ice cream truck out of the basket and set it in line. Next comes the police car, then the jeep, the motorboat, the cement truck, the bulldozer. One by one, the paint-chipped, dented, wheel-free vehicles of Mikey Litch line up until at last the basket is empty and the circle is finished. I can feel Terry twist as she looks to her right and left, making sure I completed the job properly. She settles back with a grunt and leans against me. The ridge of her backbone is thick like she has hunks of granite instead of vertebrae. When we are balanced back to back, covered by the blanket and encircled by toys, her gray hand appears again, slipping blindly towards mine. Our fingers weave together. Her hand is so hot I can already feel blisters forming. It's like holding on to a kerosene heater, hearing the sizzle and popping of burning flesh. Paint peels off my skin and drops to the floor, drops between the cracks, but I don't let go. 9.0. Radioactive. Safety tip. First aid kits in the lab must be clearly marked and identified. Sunday is a foggy day. Terry refuses breakfast and asks Dad to drive her to Betty's house so she can see her mother. Miss Cummings stops in after lunch and says Toby and I are in shock. She makes us pudding and leaves. I want to play hearts, but Toby keeps falling asleep. He could have a viral form of narcolepsy. Or maybe he's suffering from exposure to the paint fumes that night. I take the phone off the hook so he can get some rest. I look at my homework, but it doesn't make any sense. 
I take out my contacts and put on my glasses, and that doesn't help. I think maybe I should do some laundry. I think maybe I should check my email. I think I should brainstorm about my MIT appeal. But all I can do is watch cartoons all day and half the night. It's really foggy out. Terry stumbles into my bedroom at one o'clock on Monday morning and wakes me up. She has walked from Betty's house to mine, with a stop at the moon for a beer or two or eight. I leave a note for Toby and Dad on the kitchen table and drive Terry to her house. We sleep on the floor of Mikey's room again. It's even colder than the night before. 10.0 Phase Transition Safety Tip Wear lab coat when handling corrosive or flammable substances. There's no point in going to school on Monday. No point whatsoever. Terry has other ideas. She shoves me awake at dawn. We're going to be late, she says, pulling on her dirty clothes. I rub my cheek. I toppled over in the night and slept on the cement truck. We don't have to go to school. Dad will call and explain. She pulls on her jeans. Why would I want to stay around here? Because you're in shock. You need counseling. You need Prozac and many other drugs. Your son is dead. You need to cry. You need more sleep. You need to eat something. You need to plan a funeral. You need to deal with all this shit. Fine, I say, trying to stand up. Let's go to school. When we get to my house, Terry walks straight to Bert and lets herself in the passenger's side. I duck in the house to change quickly and grab my books. I tell Dad what's up and remind him to give Toby his meds. The recycling bin is full of beer bottles and Dad is moving slowly. No comment. Terry doesn't say a word during the drive to school. She follows me through the parking lot and stands patiently in line to get through security. I show my ID and pass through the gates without setting off any alarms. Terry doesn't even reach for her wallet. She just walks through, head down. Don't you need to see her identification? I ask the security guard. Everyone knows Terry, the security guard says. Move along, please. The bell rings and the crowd in the lobby streams off and down the halls. We pass Student Body, the bizarre sculpture Mr. Freeman's art class built. Sure enough, someone ripped off the heart. The jockstrap, too. Terry failed to mention the part where she planned to accompany me to my classes. Miss Cummings' eyebrow arches up when we walk into chem, but she doesn't say a word. Terry takes a seat at the empty lab table by the fume hood. When she lays her head down, my necklace slips out from the collar of her shirt and the gold heart pings once on the table. She falls asleep instantly. My friends, enemies, and competitors whisper the expected questions and toss me notes, but I am a rock. I say nothing. In fact, I don't do anything either. Miss Cummings gets it. She calls Diana up to her desk and makes excuses for me and gives her instructions on how she can get through today's lab single-handed. Diana comes back and tells me she's sorry about everything. Everything is a big word. The class gets to work. They are studying the rate of reaction influenced by the presence of catalysts and inhibitors and a bunch of other stuff. My brain refuses to tune in to the chemistry channel this morning. I should have taken a shower. I tilt my chair back flagrant rule-breaking, and study the holes left in the ceiling tiles by a generation of pencil points, nasty little thoughts ping-pong inside me. I wonder where Mikey's body is. I wonder what Terry's thinking. She must be thinking, even if she's asleep. I bet her mind's in hyperdrive, or maybe she jettisoned her warp core and is adrift. I wonder what she's going to do now. Everything has changed, right? If it hasn't, I would be even more awful. I wonder if they washed Mikey's feet. He had the dirtiest feet of any kid I've ever known. I wonder why MIT rejected me. I'm so sick. I'm scum. That's why MIT rejected me. I failed the sick scum test. I have no future. I'm going to live at home, care for my aging father, and sell condoms at the pharmacy. If they don't fire me because I'm sick scum, maybe I can get a job at Superfresh working for Ed. God, I'm cold. What's Terry going to do? What was she going to do before everything happened? College? The army? What about her mother? Can she live alone? Terry will join the army, rise through the ranks, and command the U.S. troops in the Pacific. She'll live in Hawaii. I will live at home, care for my aging father and her aging, blind, diabetic mother, and sell day-old bread at the Superfresh. 
Sick, pathetic, overwrought scum. My quads hurt. My Achilles tendon. And that stupid pec muscle's bothering me again. Probably from carrying around. Uh. Suddenly the class is empty, except for Miss Cummings at her desk, watching Terry, who's standing next to me. Class is over. Wake up, Terry says. Where do we go next? We eat. 10.1. Titanium. We have to walk past the football team in the cafeteria. The guys don't say anything to Terry, even though she glares at each one straight in the eyes, daring them, egging them on. They must have seen it on the news. Everyone knows. Everything. Every stinking little thing. Once we're past them, Terry's shoulders sag as if the air has been let out of her. I can't believe she's standing, much less has the energy to walk or dare the team to fight her again. She's made of titanium. Titanium doesn't tarnish easily. It doesn't conduct electricity so well either, considering it's a metal. Sarah and Travis are waiting with four coffee cups and a greasy bag of donuts. Like Miss Cummings, they're surprised to see Terry, but cover it with a polite, Hey, and what's up? Where's Pangborn? I ask. He's not here, Sarah says. Terry, you want some coffee? Terry lifts her head. Yeah, thanks. Sarah gets up and jogs to the lunch line. Terry stares at the swirl of yellow paint on Travis's forehead. We finished painting the playroom, I explain. The other night after... after you left, it's a little sloppy. We'll go back and paint it over when you want, if you want. She closes her eyes. Shut up, Malone. Just leave her alone. Sarah comes back with an extra cup. She carefully pours coffee from each of our cups into Terry's until we all have the same amount. Then she pushes the cup across the table and says quietly, We have glazed donuts. Terry takes a shaky breath and opens her eyes. I like glazed. I open the bag and offer it to her. She reaches in and takes one, then breaks it into two and hands the small half to me. I dunk it quickly in my coffee and take a bite. The icing melts and softens on my tongue, sweet and warm and delicious. Terry blows on her coffee, sips, then eats. She isn't even wearing her glasses. Come on, how did I not notice that before? The last time I saw her wearing them was that night, I think. In the ambulance? Before the ambulance? The swelling around her eyes has gone down a bit. There are dried lines of salt on her face. I overdunk and slop coffee on the table. I take another bite. When was the last time I had it glazed? Travis yawns. He puts four packets of sugar in his coffee, stirs it with a pencil, and gulps down half of it. You get any sleep? He asks Terry. Enough, she says. You? He smiles. Not enough. Do you want me to go home and get your glasses? I ask. I like it blurry. Terry says. Travis nods. Exactly. That was good. An almost normal conversation. She doesn't look like she's going postal or anything. Maybe as long as she stays in school, she can pretend it's still a normal day, and she'll go home, and Mikey will be there. If it hurts me to think about that, I can't imagine what it feels like for her. Sarah pokes my hand with her coffee stirrer. You should call Mitch. Why? Trav called his house, and his mom says he doesn't want to talk to anyone, so you should call him. Travis nods. Terry is lost in her coffee cup. He'll turn up, I say. You know him. The last time Mitchell missed a day of school, it was in first grade and had the chicken pox. He's been gunning for the district attendance record ever since. His mom said he was acting strange, Trav says. He was cleaning. Cleaning? He was so weird. Sarah swallows hard and studies her nails. You know, when we were painting. Travis licks his finger and uses it to pick up the spilled sugar on the table. Both you guys have been acting weird, if you ask me. Too much geek pressure. It's like you're having a symbiotic meltdown, Sarah says. They need sex, Travis tells her. Terry acts like she doesn't hear a word of this. She reaches for what would have been Mitch's cup of coffee and drinks from it. I brush the donut crumbs into my hand. Stop being melodramatic. No one's having a meltdown. Call it what you want. 
Pangborn is changing, Travis says. He's been watching that damned golf channel. It's polluting his soul. And you guys have been fighting. Aren't you worried? Sarah asks. I have other things to worry about right now, I say. Terry sets the empty cup on the table. She's still wearing her hospital bracelet and my watch. 10.2. Freezing Point Depression. We're trapped in a wormhole the rest of the day. My body's in slow motion, dragging through classes that look like video clips transmitted through a lousy modem connection. The memories of the weekend, they're all piped through a DSL line. Terry walks next to me. Terry sits next to me. Wordless. I reroute us through the halls to avoid going near the preschool classroom. English, blah, 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 no Mitch. Miss Devlin still thinks understanding Greek mythology is the key to happiness. If you ask me, Teresa Litch is a living, breathing Greek tragedy. AP Euro, the Balkan Wars, 1912 to 1913, helped create World War I. Why do they think we care about this? Terry spends the class writing in my notebooks. She rips out the pages and stuffs them in her pocket. Is this how she should be reacting? Maybe I should call my father. Calculus. Now I know I'm trapped in an alternate universe. Calculus has become pointless. Still no Mitchell Pangborn. My antennae are wriggling. Jim. It's raining. We're supposed to watch a video about the importance of stretching. Terry and I sleep on the wrestling mats instead. Study hall. Napping. Part 2. AP French. Who gives a merd? I don't take Terry to track practice, though I'm dying for a long, sweaty run. I have to take her back to the real world. Plus, I'm still sore. There is a funeral director in our kitchen, Mrs. Litch sitting by his side. He has a giant binder open on the table, a binder filled with pictures of caskets. He doesn't look like a funeral director. He looks normal. This is a terrifying thought. You could walk past somebody like this in the mall, and you would never know he handles dead bodies all day. What other anonymous aliens are out there messing with us? Terry pulls out a chair. The legs screech against the floor. She sits down and reaches for the book of caskets. I'm so out of here. Dad catches me as I'm flying down the hall. He's wearing a black suit with a white shirt and a gray knit tie mom bought him years ago. It is knotted against his Adam's apple. Thanks for helping out with Terry he says. I'm not helping. She just follows me. How are they going to pay for a casket? They cost thousands of- He holds up his hand. It's taken care of. Someone called and offered to take care of the expenses. They saw what happened on the news. Why do these generous mystery donors always wait until a kid dies before they show up? Where were they when Terry's father was coming into her bedroom and beating the crap out of her mother? I'd love to ask a dad, but all I'd get would be the patient look. The you-don't-understand-the-ways-of-the-world little girl look. And if I got that now, I'd spontaneously combust into a million fragments of blonde hair and bone and skin. Maybe you should go in and sit with her, he says. No way. I can't. I can't look at those things. I have to make a phone call, Dad. In private. 10.3 Transmutation. This is perverse, but I can't help myself. I can't think about Mikey, not for one second. I can't think about Terry, or Mitchell, or my father, or anyone else. My hands seek out the phone and punch in the ten-digit number, plus one for long distance. I have it memorized. Hello? My name is Colleen Malone, I say, invoking the name of the long dead. Class of 84? I'd like to speak to someone about my daughter's application. Kate, Kathleen M. Malone. Was she rejected? Asks MIT. Swallow hard, old girl. Uh, yes, yes, she was. We were wondering about an appeal, or if someone could tell us why you turned her down. She's heartbroken. I understand, purrs MIT. It's a hard thing to go through. After a couple of minutes on hold, sharing my social security number and other useless information, more time on hold, they finally patched the ghost of my mother through to somebody with an answer. Your daughter is very intelligent, no question about it. High grades and advanced placement classes, plays a sport, 
a few clubs. She won a national science competition, too. I see. She'll have no problem getting into any number of schools. But she's had her heart set on MIT since the fourth grade. I'm sorry, Mrs. Malone. The intercom buzzes. No, no, no. I shake my head like a two-year-old. MIT is slipping away from me. I can feel it. Is it the money? I ask. I know, I know. We're poorer than dirt. But she can work. I'll, I'll take another job. Wash dishes. Wash windows. Kate can work, too. She's a good worker. We'll do anything. It's not the money, Mrs. Malone. We don't take our decisions based on the size of the applicant's bank account. Then what did she do wrong? MIT pauses. There's a boy entering this fall who has already patented genetic therapy on fruit flies. We have a girl who wrote her own translation program from Chinese into Somalian. They bring an extra something. That oomph. Oomph? Oomph. Your daughter is smart, Mrs. Malone, but she's missing something. That something extra. And frankly, her essays were weak. I recommend she work on her writing skills. I know you love her very much, and you want the best place for her. MIT is not the best place for her right now. The intercom interrupts again. She would be an asset on your campus, I try. I'm sorry, I have an appointment now. The MIT mask slips back into place. I can hear the elastic band twang, vibrate, then go still. Good luck, Kate. Goodbye. No one is home at Sarah's house. I back down her driveway carefully and head to the other side of the development. I'm terrified that if I take my eyes off the road for even one second, I'll go out of control and run down an old lady or sideswipe a police car. Five blocks later, I park on the street, get out, shut my door, and lock it. Then I unlock and open it and double-check that I turned off my headlights, double-triple-check that I have the keys in my hand, close the door, lock it, Key still in hand? Check. Mrs. Pangborn opens her front door while talking into a telephone headset. They have to remove it. It's in the contract. I don't care how much it costs. My client refuses to take possession while there's a two-ton statue of copulating Greek gods on the patio. Would you like to eat breakfast next to that thing? She waves her fingers at me and smiles. Hang on, Anne. I've got another call. She presses the button at her waist and gives me a quick hug that smells like Victoria's Secret Lotion. Kate, I heard all about you, you poor thing. I'm okay. Do you want to stay for dinner? I won't pester you with questions, I promise. This is the first time I've seen Mrs. Pangborn with my contacts in. With my glasses on, it was always easy to see what it would look like to cook Christmas dinner with her, to invite her to my college graduation, thank her for my bridal shower, drop off the grandkids, and other assorted nonsense. With the contacts in, I can't see any of it. We're having salmon, she says. I can make a dill sauce. I blink. Thanks, but I can't. There's a lot going on at home. Is Mitch around? She rolls her eyes. In his room. I don't know how you finally did it, but thank you. He told us last night. He told you what? He's finally going to be practical about college. He wants to study international economics, then go to business school. Thank God. The red light by her hold button blinks. I've got to finish this call, honey. Go on upstairs. You're welcome to stay if you change your mind. We're eating in half an hour. She clicks the hold button again. Anne, I'm back. Yeah, another settlement nightmare. Do they ever end? The Pangborns have always assumed that because Mitchell's a straight-A student and major Eagle Scout that he doesn't have hormones. They just can't imagine their precious baby having a lustful moment, or fast hands, or a wet tongue. I walk up the stairs, head down the hall, and knock on the door with the Harvard banner. He grunts. I enter. Mitchell's room is usually like Toby's, a breeding ground for bacteria and nasty ideas, hence my shock. The curtains are tied back, and the windows are shiny clean. I can see his floor. It's covered in dark blue carpet. Who knew? His bed is made up with a quilt and pillows on it. The only things on his desk, his dusted desk, are his computer monitor and keyboard. The bookcase is actually filled with books, upright and spines out. Soccer trophies shine in parade formation on the tops of the bookcase. 
Mitch is wearing a t-shirt and sweats, sitting in the middle of his floor sorting through a mountain of papers. Some are placed in file folders, but it looks like most of them have been chucked in a black garbage bag next to him. He's got his earphones on and is bobbing back and forth, humming off key. I have to move into his line of sight to get his attention. He takes his earphones off and stands up. What's wrong? You look terrible. I kick off my sneakers, pull back the covers, and get into his bed. Kate, are you okay? I close my eyes and shake my head. I'm losing it, Pangborn. Define losing it. I pull the sheet up around my neck. I called MIT and pretended to be my mom. He turns off the CD player. Why? I thought they made a mistake, let in the wrong Kate Malone. And? I look up at him, shielding my eyes with my hand. Black spots dance in the air. He's standing with his back to the windows. The sunlight flares around his edges like a corona. It puts my face in his shadow. I can't see you. He locks the door and crawls under the covers with me. I lift my head so he can lay one arm under it. Then he pulls me close. He smells like boy. I close my eyes again. The spots are still there, red now instead of black. Do you think I'm freaking out? I whisper. I think I'm lost. Someone switched the road signs and I'm stuck with an old map. Mitch places his finger on my lips. Shh, be quiet. I can feel his pulse under the skin of his neck. Slower, Malone. Stop running. My heart trips over itself again, then settles into a soft, steady rhythm. I could fall asleep here and melt into his chest. He'd keep the world on the other side of that door if I asked him. He'd cradle my head and keep me warm. He kisses my forehead. I tilt my face and pull him close for a gentle kiss. His arms tighten. He presses against me, and the kiss gets hard and deep. He tastes like he's been eating rodents. I pull back and make a face. Yuck, what's that? His chuckle shakes the headboard. Beef jerky. Sorry, I didn't think you'd be crawling in my bed today. I wave the air between us. It's fetid. All right, I won't breathe on you. He rolls on his back. Come here. I lay my head on his chest and he strokes my hair. I press my ear against his shirt. His heart beats lazy like a rocking chair. This is a good place to freeze time. Right here, this very second. So, what did MIT say to your pretend mom? A telephone rings. Mrs. Pangborn's heels clatter across the tile floor in the foyer. Her voice echoes up the stairwell, chattering about nothing and nothing and nothing. She's a fab saleswoman, though. Kate? he asks softly. I smooth his shirt over his chest. It's a new shirt. I haven't seen it before. I, um, I lack oomph. That's what the MIT god told my mom. Spots dance in front of my eyes again. I am one of a million wannabe geeks. Great, just not great enough. And my essay sucked. Shit. Yeah. So you're not going. I'm not going. And look, I know things are a little weird between us right now, but please don't make me talk. I just need you to hold me because it sort of feels like gravity doesn't work anymore. He pulls me close. Not that tight, I say. I still need to breathe. Sorry. Is that better? Great. Thanks. Mrs. Pingborn's voice moves from the foyer to the kitchen. I can picture her taking the salmon out of the refrigerator. She'll smell it to make sure it's fresh, turn on the oven, spray a pan with no-fat, butter-tasting chemicals, and wash the vegetables. Mitch's voice rumbles deep in his chest. Which safety are you going to take? I have not been nice enough to Mrs. Pangborn. She offered to go shopping for a prom dress with me a few weeks ago, and then I blew her off. That was bitchy of me. Kate? I said I didn't want to talk. You don't have a choice. This is your life. Which safety? I curl into a ball and pull the sheet up over my head. I don't have a safety. What did you say? Speak up. I only applied to one school, MIT. I thought I was a sure thing. So I was right. You never wrote those essays. That's why you wouldn't show them to me. I pause to swallow the jerky taste. As much as it kills me to admit, yes, you were right. My boyfriend, my enemy, and my lust lie still for a moment. What does your dad say? He doesn't know. 
You're the only person that does. His heart is beating faster. Mine is about to propel me out of his bed. If you call me stupid or laugh, he takes a deep breath. Man, it's hot in here. He stands up, crosses the room, and opens the windows over his desk. Seen through the cotton weave of his shirt, his edges are blurry. He leans forward to look outside. So, no college in September. That sucks, really. I'm sorry. The oven door bangs in the kitchen. I bet we're having spaghetti at my house. Spaghetti and bread. I bet Terry isn't hungry, not after choosing a casket. It's funny, you know. The funeral director had casket pictures in a heavy-duty three-ring binder, the kind you use at school that would last all the way to June if you were lucky, the kind you fill with handouts that have carefully punched holes in the left margin, holes you reinforce with sticky white circles because you don't want to lose any handouts because you never know what you're going to be tested on. What are you going to do? he asks. I shrug, but he can't see it. I'll come up with something. I guess I have to, don't I? Yep. Whatever is out that window sure must be fascinating. What's up with you changing your major? I ask. Mom told you, huh? He turns around. They're thrilled. I take the sheet off my head. My hair crackles with static electricity. Yeah, but economics? Yep. I sit up and cross my legs. What happened to history? You love history. Waste of time. I'm calling the tabloids. You're a clone. The real Mitchell Pangborn has been abducted by aliens. Nope. This is me. I'm finally growing up, I guess. Time to deal with real life. But Mitch, you're going to be a college professor. You don't like dealing with real life. I've changed my mind. I wave my hand in the air. Hello? When did this happen? When they put Mikey's body in the ambulance. He looks out the window again. I've never seen a dead person before. Well, I did on TV, but that doesn't count. One minute he was there, running around. His nose was snotty, and then... Then I heard Terry scream, and you scream. Everything got crazy. They put him in the ambulance. Farting around with ancient history is just a waste of time. I want to do something useful, something that counts. I pull a pillow into my lap. International economics wouldn't have saved Mikey. He picks up a pile of papers from the carpet and shoves them into a trash bag. No, but it's practical. Why are you arguing with me? You've been telling me history is a waste of time for years. I think I was wrong. I think you should study something that you love. Mrs. Pangborn calls up the stairs. Dinner in ten minutes. I'll learn to love it. Are you staying for dinner? Mom's been asking where you've been. I can't. I already told her. I want to see how Terry's doing. I take my keys and a pack of gum out of my purse. I unwrap two sticks of wintergreen and put them in my mouth. Mitch shivers once. It got cold again. God, I hate spring. Blizzard, heat wave, blizzard, heat wave. He shuts the window and pulls the curtains together. His edges blur again. I sling my purse over my shoulder. Terry and I slept at her house last night, in Mikey's room. Why? Because she wanted to? You can't let her boss you around like that, Kate. You have to take control. He gives me another beef jerky kiss before opening the door. Thanks for coming over. It's kind of cool that you were worried about me. My mask slips back into place. I can hear the elastic band twang, vibrate, and then go still. I smile. Thanks for listening about the college thing. You really helped a lot. When I return home, Dad is sitting on the front porch with Miss Cummings. The two empty teacups and a plate of cookie crumbs on the table are her touch. If he were alone, it'd be a beer bottle with an empty potato chip bag. There's pizza inside, Dad says. Did Toby eat? He's over at a friend's house. I thought it would do him some good to get away for a little bit. What about Terry? I ask. Watching television, Miss Cummings says. She said the two of you were going to sleep at her house again. Well, no, actually, I want my own bed. All to myself, with clean sheets and no lich odors or ghosts. Yeah, I say. Whatever. How is she? Quiet. The funeral is all planned, and everything is ready. A rusty pickup truck barreling down the road backfires loudly. The sound makes Dad wince. 
Did you take your migraine medicine at dinner? I ask. I forgot. I'll get it for you. I pick up the cookie plate and teacups. Dad stands up to get the door for me. Is Mitchell Pangborn all right? Miss Cummings asks. I heard he missed school today. He almost had the record. Yeah, it's a shame. I pause on the threshold. He lost it. 11.0 Alpha Decay Safety Tip Fire Polish All Rough Glass Edges It's Tuesday. The sun is supposed to shine. There's something obscene about burying a tiny body on a spring day that smells like lilacs. I'm fighting something viral, and it's winning. I've got chills, my head hurts, and I want to heave. My eyes are so irritated and dry that I can't get my contacts in. I shouldn't have gone running last night. I slip the black dress over my head, reach around, and pull up the zipper. A black velvet headband keeps my hair out of my face. I put on my glasses. A perfect little mourner stares back from the mirror, with clean hair, depressing clothes, and low-heeled shoes. Got to do something about the bags under my eyes. Terry changed hours ago. According to Toby, she climbed up to the bell tower of the church and has been working her way through a pack of cigarettes. Shock is hardening her into something more metallic and permanent. Over in the church, Betty starts playing the organ. Funerals are an occupational hazard in a minister's house. I grab a thick black sweater and button it up. Mikey's casket is the size of a small toy chest. It's closed, thank God. Terry folded his favorite blanket and set it on the foot end. She taped some of his drawings to the sides. The casket rests in front of the altar, a wooden island in a sea of outrageous flowers. Roses, tulips, carnations, daffodils, lilies, mums. There has never been so much color in this church before. It makes my nose think of jazz and Central Park. As people walk in and take their seats, Betty plays Sesame Street tunes on the organ, which is a first for this church, Terry insisted. Betty was worried that it wasn't quite holy enough for something, but this morning she said Jesus came to her when she was watching a quilting show on Channel 17 and said that he's a big Sesame Street fan and that she should play with joy. Toby and I sit near the front. Mitchell, Sarah, and Travis join us. Mitch is decked out in a suit and tie. His shoes shined. Travis put on corduroys and a button-down shirt with a tie. I had no idea that he owned a tie. Sarah's wearing a red top and a long, twirly skirt that has little mirrors sewn into it. She doesn't believe in wearing black to a funeral. She gives me a hug before she sits down. People keep coming, more than I thought. The entire hard hat crew is here. All the kitchen ladies, the ambulance drivers, our principal, and a couple of teachers from the Votech in the preschool, and the librarian. Terry walks her mother down the center aisle with some help from Miss Cummings. They sit in the pew in front of us. All of us, Toby, me, Mitch, Sarah, and Travis, reach forward one by one to pat Terry's shoulder. She doesn't move. Betty changes to a dirge. No more Sesame Street. We stand and try to sing. Dad isn't even mouthing the words. When the last minor chord warbles away, we sit. Dad takes his place in the pulpit and bows his head. In this light, there is more white in his hair than brown. One minute ticks by. He's staring straight down at the closed Bible in front of him. Two minutes. My hands curl into fists, the nails biting into the palms. People shift their heads. Bulletins flutter. Throats clear. Dad doesn't move. Three minutes pass. Quiet muttering starts in the back of the church. Choir members nudge one another through their gowns. Their pointy elbows look like baby wings. Dad raises his head. His slack face is streaming with tears. The conversations stop. Sarah pokes me. Is he okay? She whispers. Maybe you should do something, Toby says. Cripes. Something could be wrong, Sarah says. Help him. Just then, Dad pulls out a white handkerchief from under his black robe and blows his nose loudly. When he tucks the handkerchief away, he forces a smile. Sometimes even your pastor can't find the right words, he says. And if you will open your hymnals... Dad is back on track. The adults in the congregation sigh and spring into action. 
They fumble a bit with their hymnals, looking for the right pages. Toby takes my fists out of my lap and loosens my fingers. The service rolls on. A prayer. A hymn. More prayers. Then a sermon. It's like a stage play, with Dad as the leading actor. I try to think of the casket as a prop, but it's useless. Every time I look at it, my stomach flips over. After half an hour of religion, it's time to wind things up with a closing hymn. Terry chose Rubber Ducky. I can't get the words out. 11.1 Beta Decay TV news cameras have set up across the street. They film the mourners crossing the driveway that separates the church from the graveyard. They focus on Dad and Mr. Lockhart carrying the casket, zoom in on Mrs. Litch leaning on Terry's arm, on Terry's frozen face, the run in her stockings, her work boots and flowered dress. Look at the stupid, poor people. Look at the stupid, poor, burned out people. Look at the stupid people. Poor people, burned out people. Look at their dead baby. It's death porn for the masses. Dad and Mr. Lockhart set the casket down next to a small hole dug in the ground. Mikey's grave is in the back corner of the cemetery, uphill from the Lich's house. He and Mr. Lockhart will lower it into the grave later. People don't like to watch that part. Betty helps Terry guide Mrs. Litch to the folding chairs lined up by the grave. The rest of the crowd tiptoe in and stand with their heads bowed. My friends and my brother join them. I can't. I stay outside the gate, my back to the cameras. I flex my fingers, try to get some circulation going. Even though the sun is shining, it's freezing today. Dad opens the faded book and speaks some old words. As he reads, Terry puts her head in her hands and sobs. Dad has to speak louder to be heard. A cardinal lands on my mother's tombstone and chirps, looking for lunch or a mate. Dad can't see it from where he's standing. I have to study the pebbles under my feet and breathe through my mouth. I don't understand death. It's a physical law that energy is neither created nor destroyed. So what happens when people die? The wind picks up and more birds fly overhead. Terry keeps crying. Dad's voice cracks once. He pauses to rub the back of his neck with his left hand. Other people are sniffing and wiping their eyes. Travis and Sarah have their arms around each other, her head on his shoulder. There is still a bit of yellow paint behind his ear. He hides his face in her hair. Mitchell has his hands clasped behind his back. Toby is sitting on the ground plucking grass. Dad's voice deepens, calling on God, spirits big and small. Mikey is, Mikey was, Mikey will be never more. Dust. I walk around to the front of the house and open the door. Someone has to start the coffee and get the napkins out. After the funeral, the mourners invade our house armed with casseroles and sympathy cards. Dad greets them at the door. After a quick handshake, they move to the living room to pay their respects. Mrs. Litch sits on the couch, flanked by Betty and Miss Cummings, the three of them holding cups of black coffee jittering on china saucers. Respects are paid. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We're all so sorry for your loss, playing over and over and over again. Mrs. Litch is wearing sunglasses. She nods her head like a queen. Terry is nowhere to be seen. Betty tells people that she's resting, poor dear. Part of our church's funeral ritual is to stuff your face. The dining room table is buried under cakes, plates of sandwiches, chips, dips, and several varieties of tuna casserole. I set up the coffee urn and pitchers of iced tea on the card table. The cakes and cookies are laid out on the sideboard. I buzz around resupplying paper plates, cutting cake, and mopping up spills. I make sure there's enough toilet paper in the bathroom. My flu symptoms seem to have abated. Maybe I ate something that was spoiled, or the lack of sleep caught up to me. Toby disappears into his room with his Game Boy and Mr. Spock. Terry's gone, too. I'm too busy to worry about them right now. I send my friends back to school, back to normal. We all hug, hug, kiss, kiss. Mitch tries to hold on too long. I squirm away. The adults mingle and murmur. I'm so sorry. We're so sorry. Have another piece of that nut bread. Did you get something to drink? 
Your rose bushes look so healthy. What are they going to do? Is it true what I heard? Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Is that a new dress? Blah, blah, blah. Nobody talks to me, which is fine. The cat raids the ham platter and I stick her in the basement. And then they leave. Betty and Mrs. Litch are the first to go, then the choir, and one by one the house empties. The cars fill up and drive away. Dad has changed out of his robe and into jeans and a sweatshirt. He mutters something and walks back over to the church. I bet he's going to take a nap on the sofa in his office. I wash the dishes. It's my house after all. Toby joins me in the kitchen once the coast is clear. They're gone? I set a bowl of tuna casserole on the floor for Mr. Spock. Perfect timing. The show's over. Excellent. He cuts a monstrous piece of chocolate cake and takes a quart of milk out of the fridge. Use a glass. He sighs and grabs a cup. Dad sleeping? I spoon ambrosia salad into the plastic container. Yep. What's with all the food? It's for Terry and her mom. I'm going to freeze it. We can take it down to their place once they get the kitchen finished and the electricity fixed. Um... While he eats, I pack up the food. Leftover casserole is dumped into plastic containers. The extra ham is wrapped in aluminum foil. Sandwiches are wrapped in plastic. I work steadily, the little engine that could. Toby eats another piece of cake. When he's finished, I point to the dishwasher. He licks the plate before putting it in. Is this what it was like when Mom died? He asks. I open the freezer slowly. Don't you remember? No. I stack the containers of casserole one on top of the other in the freezer. I guess. Toby hands me a container. You guess? I put the last container in and shut the door. Those sandwiches had mayonnaise, didn't they? Can't freeze those. I put the bag of quartered sandwiches in the fridge. You can take some to school if you want. The funeral, Kate. It was just a funeral. You've seen plenty. Was I there? What? When I was real little, did Dad let me go? Okay. The dishes were washed and the food put away, but the counters are filthy. Someone spilled lemonade and it looks like the top must have come off a salt shaker. I take the comet out from under the sink. Kate? I don't know. First I wet the surface and then wipe up as much salt as I can. Then I sprinkle the comet on the countertop, squeeze the sponge under hot water and scrub. I don't remember. Toby leans against the refrigerator. Dad told me that all of the grandparents came, and Grandma Stewart was already senile and kept wandering off. If Dad told you about it, why are you bugging me? I rinse out the sponge and scrub some more. Because you won't tell me anything. I use my thumbnail to scrape away something hard and gray stuck on the middle of the counter. It was oatmeal. I think he likes to pretend it never happened, Toby adds. You got that right. I rinse the sponge again and wipe down the counter. That looks much better. Help me with the trash. Toby snaps open a garbage bag and holds it while I lift the smaller bags out of the trash and dump them in. How many people were at Mom's funeral? As many as today? I spin the garbage bag and fasten a twist tie around the neck. There were lots of cars. They had to park in the front yard and way up both sides of the road. I set the bag by the back door and wash my hands. Then I snap off a square of plastic wrap. The salad needs to be covered. Toby hops up on the counter. Did she have an open casket? The plastic sticks to itself. Jeez, Tobe. I crumple it in a ball and try again. I don't remember the casket. You're lying. No, I'm not. I pull the last of the plastic wrap off the roll and stretch it across the bowl. It seals perfectly. Did Dad help carry her casket to the grave? It's morbid to obsess about funerals, you know. He carried Mikey's casket. Did he help carry Mom's? I honestly don't know. Why not? We need more plastic wrap. Why not? I open the refrigerator door and talk to the skim milk. Because I wasn't there, okay? You want to know what I remember? I remember running out of the church. I was wearing black patent leather shoes and I ran down the road and I got blisters and I kept running and the blisters popped and then I kept running even more and then my feet were all squishy and wet and I kept sliding in those stupid shoes like I was ice or something. By the time they found me, Mommy was buried in the ground. I didn't see it happen, but I don't remember it, okay? Toby pushes himself off the counter. 
Yeah, okay, relax. I just wanted to know. I let the cold air cool me down before I put salad on the top shelf. Sometimes not knowing is better. I close the door a little too hard and the magnets fall off. Toby bends down and helps me. He works silently, putting up his soccer schedule, my track schedule, his honor roll certificate, my honor roll certificate, a list of emergency telephone numbers, a postcard of the MIT campus, another postcard, an old one, of the periodic table. The last piece of paper is a drawing of Mikey's, an enthusiastic roundish thing entitled Ball. I let Toby put that one up. I wash my hands again. I'm going to the store to get plastic wrap. Want anything? He bites his lip. Maybe you should go to the store later. Why would I want to do that? Well, she was in a hurry. I figured she wanted to get away from everyone, you know. No, I don't know. Tell me, who left? Terry. Terry borrowed your car an hour ago. She said she needed cigarettes. 11.2. Entropy. Good news, she didn't take Bert far. Bad news, she's swinging a sledgehammer and yelling. I sprint down the hill to the lich house. More good news, sort of. She's not pulverizing my car. She's attacking the half-renovated kitchen at the back of her house. The back door's been torn from the hinges and the window smashed to bits. Her hair is coated with dust and swinging wildly around her face as she wields the sledgehammer, every blow punctuated with a curse. She's in a trance, lost in the action of beating a counter to death, heart pumping, lungs like bellows. The kitchen looks worse than it did after the fire. The double insulated windows are shattered. The new drywall has been ripped from the studs, and all but one of the cabinets have been torn out and smashed to the ground. The sink is still hanging from the wall, but the drain pipe under it is missing. She hasn't torn down the roof or ripped up the floor yet, but the way she's going, it's just a matter of time. Bert is parked dangerously close to the storm. He looks unharmed, though I bet he has a nail or two in his tires. It's a miracle she hasn't hit him with anything, the way she's tossing lumber and tools around. At least she didn't drive him into the bridge abutment. Terry drops the hammer and kicks the counter fragments out the door to the ground below. Yesterday there were steps leading from the dirt to the kitchen door. Now they're gone. She picks up a crowbar and inserts it in between the last cabinet and the wall. She leans back, veins standing out of her neck, and pushes with her lungs, her butt hanging out for leverage. The nails scream. She swears, and the cabinet breaks free and tumbles to the floor. She tosses the crowbar aside and crouches down to pick it up. It's too big for her to get her arms around. You want some help with that? I ask. She jumps a bit and squints through the former window in my direction. She's not wearing her glasses. No. She takes a length of rope on the floor and ties it around the fallen cabinet. I climb up into the kitchen. That's awfully big. You might hurt yourself. Terry tightens the knot, then wraps the ends of the rope around her fists. She bends her knees deeply and pulls. The cabinet moves slowly, scraping grooves in the new plywood subfloor. She pulls until the cabinet is almost to the doorway, then she moves to the other side and pushes it off with her boot. It lands on the ground with a little crack. Or maybe not, I say. Terry takes off her work gloves and lets them fall. She picks up a can of soda from the floor and gulps it down then wipes her mouth with the back of her hand. You come down here to stare at me? No, I was looking for my car. Could have asked, you know. She crumples the can in her fist and flings it into the yard. You're such an idiot. Here. She takes something out of her pocket. I used the keys this time. She tosses them over my shoulder. I don't move. It's not just the car. I was worried about you. I bet you were. She slips her work gloves back on picks up the crowbar, and jumps to the ground. She breaks the cabinet into kindling with just a few blows and then kicks the pieces. Is the party over yet? she asks. Yep, your mom went back to Betty's house. Did she ask where I was? No. Typical. She studies the crowbar in her hand for a second, then sets it on Bert's roof and reaches in for a pack of cigarettes that's on the dashboard. She shakes one out and sticks it between her lips. She shakes another one halfway out and offers it to me. No thanks. Suit yourself. She tosses the pack back in the car and lights up. 
I saved the leftovers for you. They're in the freezer. She inhales deeply and blows smoke at the sky. It floats above her head like a gray ceiling, then dissipates and drifts away. People always bring too much, I say. She removes a flake of tobacco from her tongue and inhales again. The ash at the end of the cigarette is the same color as her face. I should go. My car's in one piece. It's none of my business if Terry wants to wreck her house. I need to go home and wash the kitchen floor, check my email, call Diana for the chem lab notes. I have to buy plastic wrap. I really should go. Terry flicks the end of the cigarette with her thumb and the ash crumbles. I dressed him, you know. Dressed who? Who do you think? Idiot. Moron. Oh, sorry. That must have been hard. Her chin dips down the tiniest bit, then comes back up. The funeral guy wasn't going to let me do it at first, and I got pissed. But your dad talked to him. Then he said it was okay. What was he wearing? I ask. Terry smiles a little. Jeans, sneakers, Mickey Mouse t-shirt. I shiver. Did you put on diapers or pull-ups? Pull-ups, so he could be a big boy. Her voice breaks off. I step towards her. She blows past me and leaps up onto the kitchen, scooping to grab the sledgehammer. She raises it over her head with a roar and slams it into the wall where the cabinet had been attached. Terry, no! She can't hear me. I can barely hear me. The air fills with her voice, the hammer hitting the walls. Dust, wood, plaster flying in all directions. Her face is red and wet, her mouth open. She screams and screams and hits and hits, stops to pant, then brings the sledgehammer back up again and lays it into the walls, the door frame, and anything that she can destroy. Please stop. Look, you're bleeding. Come home with me. I'll take you to a doctor. Whatever you want. She stops to look at the blood on her left forearm, gashed by a piece of wood. She turns over the palms of her hands. She didn't put the work gloves back on. They must be raw. This isn't doing any good, I say. You're just wrecking your house. Come on. She picks up the sledgehammer and breaks through the wall that leads to the playroom, then pounds away until there's enough space to step through. She drops the sledgehammer and disappears inside. It's quiet. I move along the outside of the house until I can see her through the windows. She's studying Mikey's handprints on the wall and the art that we added. It looks so stupid from where we're standing. I hope she doesn't think we were trying to make fun of her and her family or that we were defacing her house. Mitch was right. That was a stupid thing to do. We don't belong here. Terry? A paint can sails through the closed playroom window, spraying glass like a fountain. The lid comes off in mid-flight and a yellow swath of paint splats on the ground. A few drops land on my shoes. A second can launches through the middle window. I throw my arms over my head and duck. It arcs over me and explodes in the dirt like a blue bomb. Stop! Terry comes to the window. What's wrong, Katie? Scared? Of course I am. Look, I'm sorry about the wall. We were trying to... I don't know, we were just trying to say goodbye to Mikey. I know it was stupid, I'm sorry. She picks a shard of glass out of the window frame and tosses it at me. I jump out of the way. We'll fix it, we'll repaint it for you. Come on, I'll drive you home. Her red eyes harden. I am home. I step toward the window. Exactly, that's my point. This is your house, you can't tear it down. Watch me, I'm going to rip out every board, every beam, Every door, all the locks, the stairs, the walls, the freaking windows. She steps away from the window. Then smash! The sledgehammer comes down on the frame, splintering the wood. She wails away at the frame until she can kick the whole thing out of the wall. She stands where the window used to be, struggling to catch her breath. You can help me, or you can go home. Suit yourself. Terry, you need professional help. This isn't normal. Her laugh sounds like cloth ripping. What the hell is normal? You need time to deal with this. You need time to deal with this. Talk to a counselor or something. That's bull. You're not thinking. I don't want to think. That's ridiculous. She pulls a broken piece of plastered covered wood from the wall. Ridiculous? When I wasn't looking, my kid wandered upstairs and got killed. He got his brains fried. I don't want to think, Kate. Never again. She turns her face away. In the distance, there are cars and trucks speeding on the highway. 
The sound of their tires on the road provides a background hum, like background radiation, like the ticking clock or dripping faucet you don't notice until you notice it, then the sound drives you nuts. My little black dress and my velvet headband feel like they're on a different body, like I'm inhabiting something else. The space between Terry and me, maybe, or maybe I just left myself back up on that hill. My hands are ice, but Terry is dripping sweat. What does it feel like to drive a sledgehammer through a wall? To scream so loud that the birds fly away? Trip down an entire house because it hurts so much to look at it? I'm sorry, my mouth says. I came down here to help you. No, you didn't, she screams. You came here for your goddamn car. Get out. She's not rational. Get a grip, Malone. I pull my sweater closed and tie a belt around my waist. I rub my hands up and down my arms and clear my throat once. I wish I could help you. Fuck you very much. Well then, I pick up the keys and get in my car, which reeks of smoke. I roll down the windows and toss out Terry's pack of cigarettes and the soda. According to the odometer, she only drove 11 miles, but I doubt that she remembered to shift. Probably killed the transmission in the process. Poor Bert. I pat the dashboard and put him in reverse. A paint can flies through the last intact window of the playroom. The sound of exploding glass makes me flinch and I stomp on my gas. Bert shoots backwards and the can bounces off the top of the windshield on the passenger side. It tips and pours red paint everywhere. I slam the brakes and throw it into park. It takes a few minutes to stop shaking, a few more to realize that the windshield is still in one piece. The glass has a small spiderweb crack where the can hit, but the rest of the windshield is whole. Terry stays out of sight, banging and cursing inside. I turn the heat on high and flick on the wipers. The motor whines as the blades smear the thick red paint across the glass, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. 12.0, activated complex. Safety tip, never mix chemicals without a defined procedure. Dad's mechanic promises to look through some junkyards for me. He swears the crack won't get any bigger as long as I avoid speed bumps and don't exceed 10 miles per hour. Poor Bert. I stick him in the garage to recuperate. After dinner, I lose myself online. Terry stops by to chat with Dad. By the time I go downstairs for something to drink, she's gone. Dad says that she decided to stay at Betty's house for a while. She'll pick up the rest of her stuff tomorrow. Fine. I go out for a little run at midnight. There's a light on the upstairs at the liches. It's a flickering candle. Fine. After colleges have sent out acceptances and rejections, it's rather pointless to make seniors show up for class. Like they have something new to teach us? Please. But I'm still Kate Malone, so I attend class on autopilot. I keep forgetting to do homework, but I'll make it up later. The week plays out without drama. I go through the motions, move from station to station along the assembly line. At night, I run. In the morning, I sleepwalk. I keep my curtains closed and try not to breathe too much. This flu-not-flu flu thing has put a big hurt on me. Terry's name shows up on the absent list daily. Good Kate thinks about collecting her books and homework, but somehow I don't get around to it. I have her clothes, toothbrush, lighter, magazines, and all her junk in a duffel bag waiting by the front door. She hasn't stopped by. It takes Dad a couple of days to figure out that A, Terry's living in her house, and B, Terry's destroying it. I watch from the sidelines as he moves from concern to deep concern to frustration to anger. He tries to talk to Terry. She treats him the same way she treated me, more or less. He tries to talk to her mom. He talks to the police, two shrinks, county social services, and back again to Mrs. Litch. The answers drive him crazy. She can't be arrested. It's not against the law to knock out walls in your own house. Not with the water and electricity already turned off. She won't need a demolition permit until she breaks through an outside or retaining wall. She's 18 years old, so no one can go after her for cutting school. She's living in a house that her family owns, so social services won't get involved. And her mother doesn't care one way or another, as long as she can keep living at Betty's. Basically, Terry is doing what she wants and no one can stop her. She'll move out of there eventually. November, maybe. Definitely by the first snow. Toby has to write a biography about someone for his English class. 
He wants to write about our mother. I suggest he choose a different subject. He slams his door shut and turns up his CD so loud it scares the dog. I sleep all weekend, or maybe I don't even sleep at all. Hard to tell what's asleep and what's awake. They've blurred into each other. I've given up on my contacts. Wearing them is like jamming thistles into my eyes. My glasses are fine enough. In the bottom of Toby's clothes hamper, I come across Mikey's pajamas and one of his socks. It takes me a couple of hours to wash and iron them. I fold and lay them under my pillow. The last track meet of the season is on Tuesday, a week after the funeral. A big deal, this one. Last chance to qualify for state. Perfect weather. My father and brother in the crowd to watch my final race. When the starter's gun goes off, I just stand there. My feet refuse to move. How odd. They've always moved before. I sit down on the starting line. My legs are still attached, knees operational, socks rolled down, shoelaces tied. I stand up. Nope, these feet will not race. It's not dark enough, I guess. Dad drives me home. He wants me to take a nap. I wake up in the middle of the night. The lich house is quiet. It's been quiet for three days. I can't tell if that's a good sign or a bad sign. Dad has stopped talking about Terry. To me, at least. Mitchell emails and I delete. He took it upon himself to tell everyone about my little college disaster. Sarah has been spending a lot of time in my face trying to get me to talk about it. To share. Travis thinks I need a road trip. Mostly, I think about the advantages of being abducted by aliens. The pharmacy calls and fires me on the answering machine. Good Kate and Bad Kate have not come home. Either they are lost or I've scared them off. I have a new slant to my quantum futures options. I could work in a coal mine. I could move to Australia, learn how to shear sheep. I could donate my body and brain to science. I could volunteer at a third world orphanage. I could work on a cutter in the Arctic. When I show Sarah the new list, she throws it out. On Thursday, Miss Cummings catches me mixing dangerous chemical A with dangerous chemical B in class. This creates quite a reaction. We have to evacuate the building, which is a pain. On Friday, Dad makes me stay home and commands me to rest. As if. When he leaves, I sneak into Toby's room to clean. I open the windows, strip the bed, and take out the trash, and put all of his gym socks in a caustic bleach bath. His mom project is on his desk, hidden under a layer of comic books and algebra books. He has glued photos and written down a few facts. Born on, went to college, married, taught math, died on. Hobbies, fractals, studying transition metals, knitting. He didn't write down that her favorite perfume smelled like roses, or that she knew the value of pi to the 40th digit, or that she knew all of Tom Lehrer's songs, or that she used to stay up with Toby all night to make sure he kept breathing, or that she liked a clean kitchen, or that she was Phi Beta Kappa at MIT. Maybe she called it Pi Beta Kappa. And then I am in bed, quite sure that I'm awake, and then I'm running, convinced that I'm asleep. I have a dream in which Michael Lips Pingborn tells me that none of this would have happened if I had learned to write better essays. And then he puts me on hold while he talks to some chick in Cambridge. I can't get warm. I pile all the blankets from the linen closet on my bed, and my winter coat, and a sleeping bag, too. I put my head under the covers and worry for a second about the possibility of carbon dioxide oxygen imbalance, then crash. 13.0 Critical Pressure Safety Tip Don't use reflected sunlight for microscope illumination. When I wake up, it's Saturday and Sarah's standing over me, frowning her displeased goddess frown. Okay, that's enough. Get out of bed and take a shower. You're coming with me. It would take too much energy to argue with her. I do as I'm told. Once I'm clean and dressed, I follow her outside. She sends me back inside with instructions to put on my contacts and to comb my hair. I do as I'm told once more, then return. Travis is driving. I get in the back seat. Sarah tells me to buckle up. We drive across town to the Salt City Diner. I'm just barely in the car, an essence of Kate. Good thing I put the belt on. Up front, Sarah fiddles with the radio, twirls her hair around her fingers, and talks a mile a minute. It takes her a while, but eventually I can hear what she's saying. Nonsense, most of it anyways, but it's sweet of her to try. 
The diner is a grown-up version of the Meriwether Cafeteria, except the food tastes better and costs less. Nine o'clock on a Saturday morning is rush hour here. Families with screaming babies are all seated in the back. Divorced dads starting their custody weekends with pissed-off kids sit by the windows. The booths are mostly taken by teenagers. The tables in the middle of the floor are for adults, both groups armed and ready for serious gossip. The old people have already cleared out. Waitresses with hideous orange aprons move like skaters between the kitchen and the tables. Eating here is like trying to eat inside a pinball game, but Sarah thinks the place has atmosphere. Mitchell is already in a booth, waiting for us. He slides down the bench to make room for me and pours the coffee. You're alive, he says. I was beginning to wonder. Travis and Sarah lean forward a little, their eyes intent on me. I sigh and open my menu. You guys can knock it off. I know what you're doing. I'm fine. I had some weird flu, but I slept like a log last night and I'm starving. What are you guys gonna eat? Sarah grins and wiggles in her seat. You're back. Oh, sweetie, I was so worried. Travis pulls his wallet out of his back pocket and extracts three dollars. Tell me, oh brilliant mistress, what is the maximum amount of food I can get for this? Are you talking number of bites or weight? I ask. Wait. I want to feel it. Then you want oatmeal, I say. It's like cement. Mitch shakes his head. Wrong again, Malone. Our boy needs pancakes to fill him up. Duh. How do you make pancakes? It's chemistry. You combine baking powder with an acid like sour milk. The reaction creates air bubbles, which makes the pancakes fluffy. Fluffy is not filling. Plus, the pancakes cost twice as much. They taste better, Mitch says. He wants weight not taste. If he wants taste, he could order a cherry pie. We're not talking about pie. I'm not talking about pie either. All I'm saying is, I don't want to argue, Kate. I'm not arguing. Sarah reaches her hand across the table and gently pats my arm. No, sweetie, but you're yelling, and a little vein on the side of your forehead just popped out. Do you want some decaf? The three of them stare at me. No, I will not touch the vein. I won't give them the satisfaction. I'm fine. Pass the cream and fake sugar. Travis passes over the goodies. Mitchell waves his hand in the air, trying to attract the attention of a waitress clustered around the coffee machines. The oldest waitress, whose hair is lacquered into place in the mid-sixties, shouts into the kitchen. A new waitress strolls out. She's wearing work boots and a pack of cigarettes is sticking out of the pocket in her apron. She's wearing her hospital bracelet and my watch and my gold necklace with a heart on it. She has a scabby M tattooed on her forearm. Teresa Litch, decorated in a waitress orange apron, walks to our table. Crap, 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 crap. I knew I should have stayed home. She stops at our booth, hands on her hips. Yeah? What happened to the other waitress? Mitch asks. The one who brought the coffee. I pushed her in the lake. You gonna order or what? Yeah, yeah, we're ready to order, Sarah says. Hi, Terry. I'm having crepes with strawberries. Extra whipped cream, please. Travis opens his menu again. What'll fill me up more, pancakes or oatmeal? Pancakes, Terry says. They're like lead. They're not fluffy? Hockey pucks. Travis winks at me. Perfect. Give me a tall stack, extra syrup. What about you, Harvard? She asks Mitch. Aren't you going to write any of this down? He asks. Because it's so complicated, right? Mitch taps his finger on the table for a second, then gives in. Three eggs, sunny side up. Bacon, not overcooked. I like it soft and greasy. Wheat toast, no butter, large orange juice, and a bowl of fruit. Oh, and we need some more coffee. He slides the empty pot down the table. What about you, Katie? I keep my eyes on the table in front of me. I could be home ironing. I could be giving the dog a bath. I could be changing Bert's oil. I could be researching state colleges. I could have been shaving the cat. Just bring me a donut, a glazed donut, and some more water. Terry snorts once and walks back to the kitchen. Sarah leans across the table. Did you know she was working here? I shake my head. Last I knew, she was working at some bar. Travis puts his arm around Sarah. What's the story with her house? She's still tearing it down? Who knows? She won't talk to anyone, won't let anyone near her place, and her mom is Looney Tunes. She might end up in a home. I don't know. I mean, look, you can't just help Terry. 
That's harsh, Travis says. So is Terry, Mitch says. Sarah throws her napkin at him. Be nice. Would you like to be in her shoes? Her boots, I say. She won't wear shoes, only boots. I take Sarah's napkin from Mitch and smooth it out on the tabletop with the palm of my hand. She's going to get blood poisoning from that tattoo, septicema. No, she won't. Travis pulls up his shirt and points to the yin-yang symbol tattooed on the middle of his stomach. I did that one myself. I didn't get sick. I've been thinking about getting a tattoo, Mitchell says. I shake my head. It'll hurt your chances of getting into grad school. Really? Travis throws his napkin at Mitch. Don't be such a tool. It only takes a few minutes for Terry to deliver our order. She slams the plates on the table and tosses the silverware in the middle. Travis spreads the butter on his pancakes. Mitchell unfolds his napkin in his lap and loads his eggs with salt. Sarah dips her pinky finger into the strawberry gunk drooling out of her crepes. I stare at my plate. Two pieces of dried bread. Is everything all right? Terry asks. I ordered a glazed donut, not toast, I say. And we need coffee. And I need water. I'm thirsty. Sarah goes bug-eyed, trying to get me to back down as if that is going to make Terry's life any easier, or mine. The donuts are all stale. I doubt that. Terry takes my toast plate and stomps away. She returns with a glazed donut and a pot of fresh coffee. The donut has a thumbprint mashed into it. I didn't spit on it, if that's what you're thinking, Terry says. She stands there, arms crossed over her chest for a minute. I half expect her to pick up the table and fling it through the front window. Instead, she sits down. Move over, skinny, she says. Sarah scooches closer to Travis, and Terry slides in next to her. So, what's up, kids? Are we having fun? Making big plans for the prom? Travis mumbles something through a mouthful of pancakes. Mitchell punctures his yolk with the corner of his toast, and Yellow floods his plate. We haven't decided yet, Sarah says to Terry, as if they were a remotely normal conversation. Are you going? Terry takes my spoon and bends the handle. <laughs> You're joking, right? Sarah stuffs half a crepe in her mouth to save herself from answering. I carefully break out the thumbprint from my donut and bite just the unthumbed part. It's stale, all right. A week old, at least. Hey, Terry, yells the ancient waitress. Back to work. I'm on break, she yells back. She holds her arm up and points to my watch. I've got five minutes. Are you going to sell your house? Mitch asks. Terry wags the bent spoon at him. Why do you care? He has yolk on his chin. My mom's an agent. It could be nice if you fix it up, but you'd get a lot more if you sold it. It's a big piece of property. Someone could put up condos. Terry takes a piece of his bacon. I've been thinking about it. Yeah, I bet you have, I say. I ask for some water. Keep your panties on. You know jack about what I'm thinking. I know precisely what you're thinking. Terry snorts and reaches for my donut. Mitch's hand shoots across the table and grabs her wrist. I wasn't planning on him doing that. And then his voice, sounding like it crawled out from under a rock, said, Don't touch her food, he says. Chill, Pangborn, Travis says. Terry's eyes go flat behind the thick lenses of her glasses. Her fingers collect into a fist. What are you gonna do about it, Harvard? Mitch leans toward her and squeezes harder. I don't have to do anything. You did it yourself. We were all really sad that Mikey was killed, all right? And I know that you've had a really hard life, but that doesn't give you permission to make Kate feel like shit or to make fun of people or steal from them. Don't touch her food. He releases her wrist and sits back. His fingernails made red half moons on her skin. Breaks over, calls the old waitress. Terry blinks a few times, breathing hard. Her arm is still lying across the table. Fist, red fingernail marks, sneaky blue veins, and a crooked tattoo. Kate asked for water, Mitch says as he spears his egg. She stands up. Her apron is wrinkled. She's got plenty. I mean it, Lich, the old waitress hollers. Terry reaches behind her and tugs at the bow of her apron strings until it becomes undone. She walks away from our booth, pulling the apron over her head as she goes. Oh, no, Sarah whispers. Way to go, Pangborn, Travis says. That was boneheaded. It's not my fault if she quits, 
Another day and they would have fired her. They won't look at me. Sarah and Travis dig into their food. Mitchell pours himself another cup of coffee. Over the noise of the crying babies, buzzing conversations and forks scraping plates, tapping spoons on mugs, I can hear the shouting in the kitchen. I could have stayed home and avoided all of this. I could have scrubbed the toilets, cleaned grout. Terry bursts through the kitchen doors. She makes for the front door, then stops, pivots on her left boot, and marches back to our table. She stands over me. The diner has gone quiet all of a sudden. I can smell her. Out of the corner of my eye, I can see her hands balled up and ready to inflict pain. Should I apologize for what the jerk to my left said? Should I do that before or after she breaks his jaw? Terry opens her fist and drops my gold necklace on the table. She unbuckles my watch and sets it carefully next to the water glass. She's still wearing her hospital bracelet. When she walks out the door, the diner sighs and the noise cranks back up to full volume, crying, buzzing, scraping, and tapping. Sarah reaches for the coffee pot. That was nice of her. Mitch frowns. You gave her my necklace? I pick up the watch. The band is damp with sweat. She poked an extra hole in it so that she could buckle it. I wrap the band around my wrist and buckle it in her hole. Her sweat is clammy and thick. The watch flops around my wrist, the weight of the face pulling it down. I can't believe that fit her, Travis says. She's like twice as big as you are. Mitch tilts his head to one side. Why did you give her my necklace? I pick up the part of the donut that has Terry's thumbprint and stick it in my mouth. It's as dry as a rock and just as hard. I take a swig of coffee and hold it in my mouth until the donut softens, then turns to mush. My friends talk over and around me. Prom, blah blah blah. Work, blah blah blah. The lake, blah blah blah. Summer, blah blah blah. September, financial aid, blah 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 blah. I'm shrinking and they don't even notice. My watch is ticking, but the second hand isn't moving. I breathe quickly and deeply, like I'm sprinting, even though I'm sitting down. I blink, trying to moisten my contacts. As I open my eyes, it's like I'm rocketing through space, the stars elongating past me, sitting still as I shift into warp drive and break the speed of light. Someone mentions MIT, but it doesn't save me. Sarah blows bubbles in her coffee with a straw. The bubbles pop and more words come out. Admissions, transfer, roommates, GPAs, microwaves, concerts, registration. God, is this all we ever talk about? The diner air is gelling, concentrating, molecules collapsing into the void, the invisible gases taking shape and mass. I hold my water glass up to my nose. Seeing through the water, the faces and bodies around me flatten under an unseen weight. I don't recognize anyone. I hold the glass of water over the aisle so it can catch the morning light. The water acts as a prism, creating a rainbow that cascades across the table. The glare surprises Mitch and he puts his hand up to shield his face. Water is an extremely efficient solvent. Two atoms of hydrogen connected to one atom of oxygen by a highly polar covalent bond. Given enough time, it can dissolve almost anything, even sunlight, into pure color. The electrolysis of water is a classic chemistry experiment. Stick two electrodes in water, add a bit of electrolytic solution, and turn on the battery. Voila. Hydrogen collects at the cathode, oxygen collects at the anode. It's not water anymore, not even steam. Bonds are broken and the substance is reduced to its elements. Magic. Are you all right? Sarah asks me. I open my fingers. The glass falls. Gravity works. It lands on the tile floor without a sound shattering into a dozen shards and countless diamond slivers. The tidal wave of water washes over me, and I have to close my mouth so I don't breathe it into my lungs. I'm at sea. There are ghosts in these waters, aliens, and lost little blonde girls, all waiting for me to open my eyes. They have been waiting for a long time. The wave crests and rushes past me. I emerge soaked to the skin and shaking. My friends have stopped talking. They aren't eating either. Mitchell reaches out and wipes the tears from my face. His hand smells like bacon. What's wrong? he asks. 13.1. Covalent Bonding If I could run all the time, life would be fine. As long as I keep moving, I'm in control. She wasn't in the parking lot. I haven't passed her walking on the road, either. 
There's no way she's running, too. Not Terry. She could have hot-wired a car, I guess, but it's more likely that she hitchhiked. Somebody must have picked her up. No matter. I know where she's headed. East. Home. She doesn't have anywhere else to go. Step, 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 step. Breathe, breathe, breathe. Step, 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 step. Breathe, breathe, breathe. Jeans and a sweatshirt aren't exactly recommended running here. No matter. Feels good to run in the sun. I'm warming up. Terry's watch swirls around my wrist. My heart bounces against the wet skin between my breasts. From the road, the lich house looks abandoned. Some of the windows are open, others closed. The shutters that had been taken down for sanding and painting are still stacked against the maple tree. Trash is scattered around the yard. Pink and yellow tufts of insulation are tangled in the bushes. They look like clown wigs. My heart is pounding as I walk up the driveway. How many miles was that? A thousand, maybe. Maybe even more. In sweatshirt and jeans. Imagine that. The dirty bulb in the front porch light is broken. The thin glass shards litter the front of the porch. The side door is open, but the house is silent. I cross the threshold. Terry? The living room is packed again, jammed with all the furniture from the other rooms. The wood floor is covered in dust and footprints. Mikey's corner is empty. Terry? All that's left of the kitchen is a shell. She even took out the sink. She ripped out the wall between the kitchen and the playroom. The holes that used to be the playroom windows gape open. Tools are lined up in a neat row on the floor. Her tool belt as well. The wall with Mikey's handprints in her feeble cave art is untouched. I walk back down the hall and climb the stairs. The new railing is still in place. The walls in the upstairs hall have fist-sized holes in them. Terry? I find her sitting in the middle of the floor in Mikey's room, her head leaning against her knees, her arms wrapped around her head. There's a pile of blankets in the corner, a couple of bottles of soda, potato chips and pretzel bags, two apples. I'd like to talk to you, I say. Please. She lifts her right hand and gives me the finger. I sit down, cross-legged, three feet in front of her. I don't blame you, but I'm not leaving. She lifts her head and gives me another finger. I can wait, I say. She lowers her hands and wraps them around her head again. I take off my watch and set it on the floor between us. The ticking fills the room, swaying the curtains back and forth. The tidal wave builds again. I don't flinch. I don't even hold my breath. I let it wash over me. Terry reaches out and pulls the watch to her side. Another minute passes, then she lifts her head and tucks her hair behind her ears. Her face is tear-stained, her eyes swollen and red. She leaves the watch on the ground. What's wrong with your face? she asks. It looks like a fat zit ready to pop. Thanks. The watch keeps ticking. Can't she hear it? And you're crying, she says. You never cry. Imagine that, I whisper. I sniff and clear my throat. I'm sorry for what Mitch did, what he said. That was wrong. Worse than wrong. It was disrespectful and you didn't deserve it. He's your boyfriend. Not really, but I don't want to talk about him anymore. We need to talk about Mikey, about what happened. No, we don't. Terry leans back, puts her arms behind her, and stretches out her legs until her boots are right in front of me. I heard you looking around downstairs. I haven't gotten much done. Kitchen looks nice. She manages a chuckle. Yeah, I wanted to get that out of the way first. I wipe my eyes on my sleeve. I like the way you made the kitchen open to the playroom. She rocks her boots from side to side. I had it all planned, you know. I could be cooking and he could be in the playroom. And that way we could see each other. Lots of houses are built that way these days. It's a really good idea. Waste of time. Her boots are like a metronome. Back and forth, back and forth. No, it's not. You still need a place to live, and so does your mom. Back and forth, back and forth. You said you were sorry. You can go now. I grab her boots and hold them still. Will you stop that? She stands up, rises above me, puts her fists on her hips. You've got something to say to me? Her movement sends a thousand motes of dust spinning in the sunlight coming through the window. Our essence is in this room, the atomic product of breaking down two girls into their elemental selves, frightened, defiant, lonely. 
I can hear the glass breaking over and over again, piercing the frozen tissue around my heart. I look up at her. Do you think it was your fault that he died? Or my fault? Dad's fault? She turns her face quickly, but not fast enough. The tidal wave caught her too, and we're both crying. She sniffs hard and wipes her nose with her shirt. No, she whispers. Are you sure? She nods and wipes her eyes. That's the worst part. It was nobody's fault, really. Or it was everyone's fault. It was an accident. Just one damn accident after another. Your father. What he did wasn't an accident. It was a crime. She nods again. And he paid. I start to stand. Terry reaches down a hand and helps me up. I dig a tissue out of my purse and give it to her. You're always prepared, aren't you? What were you? A freaking brownie? Girl Scout. That's right. You had that stupid hat. She blows her nose. You filled that hat with yellow snow. Did I? Sorry. We're standing eye to eye. I never think of Terry as my height. In my mind, she's at least six foot five, but in real life, we're the same size, except for her 50 pounds of muscle. I can't hear the watch ticking anymore. I pick it up. It's running fine. It's just back to telling time quietly. Here, I hand it to her. I want you to have this. Fits you better anyway. But I'm keeping the necklace. You should sell it. Get some cash. I might. Thanks. She buckles it on her wrist and checks the time. The dust between us has settled and the light is coming through the window at a higher angle. You promised that you'd teach me how to hammer, I say. You're a spaz. It's impossible. I'd like to try again. I'd like to help you put the house back together. She adjusts the band on her wrist. What? You mean this summer, before you go off to be Einstein? I look around the room. I was thinking of staying until the job is finished. For real? I nod. You're so full of it. You're going to college. Not right away. I'm taking some time off. I've been running too much. My legs need a rest. She studies me for a minute, then walks out of the room. I follow her downstairs and across to the porch. I follow her all the way to the bottom of the hill. She looks at my house and then hers. You can't slack if you're going to work with me. I won't, I promise. She brings her face close to mine, closer than she's ever been. Magnified by her glasses, her eyes are impossibly large, taking in every detail. Finally, she leans back and pushes up her sleeves. When do you want to start? How about now?